Well, it's a real joy to minister God's word today on this Sunday morning. I'm thrilled to minister to Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte and also the entire world is privileged to uh, hear this message this morning. So I'm really excited. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Psalms 91. And while you're turning there, I, I want to read to you a conversation with God. A conversation with God written by prophetess Bradella Hall Walker, my awesome, extraordinary wife. This is a conversation with God and his people. God says, what is the problem, my people? I'm receiving a lot of fear, anxiety, and doubt instead of trust, faith, and prayer. The people responded, the coronavirus haven't you heard God? <laughs> God responds and says, I am God. I know all things. I also told you to fear not. I have you covered under the blood of my son Jesus. The people. But God, when your appointed leaders are afraid to have worship service, businesses are shutting down, schools are closing, the NBA even canceled. All kind of events are canceled. This is a pandemic. Then we are in trouble. God says, what do you think? The people respond, well, God, I think the people feel that this pandemic is bigger than you. God becomes silent. Give the Lord a big hand of praise. I want to minister to you this morning, fear not the coronavirus. Amen. Fear not the coronavirus. The scripture is clear that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God has given us a, a, a spirit of power that we are overcomers, we're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I think sometimes the church forget that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died on Calvary's cross to destroy sickness and disease. That we have the greatest power ever known unto mankind. And when a plague come along, it won't touch your body according to the word of God. If you're a person of faith and power and that you believe and trust God's word. The question is, do you trust God's word today? Because so often your actions are showing different. See, the, the key is that we, we don't, our, what we, our actions demonstrate what we really believe. Our actions, not what we pretend to believe. We can let our mouths say anything. I'm a man of faith and power. I believe in the anointed one and his anointing. I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I'm a believer. I'm mighty. I'm courageous. I'm, I'm bold. You can make your mouth say anything you want to, but your actions demonstrate what you really believe. And if you are afraid of plagues, if you are afraid of sickness and disease, that's the fear of the enemy, and fear has torment. And the scripture says that perfect love cast out fear. So I'm here to tell you today, if you are in fear, then let me encourage you to be made perfect in love because it will cast out fear. Can somebody shout amen? <laughs> now Psalms 91 11 is a promise from God to us. And I think sometimes we forget God's promises and we forget his benefits. But Psalms 91 says this, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, my God. And I will say unto the Lord, He is my refuge, He's my fortress, He's my God, in Him will I trust. Amen. 
Surely he has delivered me from the snares of the fowler and from the pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. And truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shall not be afraid. Come on, somebody. Amen. The word of God says we should not be afraid. We should not fear. See, fear can hurt you, but fear can make you hurt yourself. It can make you run into a wall. It can make you panic and hit down on the gas and run into somebody. Fear has torment. And fear in the acrostics is faith. Uh, excuse me. Fear is in the acrostics. It is false evidence appearing real. It appears real, but in reality, it's a spirit of torment. It's a spirit to hinder you. It's a spirit to make you afraid. It's a spirit to put you in bondage, to control you, to manipulate, to make you a puppet. You have to live in freedom. You have to live totally free from and be disconnected from anything that tries to connect to you. See, so often the world is connected to the news media, is connected to what they hear. We have to be unconnected to the issues and problems and believe and be connected to God's word. And the problem is we too... The world is too connected to what the media paint. You know, I'm reminded of the O.J. Simpson trial, how the media painted a racist thing, that all the black people were rejoicing that O.J. got off, and all of the white people were crying for Nicole and Ron Goldman's family. And, and that was a, a, a false picture to paint because that was not the case, but the news media painted that picture. And they will paint a picture to you because it sells their ratings and it sells papers and it, and it sells. It, listen, you've got to be smart enough to know this is all about the moolah. <laughs> this is all about money. This is all, and you got to be smart enough and not fall uh, prey to the traps and the snares of the enemy. You got to trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding, the word of God says. In all thy ways acknowledge him and God will direct your path. But if you're following the news media, you following what they're saying and you get caught up in that, then you're following and believing the report of the news media. But I don't know about you, but I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. Amen. The scripture says, whose, whose report will you believe? I shall believe the report of the Lord. Amen. Look what it says. Verse 5 says, Thou shalt not be afraid from the terror by night and for the arrows that fire by day, nor the pestilence that walk in darkness for the destruction that wait on, at, at noonday. Wait, just Listen, they're waiting for you. They're waiting for you to surrender, they're waiting for you to let go, they're waiting for you to fear so that they can launch an attack on you and attack you and connect to you. But I'm so glad today we heard an anointed song that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. That is the word of God. No weapon. Tell your neighbor, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. No weapon. It may be formed, but it won't prosper. I had a weapon formed against me years ago. I was shot with a 357 Magnum. That weapon was formed, but it didn't prosper. Look at me today. Look at me now. Look at me now. Amen. It didn't prosper. And a weapon can be formed, but the God says it won't prosper. But that's the faith that you have to stand on. You got to stand on the word, not the news media, not what people being powders and doubters and do with ours and hanging out with people that's poor me, feeling sorry for themselves, uh, individuals that's, that's moping and poping and groping and everything. You don't want to hang out with them kind of folk. You hang out with people who are faith talkers that talk faith. That hey, know that they're the head and not the tail. Knowing that nothing shall draw nigh unto my body. No sickness and disease. God said uh, he will heal all of my infirmities and my diseases. Amen. And we walk by faith and not by sight. So although we're walking by, by what we see. And what we see can sometimes cripple us and make us uh, paralyzed. Because fear will paralyze you. It will keep you from moving. I know what I'm talking about. Folk right today are paralyzed in their home 
They're not coming out to church. And the scripture says, forsake not yourself to assembling uh, as the manner of some. Amen. And so we are to come out to the house of the Lord in faith and show the world that we are faith believers, that we don't just talk this thing, we live it. Amen. See, so often we're, and, and the world is in trouble because they're looking at the fact that we say one thing and do another. That's hypocritical. And the world says, ah, you talk about you being a Christian, show me your faith in action. Show me that you really believe. This morning I'm worshiping the Lord. I'm preaching. I went to church and I don't care who stayed home. I don't care who, who, who didn't show up in church today. I showed up because I had an appointment with God. I had an appointment and God wanted me to show up. And I met my appointment with God for the glory of him. I showed God I'm not going to be late to my appointment. I'm not going to show up, have no show on my appointment. No. No, 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 not me. I'm showing up with my appointment with God. See, we got to be real with this thing. If we're going to affect the world, if we're going to make an impact on the world, if we're going to touch lives, if we're going to minister to people, we got to have our faith in action. People have to see our faith, not what we say, because then, you know, hypocritical. And you know what being a hypocrite is? It's when the life that you live is not in harmony with what you say. Amen. And we want true spirituality. And true spirituality is being in harmony with God's nature, his character, his purpose, and his will. That's true spirituality. And we want to show the world that we have true spirituality. Amen. Glory be to God. We want to show them that we're going to not be intimidated by demons and devils and demonic activity and die in defeat, fearing the coronavirus. Amen. Or fearing any uh, other virus. Look what the word promise us. It says in verse 6, Nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wait at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand by thy right side, but it shall not come unto thee. Hey! Listen, let me tell you something. This is a plague. The coronavirus is a plague. It is a plague and it's out to destroy and, and it's out to kill, steal, and destroy. But that's where Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have life more abundantly. I don't know about you, but I'm living the abundant life. Uh, I'm rejoicing in the Holy Ghost. Uh, I'm not intimidated by any demon and devil. I don't have a spirit of fear. God has set me free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Can somebody shout me down this morning? Glory be to God. Look what it says. Verse 8. And only with thy eyes, only with thy eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, my inhabitation. In other words, I live, I dwell, I flow with God. Amen. And I show the world that I am a king's kid. I'm an overcomer. I show the world that I live and I breathe and have my being with God. Amen. Verse 10 says, There shall no evil befall thee. Oh, how can you all sit there? There shall no evil befall, no evil befall you. That's God's promises. That's God's promise to you. That's God's promise to me that no evil shall befall me. So I'm believing God's word. I'm not going to believe the report of the enemy. I'm not going to believe what Satan is saying. I'm not going to believe preachers that are, are talking about being afraid or, or, or staying at home and, and closing the church doors. I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to show the world that nothing shall befall me. My God promised me and I'm standing on his word. I'm believing his word. Uh, I'm relying on his word. Uh, I'm depending upon his word. Uh, I'm looking to his word. Uh, I'm staying focused on the word. Uh, I'm dedicated to the word. Uh, I'm committed to the word. Uh, I'm, out, I'm, out, I'm out to serve God and his word. Glory be to God. Glory to God. Oh, this is awesome. I'm so excited about God's word. Look what it says, verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee. No evil, no evil befall you. Yes, yes. When you are in Christ, Hallelujah. when you have accepted the Lord as your personal Savior, yes. 
You have been bought with a price. And the blood of Jesus cleanses you. Your past, your present, and your future sins are forgiven you. You are whole and complete no matter what you feel, no matter what you think. You are whole and complete in the things of God. The only thing you have to do is walk in it. Because it's done in the spirit. And if it's done in the spirit, it should manifest itself in your life. Because it's already done. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. And you got to know that you're more than a conqueror today. You got to know that you can do all things through Christ to strengthen you. You got to know that God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. You got to know the word. You got to know the foundation scriptures so that when, the, when, when things of, of tragedies that hit, when circumstances are overwhelming, you got to go to the word. You got to stand on what God says. Amen. You got to stand on not what man said. Don't follow man. Follow God's word. Somebody ought to clap those hands and give God praise. Look what he says. Not only shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Not, not that dwelling, the dwelling of who you are, the dwelling of the presence of God inside of you and in your home and this house, which is the house of God. You house God. Woo, glory to God. Isn't it great to know you house God? Amen. 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 Don't you know God's going to protect himself? <laughs> Do you think God is going to allow coronavirus to attack him? Well, you house God. God is inside of you. Amen. You house him. He's going to protect himself. Amen. So you can stand strong. You can stand courageous. You can stand mighty. And you can stand with confidence. Because God got you. Somebody else say that. Amen. Say amen. Neither shall any plague. Now this is a plague. The coronavirus is a plague. And I'm reminded of Pastor Moses during the time when Pharaoh would not let God's people go. When God wanted Pharaoh to let my people go, he disobeyed him. He wasn't paying him no attention. I ain't doing nothing. And God says, oh, yes, you is. He said, oh, no, I'm not. I'm paraphrasing now. Oh no, you, oh, 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 no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you is, God said. Oh, no, I'm not. And so this battle was going on with Pharaoh and, and uh, God with his people. God loves his people. That's what I'm trying to convey to you today. God loves you. He cares for you. And he's not going to let this virus take you. It may take some for various reasons why, why I don't know. But you got to be confident that it won't touch this. Do, 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 do. Touch this doing you doing no good. You got to be confident in that. Amen. If you're walking around fearful, then I mean you're afraid, then that opens doors to the enemy. Amen. When you are afraid, you open up demonic activity to your life. Because faith overrides fear, but fear will override faith if you're not careful. And you can't let fear override you. You got to walk in faith. Glory be to God. Look what it says. The plague shall not come nigh to thy dwelling. And when Pharaoh would not let God's people go, and God says you are, and because he was so stubborn, God says, I got something for you. And he told Pastor Moses, he said, Pastor Moses, I love my people, and I want to give you instructions. And the instructions are, you take the blood of a goat, and you take it and spread it over the house of God's people. All of God's people, you put the blood over the doorpost, over the blood, just over the blood over the doorpost. And, and when the deaf angel moves across the land, it's going to spare all of God's people. And Pharaoh don't know nothing about it. And he don't have the blood over, over his doorpost. 
And I, the death angel is going to move across the land and kill all the firstborn. All the firstborn is out of here. They are giving up the ghost. They are done when the death angel move across the land. And so Pastor Moses was obedient to God. And the death angel moved across the land because that represents the blood of Jesus. And the death angel moved across the land and killed all the firstborn and killed Pharaoh's firstborn. And then, and then only, was he willing to let God's people go. Right. Tragedies and circumstances that we allow to come to our house because of disobedience and then we wonder why things are falling apart, why things are happening to me. That's why you have to be obedient to God and have that covenant relationship with him and know the blood of Jesus is inside of you because you have accepted the Lord as, his personal, as your personal Savior and Christ is alive in you and Christ dwells in you and you know you're protected because you're behind the blood. Amen. You're behind the blood. And when the death angel moves across the land to destroy you and put sickness and disease upon you uh, and to put poverty upon you uh, and to hurt you uh, and to take your life uh, when the death angel come uh, because of the blood uh, it'll pass by you just like it did uh, the children of Israel it passed by them because of the obedience of Moses I declare to you today uh, go home uh, all of you and get some uh, uh, get a red cloth and put it outside your door put it outside your homes uh, and plead the blood of Jesus over your house so when the death angel uh, coronavirus is come on. It won't stop you. It won't hinder you. It won't draw nigh to you. It won't cause you to live in defeat. It won't cause you to lose out. When that death angel of Corona comes to, to your house, it'll pass by your house because the blood of Jesus cleanses and covers you from all sickness and disease. Can somebody say amen? amen. Look what the word of God says. Verse 11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over you. Glory be to God. His, do you know you have angels that are assigned to protect you? you got a bunch of uh, henchmen that's running around to protect you. Amen. you got a security guard. And security guards just protecting you. Yeah, I mean, you got to focus. Uh, them angels are right there for you. you you'd be surprised if you could see the video when you were getting ready to go through that light and that angel supernaturally caused that car from running into you. You would be amazed if you could look at the video in the spirit realm. You would be shocked at how the ministering angels moved on your behalf when all hell was breaking loose, when the enemy was getting ready to put sickness and disease upon you. The angels that were assigned to your life showed up. God has assigned angels to your life. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And so you got to be good to them. <laughs> You gotta respect God because you don't want you don't want the heavenly host to be upset with you. <laughs> you you want them to say, hey, that's one that loves God. Yeah. That's one that loves because we worship Him day and night. Amen. But we holy, holy, holy. That's all they do all day long. Holy, holy, holy is they worship the Lord. And they try to put a bug in your ear sometimes. Say, why don't you worship the Lord? Hey, worship the Lord because I'm getting ready to go down. And you worship the Lord, I got your back. <laughs> you worship the Lord. Hey, when that death angel come, I'm going to be right there to move him out of the way. Because why? you worshiping the Lord. Because you're giving God praise. Because you're glorifying God. So when I, I, I'm going to make sure you're, you're fine. So those soldiers, those angels are camped around about you. This is the word. It says... He shall give his angels charge over you. Man, they got charge over you to call shots for you, to have your back. You got to be good to God so that, that he, the angels will appreciate you. Amen. I got some, I got some angels that's got my back, I know. 
I know they got my back. Amen. That's why I can walk anywhere, go anywhere, not intimidated by anybody or any anyone. That's why when I walk in a building, hey, I show up. This is Dr. Randall Hall Walker. Hello. How's everybody? Amen. I'm not intimidated by I don't care what your position is. I don't care uh, uh, who you think you are. I don't care about your stinking attitude. I don't care about none of that. Okay. I'm here to show that God is alive in my life. I'm showed up to show that God is alive and real in my heart. Glory be to God. I want the world to know I'm not intimidated by any demon. I'm not manipulated by any demon. I'm not controlled by any demon. I'm controlled by Almighty God. I'm God's man. Glory be to God. And you are God's man and God's woman. And don't you let anybody talk you out of it. Well, Pastor, I don't know about all that. I mean, I'm just nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save everybody. Oh, come on now. You are somebody. Amen. You ain't no nobody. You are somebody. Glory to God. You hold your head up high with confidence. Amen. You hold your head up with confidence knowing that God is for you. And God is on your side. And God has the ministry and angels backing you up. Amen. All of heaven is supporting you. Amen. It's good to know I got heaven supporting me. Amen. Whether anybody else supports me or not, I got heaven backing me. Glory to God. Glory to God. He shall give his angels charge over thee to, <coughs> to keep thee in all thy way. They shall bear thee up. In thy hand, lest thy dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon lions and young lions and in dragons and shall trample under your feet. My God. Listen, my God. Things, you are on top of things. Amen. They are under your feet. You got to believe that. You can't believe that they're above you. You can't believe that they're uh, 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 over you and in charge of your life. You got to know that they're under your feet. Amen. <laughs> you got to know who you are and whose you are. You got to have the confidence. The word of God says this is the confidence that we have. That if we ask anything according to his will, God hears us. My God. I got a direct line to God. Amen. Amen. I got a hotline to God. I got a hotline to heaven. Amen. Glory to God. On interferences, I moved all them interferences out of the way. All them demonic activities that were trying to work against and hinder me from, from my direct line and stopping me from getting to heaven like they did Daniel. No sorry. I got a straight hotline to God. Amen. I'll phone him up anytime. Amen. Glory be to God. And you got a hotline. I'm in straight to heaven. Well, Pastor, my phone don't work. <laughs> Get it fixed. Amen. Get your phone fixed so that you can call up heaven at any time. Amen. When the plague come upon you and fear come upon you, you know how to pick up the phone and call heaven? Get down on your knees and show God your humility and show him your love for him. He'll hear you. Amen. God loves you. Amen. Listen, if you were the only person on earth, God would have died for just you. Amen. You are that special to God. Amen. See, sometimes we think God has favors, and, and I, well, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but God loves everybody. The scripture says there's no respect of persons. Amen. Amen. God is no respect of persons. Amen. Oh, my God. This is I'm going to have to wrap this up. Okay. Verse 14 says, because he has set his love upon us, upon you, upon me, therefore will, will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Amen. Because he has known my name. God knows you by name. He know Erica. He know Vicky. He know Verdell. He no First Lady Bedella Hall Walker, doctor. <laughs> he no Brenda Campbell. He no Leticia Carter. He no Deacon Jimmy Carter. He knows you by name. Amen. God knows you. Amen. So you can phone him up. You can get in touch with him. 
Hey Amen. He won't even put you on hold. <laughs> and tell you if you want this, press one. If you want this, press two. If you want this, press three. No. As well, soon as you dial his number, he picks up the phone and answers you. He says, call on me, and I will answer thee. He says, glory to be. Well, if you try calling on him today, glory be to God. I'm almost done. Verse 15. He shall call up, he shall call, he shall call upon me, and I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. Do you hear this? God will be with you in, in trouble when you call. I will deliver him and honor him. Isn't that amazing? That we're wanting to honor God and God says, I'll honor you. Amen. God honors you. Accept his honor. Appreciate his honor. And then turn around and give him the honor that he deserves. Last, last the promise of God. With long life will I satisfy him. And show him my salvation. Come on, give God praise. Come on, come on, give God praise. Glory to God. God's gonna give you a long life. Listen, we have a real concern, but I believe that is perpetrated by fear. I believe the enemy wants to put fear upon you. There is a series of events that the enemy has used for years to torment you. There's a series of events that take place that is known around the world. And I want to look at a few of those. But I want you to understand that it's perpetrated by demonic activity and satanic attack. It might be manipulated by the powers that be to control the economy. Let me suggest to you today that do not listen to the voice of the enemy. Amen. And with us already always listening to the voice in our head, the enemy will plant things. It's called a serpent seed. Well, you know you ain't going to make it. And then all of a sudden something happened. I knew it. I knew all the time I wasn't going to make it. Instead of trusting and believing God, and God frowns on that when you don't trust him. But there's a series of events has happened, and I'm going to give you a few of them since 2001. 2001, listen to this. In 2001, anthrax, I got a little twist in the tongue there. 2001, virus. It's going to kill us all. <laughs> it was a rare bacteria illness spread through by animals and insects. 2002, the West Nile virus. It's going to kill us all. Came to the U.S. in 1999. Infected mosquitoes spread this virus. In 2003, smog is going to kill us all. It is an acute respiratory illness caused by, amazing, amazingly, the coronavirus. It's been around a while, whether you knew it or not. In 2005, the bird flu. Remember that one? It's going to kill us all. Okay, infected birds caused a flu virus. 2006, you remember this one, the E. coli virus. It's going to kill us all. An infection uh, damaging the, your intestines. It's going to kill us all. A panic to put a panic upon the world. 2008, financial crisis. We're going under. We're doomed. <laughs> it's doomsday. An economical crisis. 2009. The swine flu is going to kill us all. A respiratory infection. 2012, the mail the, the, the calendar, you remember that? Predicted the world's going to end. The world's coming to an end. Oh, we're done. Going to kill us all. 2013, North Korea, uh, we're going to cause World War III. Remember that? Uh, we all going to, atomic bomb, we all going to die. 2014, Ebola virus is going to kill us all. <laughs> West Africa violent, uh, um, uh, West Africa 
uh, virus epidemic took, took, broke out. Remember that? 2014. 2015. ISIS. They got close. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> And it stands for uh, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Go kill us all. We're all doomed. I mean, this is the negativity that we face. 2016, the Zeta virus. It's going to kill us all. Spread through mos uh, mosquitoes, uh, mosquito bites. And 2020, the coronavirus. It's going to kill us all. And the panic is on. And in closing, let me say to you, the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is that it's killing people through fear. That is the truth of the matter. Because the word of God says that you are the head and not the tail. And no plague shall draw nigh unto your body. If you are a born again believer, the blood of Jesus covers you from sickness and disease. The blood of Jesus keeps you from sickness and disease. You walk in divine health. You got to believe that you walk in divine health. That no plague, no disease, no sickness shall draw nigh unto your body because the blood of Jesus. Because when Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died, and those Roman soldiers beat him and ripped his flesh off of his bones as they whipped him and bruised him and beat him and killed our Lord Jesus Christ for us. And our Lord Jesus Christ was buried and died but the grave couldn't hold him down Amen. the scripture says that he got up on that third day after going down and stripping the devil of all of his power and authority and preached to the captives and came up out of that grave saying with all power all power saying all power all power all power all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me and he gave us the authority over demons and devils and coronavirus uh, and the plagues of the enemy uh, and nothing shall draw nigh unto our body no sickness and disease shall cause us to live in defeat because of the blood of Calvary because of the blood of Jesus because of the resurrection power of almighty God that has cleansed us has delivered us and has set us free and as king's kids uh, we walk not in uh, fear uh, we, but we walk in faith uh, and we walk in power and we walk in might uh, we got on the whole armor of God uh, we can stand against demons and devils uh, we can stand against every demonic force uh, no sickness and disease uh, no coronavirus is coming to my body uh, no fear is coming to my body uh, no torment is coming to my body uh, no demon is coming to my body uh, no devil coming to my body uh, I'm behind the blood. Uh, the blood covers me. Uh, the blood cleanses me. Uh, and the blood cleanses you. Uh, and the blood covers you. Uh, and the blood protects you. Uh, walk in faith. Uh, not by sight. Uh, don't let fear torment you. Uh, God got you. The angels of heaven are backing you up. Uh, you stand strong in the power of God's might. Uh, you stand strong. Uh, uh, dress with all of the power of the armor on your life. Uh, and know that you are more than a conqueror. And know no coronavirus is going to touch this. Do, 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 do. As I close, it's important that we know who we are. You're born again. You're born again to live again. Amen. So the old man is crucified. That 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 has died. God ain't gonna kill you again. You dwelling, he's dwelling in you. He's going to protect his. You belong to God. Amen. As I close, know this. That you're twice God's property. Amen. 
Once, because he created you. Second, because he redeemed you. He bought you with a price. You are bought and paid for by the precious blood of Jesus. And know this, demons and devils and demonic activity got to go through the blood of Jesus. And I want you to know today, if you walk by faith, they won't penetrate through that blood. Amen. Your faith in God causes them to turn around and back up because the blood of Jesus protects you. You got to know that you're protected with the blood of Jesus on your life. Today, know that you're protected. You got an insurance plan with God. God's got you. God loves you. God cares for you. Don't be intimidated by anything or anyone. That coronavirus will not touch your body. I believe it. I'm standing on it. And I trust God's word. Today, I'm asking you to trust God. I'm asking you to believe in his word. I'm asking you to read Psalms 91. Read that every day. And build your faith. And know no sickness and disease shall draw nigh unto your body. No coronavirus shall draw nigh to your body. No sickness shall draw nigh unto your body. Stand to Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website, FWC Charlotte, and consider giving a generous gift so we can continue the ministry. We're touching lives around the world, and you can partner with us and help us make a difference. Thank you so very much for your support and wish God's very best to you. Matthew's gospel. Matthew gospel. As Reverend uh, David said, gospel according to Matthew. Go with me to chapter 16. Let's start at verse 21. When you have it, say amen. No, let's start at verse 13. I like 13. 13. You have it? Say amen. amen. Wonderful. I'm going to continue my series on blessing blockers. In other words, what I'm saying to you when I say blessing blockers, God has already blessed us. The scripture says that we have been blessed. Past tense. We've already been blessed. The scripture says, we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And that's the problem. They're in heavenly places. But they, we have been blessed with them, but they're in heavenly places. So we, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we got to get heaven down on earth. But we have a real devil, real demons, and real demonic forces that hinder us from receiving what God has already released and blessed to our life. Our adversary goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy or he can trip up or he can get you sidetracked and rob and steal because he's a thief and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So he comes to get your goods, to get your blessing, to keep you from receiving. Because Paul says it like this, that our battle, our struggle is not against each other. It's against demons and devils and demonic activity, high-ranking demons that are hindering us from receiving what God has already blessed us with. 
So it's our job to get our stuff. It's our job to get blessed. But we got to get rid of the blessing blockers. The blessing blockers are the one that's hindering us. So I'm, I have a series on blessing blockers, and I want to deal with some of those today. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Let's look at verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said, of course, to Simon Peter and to all of them, but who do you say I, I am? In other words, what's the gossip on the street? What are, what are they saying out there? And he says, verse 16 said, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Say, which is in heaven. Amen. Say it again, which is in heaven. Amen. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Now, that not just to the front door, but I'm going to give you to every area. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom to unlock and to lock up some things. So he's given us authority to bind and to loose. And whatsoever thou bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, what is, what is bound in heaven, what you loosen from heaven, is already loose or always what you loose on what you bind on earth is already bound in heaven and what you loose on earth is already been loosed in heaven in other words verse 20 says then then charge his disciples that they should tell no man that he was a Christ from that time forth he began to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem say go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, say suffer many things, of the elders, say of the elders, and the chief priests and the scribes, and the chief priests and the scribes, say it, and be killed, and be raised, uh, raised again on the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee hence, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Father, I thank you for your word. And I ask in the name of Jesus to anoint this congregation to hear what the Spirit of the Lord was saying. That they can remove the blessing blockers that will hinder and work against their life that they can receive what you've already blessed them with in spiritual places. And we thank you for them. Anoint me afresh and anew and anoint to hear as I pray in Jesus name. Amen. The first blessing blocker I want us to deal with is we fail to listen carefully. It is a blessing blocker when we fail to listen carefully. Peter failed to listen carefully. Jesus tells him, I must go to Jerusalem. I must suffer persecution of the priests and be killed. And he heard that. And based on half-truth, he responded. And so often we hinder and have blessing blockers in our life when we don't hear the whole counsel when we don't hear the whole conversation, when we don't hear what is actually being said totally, because he only heard half of it. He didn't hear the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to rise on the third day. All he heard was you're going to be killed, and he said, over my dead body, it ain't going to happen. He did not hear the resurrection part and say, hey, Jesus, hey, how that's going to happen? 
How are you going to be resurrected on the third day? He never heard the whole council. And blessing blockers hinder us when we don't hear the whole counsel, when we only hear half truth and we make decisions based on half truth. And it's a blessing blocker to hinder you from moving into your greatness and becoming extraordinary, becoming powerful and mighty for kingdom living. We got to get to a place where we can listen. We got to get to a place where we understand by the spirit of God. We understand what God is speaking. We understand what God is saying. We understand that God is moving because so often we understand what God has said and so often we're going by what God said but we need to now know by by go by what he is saying so often we're just going by the past of what God has said and yes God has said some marvelous things in his word but it's time for the church and the body of Christ for us to know in these last days uh, what God is speaking to his church uh, because it's time for revival it's time for an outpouring uh, it's time for a downpouring of the spirit of God it's time for us to position ourselves to hear the voice of God he that have a hear, ear let him hear what the spirit of the Lord was saying we got to listen to the counsel of God. Amen. Revelations chapter 3, verse 6. Turn there quickly. The word of God says in Revelation, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the church or the churches. So, saints, I want today to encourage you to develop a spiritual ear. To hear from the Spirit of God and not hear by your flesh, not hear by what all the rhetoric and all of this going on in the news media. Get a place with God and get along with him and hear what thus said the Lord to your spirit. Because when you've heard from God, uh, when God has spoken to you, uh, something happens on the inside. Your life is changed uh, and rearranged. Uh, now you're positioned uh, to move forward when you can hear the voice of God and you hear the spirit of truth speaking to your life. Not only as a blessing blocker uh, being failed to listen carefully, but we don't understand the plan of God. He didn't understand God's plan. Jesus is revealing to him the plan of God. He says, this is my assignment. All of us have an assignment that God has given to us. What is your assignment? You must know your assignment and know your purpose in life. Because if you don't know your purpose, somebody's going to give you theirs. And you got to know your purpose. The drug dealers uh, that's out there, those young guys selling drugs, they're living somebody else's purpose. But God has another purpose for them. So you have to know your purpose and understand and know the plan of God. Here. Jesus is explaining to him, him very and explaining to all of his disciples clearly, hey, I got to do this. This is my assignment. This is something I got to go through. I got to suffer. I, I, I got to endure persecution by the scribes and the elders. Hey, this is something, and I got to go to Jerusalem to get it done. But they don't hear that, and then they don't understand the plan of God because the plan of God was that Jesus would die on Calvary's cross and that he would be resurrected for the world, that the sins would be forgiven and he would be the sacrificial lamb. They didn't understand the plan of God. And so often we don't understand the plan of God and it becomes a blessing blocker to our life because we don't get the mind of Christ. We have to get the mind of Christ. As the scripture says, let this mind be in you who was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant and came in the likeness as you and I. Jesus Christ came in the likeness of you and I and made himself of no reputation for the glory of God. He gave up his reputation and now he has the greatest reputation. It's something about humility. It's something about dying to yourself. It's something about magnifying the Lord and magnifying your father that gives you humility and you get honor and praise for the glory of God. 
So they didn't understand the plan of God. And so often we're ignorant of God's plan. We, in, we, we oftentimes don't understand the plan of God for others. And we can then become very critical and we can begin to counsel them and not understand that God is working their, his divine plan in their life. And that God is dealing with them. And so often we are ignorant of God's plan or we don't understand the plan of God, the plan of God for their life. And blessing blockers will do that and hinder not only them, but hinder you. Because now you're becoming a stumbling block trying to do good. <laughs> you mean well. Sounds good. This is what I do. It is with me. <laughs> and giving the counsel to others, but you don't understand the plan of God in their life. Peter didn't understand the plan of God for Jesus. And Jesus made it clear, but he didn't hear. And then based on his hearing, he responded with half truth because he did not understand God's plan. Saints, I want to encourage you to get the mind of Christ and understand God's plan and his purpose and the challenges that you face. Know that God is working his divine plan in your life. All hell can be breaking loose in your life. That's not a time to have a pity party. That's not a time to quit. That's not a time to throw in the towel. That's not a time to say, I poor me. That's not a time to say, I can't do this. That's not a time to say, I'm giving up. That's not a time to say, I quit. But that's a time to get the mind of God and understand God's working his divine plan in your life uh, God is moving in your life no matter what it looks like uh, it might look like this way today but this subject to change tomorrow's a new day so we must understand the plan of God because the blessing blocker is when we don't understand the plan of God go with me if you would to Ephesians Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. You have to say amen. Let's look at verse 9. It says, having made known unto us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that at the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even him. So the plan of God is having known, un the, having known to us the mysteries of his will. God has given us the mysteries of his will, but they're in the spirit realm, and you have to seek God for the mysteries of his will. But if you seek him, he'll reveal his plan and his purpose for your life. If you look to him according to the word of God. So Peter did not understand the will of God for Jesus' life. And when we don't understand the will of God for individuals' life, we can make a mess out of it. A blessing block is when we fail to see the cause of hurt as God working his divine plan. Sometimes people, God wants them to hurt. Oh, pastor, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> God doesn't want everybody to hurt. But so often we don't realize that God puts individuals in their circumstances because of bad choices, bad decisions that they make. And God is trying to teach them a lesson, and we mess up God's plan because we're ignorant of God's plan. We don't know God's plan, so we bail them out of a situation that God put them in. Y'all missed that. We bail them out of a situation that God put them in. God's trying to work his divine plan. God's trying to teach them a lesson. God's trying to show them how they need to come present to their situation and change it. They have to make the, that choice. 
But we make decisions for others and we mess, them, we mess them up because now God's got to put them right back in that situation again that we done bailed them out. God done bailed, God, God, you done bailed them out. You're going to play God. And now you're going to bail them out of a situation that God's got them in. And God says, why don't you leave my, stay out of my business. <laughs> God says, hey, let me handle my business. You handle yours, and you know the plan of God for your life. Don't worry about their business. Let them work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. But, oh, no, we want to just respond and be a, shine, a, a, a knight in a shiny armor. Dun, da, 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 here I come. Reminds me, being first lady boy, when we first got saved and took our first church, I, we were lawyers. We were in the courtroom with folk. We were firemen. We went to put out fires all types of night. Just, man, I mean, we were. You call us 3 o'clock in the morning, instead of saying, seek to God and get the mind of God, dun, 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 dun. come on, honey, let's go. Dragging my wife out at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, going over to counsel somebody. And then, the, how you say, well, that wasn't bad, Pastor. That was pretty good. But they get a divorce anyway, so my God, what is the deal? <laughs> so we fail to see the cause of hurt is God working his divine plan. He saw, he, Peter didn't understand. All he saw and all he heard was that Jesus was going to suffer. That's all he heard. And he said, over my dead body, it ain't going to happen. You know, I'm a warrior anyway. I'll pull out my blade and I'll cut him in a minute. <laughs> hey, it ain't going to happen. That's, that's, that's where he was at because he didn't understand the plan of God and didn't listen carefully. So I want to encourage you today is that be led by the Spirit of God. Now, this is no way advocating not to help anybody or not to counsel anybody or not to assist anyone. But what I am saying to you is understand the plan of God, the purpose of God, and hear the voice of God. When he speaks to you, that's when you move, not in your own emotions. Because we have a tendency to move on our emotions. I remember we had a young man that came to church and and so everybody said, well, help him. So God didn't tell me to help him. But everybody else wanted to help him. Why not help him? So I bought him a ticket to Atlanta. <laughs> to my amazement, the next couple of days, he was right back here. <laughs> And had wasted my money going to Atlanta. I said, my goodness, what are you doing back here? Yeah, things didn't work out there <laughs> in Atlanta. Well, you might as well have stayed here, bro. And I'm just, I'm out of about 100 bucks or whatever it was. It was the money, whatever. I can't remember what it was. But whatever it was, I paid for it. Listening to people. Because I didn't want them to say, well, you know, you're so insensitive, Pastor. You see that man suffering. You see what he's going through. And how dare you turn a deaf ear to a man that's hurting. Now, contrary, we had an evangelist that came through the door the other night. And she came through that door praising God. Gave a word to the church. I mean, she was right on with her words to Freedom Worship Center in Charlotte. She was homeless, left her city to go as, as an itinerary preacher and move by faith. Now, God spoke to me then to assist the lady. She had no place to stay. And she said, and I confirm, that God said for Freedom Worship Center in Charlotte to put her up in the hotel for three days. I heard clearly from God that we were supposed to do that, and we did that. That's a difference. Then based on emotions, based on our feelings, based on our previous hurt, because so often we make decisions based on our previous hurt, what we went through. Well, I don't want to see them suffer. I remember what suffering was. 
It's really bad, 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 bad. Homeless. I remember when I was homeless, you know. And some people choose to be homeless. That's what they do is choose to be homeless. So you got to hear from the voice of God. Go with me, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So when we fail to see the cause of hurt, is God's working his divine plan. Second Corinthians chapter 12, when you have it, say amen. Look what it says. This is so powerful. The apostle Paul gives us such a revelation. He's, verse 7 says, lest I, be, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buff me. There's God's plan here, you see. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. More, listen to Paul. Paul said, more gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmity or my sickness, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take <laughs> pleasure, he said. This is this. This is awesome. I take pleasure in my infirmity, in my reproaches, in my in my necessities, in my persecution, in my distress for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now that is what a powerful statement. But God revealed to him that the thorn that was in his flesh, some scholars say it was his eyes, some say it was because he walked with a limp, that it, he had a, a hip uh, replacement, and, and <laughs> I hear all kind of things. But the fact is, he had a thorn in the flesh. The, but it was the messenger of Satan. But God says, I'm using that to keep you humble. I'm, and, and it humbled him, so listen to his conversation. He said, I would gladly rejoice in my infirmity now that Christ will be glorified. I mean, he was excited, ignited, enthused, and infused because he was anointed and appointed by God. So he was thrilled. He was excited about his thorn in the flesh because Problems are God's plan to make us and shape us and mold us. And James says it like this. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh endurance, he says. So not only sometimes do we fail to see the cause of hurt is God working his divine plan. The apostle Paul didn't have that struggle. He understood that this pain was the plan of God for his life. So he was strengthened through that because he understood that. But do you understand what you're going through? So often we want to alleviate the pain. And sometimes God wants us to deal with pain so we can have gain. We, we, blessing blocker. We're prompted by our sincere love and concern for the one hurting. I mean, he was really, really concerned. I mean, he had a real heart for Jesus. I got to give it to Peter. Peter had a real, I mean, love for Jesus. And he was prompted by his sincere love for him. And so often we're prompted by our sincere love for our kids, our children, our friends, our neighbors. And so we respond and we're a blessing blocker in their life so often and we don't see the plan of God in their life. And we feel an urgency to bail them out. We feel an urgency to come to their rescue. We feel this urgency because we, we understand the pain. We understand the hurt. We're prompted by our sincere love for that person, our sincere dedication. And listen, Peter was very, very concerned about Jesus. He was very, very concerned and moved with the fact that I am concerned. I mean, I am so concerned that Jesus is, is getting ready to be killed. Jesus is going to be crucified. I'm concerned. And I got to do something about it. But so often we bail people out and we fix something that God didn't tell us to fix. And then we end up in a fix. And we go, how did I get myself in this? I remember one time. Years ago, I 
young lady didn't have any finances, any any uh, money to pay her rent. Oh, well, we got to do something. Definitely. We got to do something. And so we immediately, the church responded. The church responded and, and paid her rent. We thought we were doing a great thing. But we didn't count the cost ourselves and didn't counsel with the lady and find out what the problem. We just want to help. We didn't check what the situation was or what the problem was or how she entered into that. We were ignorant ourselves of God's plan. So we just immediately forked out back. This was years ago when 400 and some dollars was a lot of money. <laughs> and we paid her rent. And then the next month, we didn't count the cost. And the next month, next, next month, she needed 400 and something dollars again. And I done borrowed the money. To, to pay. I didn't have that money. So I had no way of paying uh, the next month because I had to pay back the person that I owed for borrowing the money to help her. And what are you saying? I'm saying that... God has so often has his uh, divine plan for an individual and we get in the way and then we fix something that God did not tell us to fix. And then we're in a fix. Then I, I was in a fix. I had to pay the person back, didn't have no more money to help her, and she ended up getting evicted anyway. So she could have got evicted the month before and I would have had 400 and something dollars. <laughs> All right, I'm almost done. <laughs> Glory to God. Look at Matthew Gospel, chapter 16. Look at verse 23. Well, let's look at 22. Then Jesus took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, this shall not be unto thee. He was prompted by his sincere love and concern for Jesus, who he felt like was hurting. So not only are we sometimes blessing blockers by the fact that we are concerned in our heart for the person who is hurting, but we fear sometimes that this thing is going to happen to us. We feel like that, hey, if I do help them, then God will favor me, and it won't happen to me. I'm afraid of being homeless. I'm afraid if I don't help the homeless, that one day is going to happen to me. And we have fear in our emotions of being afraid, and so we help people based on fear. Based on fear that this I don't want this to happen to me. I don't want to be homeless. I don't want to be going through these difficulties. I don't want to be evicted. I don't want, to, I, I don't, I don't want this to happen to me. And so we're afraid a lot of times in our emotions, and so we are prompted by our emotions rather than the Spirit of God. So we move based on fear. But the scripture says in, in 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And perfect love casts out fear. So fear can cause us to do a lot of things. Fear can mess you up. Fear keeps the people. Fear keeps people. Fear keeps people. Fear keeps people in bondage. It paralyzes. Fear is a paralyzer. You can't move because you're afraid. So don't let the enemy, the blessing blocker, put fear on you. It has torment, the scripture said. Fear has torment. It'll torment you. There's a space in God that you can find that you can live. That you can live life powerfully. You can live life on purpose. You can live life intentional. And you, you can say, these things don't move me. I'm not moved by nothing. 
I'm not moved by what happens. I'm not moved about circumstances. I'm not moved by situations because I know God is in control. I know that God is working his divine plan in my life, and I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ Jesus. Last but not least, and I'm done. Another blessing blocker, and I'm done. Based on the fact of our previous hurt, we have a tendency to respond to help others. Today, I want to encourage you to remove the blessing blockers because our Lord Jesus Christ suffered according to the scriptures. I want you to know today that Peter could not and did not stop God's divine plan. The Lord Jesus Christ did suffer. He did go to Jerusalem and he was killed. And those Roman soldiers beat him. Those Roman soldiers whipped him and he suffered dearly. And they killed him. And our Lord and Savior died. They put him in the grave. But the grave couldn't hold him down. The scripture says that on the third day, he rose again. So I'm here to tell you today, we serve a risen Christ. We serve a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to his power that works, worketh in us. And he gave you keys. When he went down to hell and stripped the devil of all of his authority and all of his power and came up out of that grave with all authority and said, all power, all power, all power, all power, all power. All power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And he gave you the power. He gave you the keys. He gave you the authority. He gave you over death and principalities and powers and made an open show of them uh, and embarrassed them demons and gave you the power and authority to walk as an overcomer, to walk strong, to walk mighty, to walk courageous, to walk boldly in the power of the anointed one and his anointing. Stand to your feet. Father, I thank you for your I want to continue my series on blessing blockers. Because I'm convinced, and you can't change my mind, it's too late, that, that we have blessing blockers that hinder us from receiving what God has blessed us with. The word of God says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, it says that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We've already been blessed. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're already blessed. And so often we're trying to get blessed, but we are already blessed. But the real problem is we fight a real demon and a real devil and demonic activity that hinder us from receiving what God has already blessed us with. Because in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, same verse, Chapter uh, 6, verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against the wiles. That wiles means the tricks, the schemes of the devil. So our battle is not against each other. It's not against your wife. It's not against your husband. It's not against your pastor. It's not against your boss. What hinders you from receiving the blessing is demons and devils and demonic activity. So I minister these blessing blockers to get you present to how blessed and how extraordinary that you are. That inside of you is this great genius. Inside of you is this awesome, unique person that my wife talks about so often that makes you who you are. But the enemy, the adversary, is jealous of you. He's upset with you. And I'm going to show you in the word of God how he's angry and upset with you. And ultimately, he's upset at Adam and Eve. But this morning, I want to get you present 
to that you are the blessed of the Lord and that you were created in the image and the likeness of God. And our battle, our struggle is against demons. We fight devils and demonic activity. But the scripture says, put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against the schemes, the tricks of the devil. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Amen. And the power of his might. So I want to minister to you and get you blessed and remove the blessing blockers out of your life. Because blockers hinder you. If you ever had a blockage in your heart, it will hinder you from living. And so the enemy uses blockers to hinder you from becoming extraordinary, becoming awesome. Because we're listening to 1,500 negative words come to our mind a minute and fighting all that data that's coming at us all the time. And we got to fight that. But you fight that in the spirit realm. But if our lives are messed up, jacked up, tore up from the flow up, and the natural generally is jacked up, tore up in the spirit. The, the natural coincide with the spirit. So if you want to take a checkup from the neck up and see who you are, then you, all you have to do is mirror your life and see where you're at and look at what you designed. Because you are a designer. That's why you like designer things. <laughs> <laughs> you are a designer and you designed your life and if you don't like the way you design it tear up tear up the design and and redesign who you are and know that your your design is in your mouth it's what you say what comes out of your mouth that you can declare and decree that's why we say that we're the early risers in the morning that we rise early that we are the early risers that we rise in the morning and we declare and decree what's possible we speak those things that be not as though they were we're faith talkers amen amen, amen. turn to your neighbor and say neighbor are you a faith talker <laughs> so this morning I'm, i want to tread on some territory that you may or may not agree with and i'm so delighted that we have my dear sister dr Valentine with me to scrutinize this message because I'm telling you what I'm going out there today. Amen. Amen. And I was a little when the Lord was dealing with, with me with this message. Uh, I was had a little reservation. I said maybe I should wait till Dr. Valentine uh, is gone to to share this because uh, I'm going way out there. And then I, yesterday we were fellowshipping. And we were talking about some controversial issues and things that, that you really can't answer, you know, in the scripture. And she just said, you just, she, she stood up, she said, y'all making a good conversation. But then afterwards she told me, she said, you know what, you just need to go with the basics of life because uh, there's a controversy, something she shared with me. And her response to me, let me know that I had the liberty to preach this, teach this word this morning. So, <laughs> so get your Bibles if you would. And, and turn them, if you would, to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. When you have it, say amen. I'm going to ask Dr. R.J. Lightsey if he would read verses 12 through 19. Now, as we prepare to read that, James tells us in the New Testament, James tells us that all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. That's what James tells us. So every temptation and every trial is tied to those three areas. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And we see in in Genesis, when they were in the garden, when Adam and Eve was in the garden, we see the story of their temptation. And we see that they were tried with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And we see where the first Adam fell, the second Adam went through the same trial in the wilderness and was tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, and he passed the test. So the second Adam succeed, and now you are the third Adam. You have to know that you are the third 
Adam. And being the third Adam, you have a choice. God created you as a free moral agent. But you have to get present to being whole and complete. Because when there's issues in your life, then issues magnify existing problems within. And I'm going to show you how Satan, Lucifer, allowed himself, as awesome and extraordinary and as powerful as he was, he allowed himself to live in defeat. And then it's going to help you guard yourself against demons and devils and allowing yourself to deal with issues and problems that will hoodwink you and bamboozle you and trick you, trick you. Because the graveyard is full of folk who never fulfilled their God-given assignment. They never fulfilled their God-given purpose. They got tricked and they lost out and they died in defeat. The graveyard full of them folk. But there is a group of individuals that understand and not ignorant of Satan's devices. Amen. Yes. And I want you to know this morning, your pastor is not ignorant of Satan's devices. Ezekiel chapter 28, are you ready? Let's read verse, let's start at verse 11 and go through verse 19. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Stop right there. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you feel or what is your thinking as to why that Lucifer failed and was kicked out of heaven? Some of you would say because of pride. Some of you would say rebellion. Some of you would say he... He exalted himself in many, many reasons that you would come up with. But today, I believe that the reason why he was kicked out of heaven, it was because of his jealousy towards Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve was created, he became jealous. He became upset because here he was all that, then some, and a bag of chips. I mean, he had it going on. The scripture is clear how beautiful he was, how awesome he was, how extraordinary he was. And he had everything going on. He had everything working for him. And him and God had a thing going on. And he was pleasing God in the music department and ministering unto the Lord. And I contend that he felt like he wasn't enough when God created Adam and Eve. I feel like he got jealous when he seen the relationship that they had. When he seen that, that he would meet them in the cool of the day and hang out with them and talk with them and fellowship with them and walk with them. And I contend that he became angry and jealous and upset, which is a blessing blocker. And I believe that that spirit today is running rampant in our lives and our hearts that we 
we easy to become jealous of those who God has blessed. But I'm declaring today uh, that you are the blessed of the Lord. Uh, and no matter what the enemy throws at you and you feel less than, know that you're more than a conqueror. Know that you're created in the image and the likeness of God. Uh, that you favor God. That God has your best interest at heart. Uh, that God is for you. And if God be for you, then everybody else might as well be. Can you put those hands together and give God praise? We see here in verse 13, who has been in the garden of God. That he was in the garden as well. And then we also see here in the scripture that iniquity was found in him. That was his issue. The iniquity was there because circumstances will activate the real you. Problems will activate who you are. Is there something inside of you that's an issue, a problem that you've never dealt with? There's a problem that perhaps you were molested at a young age, or perhaps uh, you were abused as, as a teenager, or perhaps you had some issues and problems in life, and those went dormant for a while, but something happened, and the iniquity was within you. And iniquity is sin, it's lawlessness, it's transgression. And when that becomes a reality, when it surfaces in your life, so often the only thing we say is, Something's wrong. And we have no clue what that is. And it becomes a blessing blocker in our life. And we go through life with this struggle of this iniquity within us. We go through this struggle of never experiencing victory. Because we don't experience the experience of the experience of the anointed one and his anointing to deliver us and set us free. We never die to the flesh. We never crucify the flesh. We never put aside our fleshly way and say, for God I live and for God I die. We never put ourselves on the operating table and say, God search me, O Lord, and see if there's anything wicked in me. And if anything is not like you, Lord, would you remove it today uh, that I can be uh, more than a conqueror? that I can be strong and mighty and courageous and fulfill my God-given purpose and my God-given assignment that I can walk victorious before the world that I am an overcomer because I came over. Somebody ought to praise God with me this morning. And so we get tricked by what's inside of us, the iniquity. And so because he was so all of that and he got hurt, because, believe it or not, spirits have emotions. You say, Pastor, that's not true. Well, it's a grieve not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so it can be grieved. So they have emotions. And you know how it is if you've been around a friend for a long time and y'all been running together, your ace boom coon, and y'all just got it going on together. And then all of a sudden they flip the script on you. And get with some buddies and say, we're going to do something else. Because the Holy Spirit and God and Jesus got together and they said, we're going to create man. We're going to create man and we're going to create him in our image, in our likeness. And he was upset that he lost his position. And because of that, he became angry, I contend. And so often we can get angry when we have friends who seem like they pulled away from us and now we're jealous of them because now they connected with somebody else and then we go what's wrong with me i ain't do nothing to you so satan lucifer better known is upset disappointed and so then he takes the attitude rebellion kicks in but the root cause was his anger and his jealousy that God created Adam and Eve. The root problem was, I'm being pushed aside. Because you think about it. You think about it for just a moment. He had it made. His position was awesome. I mean, Gabriel, who was a messenger angel, he never had a problem with delivering the message. <laughs> He have never had a problem. He didn't get caught up in rebellion, Gabriel. Never. Never. He followed instructions. And Michael, the archangel Michael, whenever he was needed, 
the archangel, dun, 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 charge. He was ready to handle his business. So why did Lucifer, the angel, get tricked and hoodwinked? It was because of jealousy. Because he's now feeling less than. And Satan comes to devalue you. If he can devalue you, make you feel less than, make you feel like you ain't all that, put you down, and make you feel like, that, hey, you can't do it. I can't accomplish it. I tried, pastor. I gave him a best shot. It just ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. It wouldn't work. Can't do it. I tried. And, and so often when we feel like we've given it our best because we're, it's our best, but it's not God's best. If we would look to God, if we would turn our face towards him and say, God, you said that I can do all things through you who will strengthen me, that I'm the head and not the tail, that I'm more than a conqueror, yeah. that I was made in the image and the likeness of you, that I have co-creative power with you. That I can declare and decree what's possible. Uh, that I can speak those things that be not as though they were. Uh, that I am more than a conqueror and begin to rise in the authority of the anointed one and his anointing and take charge over the things that have taken charge over you. Take authority over the things that have taken authority over you. Rise up in your power and your anointing and know whose you are and who you are and let the world say, I'm coming up. I want the world to know who I am in God. But so often our adversary is beating us down. He's stealing from us, robbing from us, because his assignment, his assignment is to kill, steal, and destroy. Amen. But he can only steal from you unless you, when you let him. Right. Amen. If you guard your house with, a, uh, with these alarm systems, when the enemy comes, you'll be protected. You've got to know how to protect your house. Yes. You've got to know how to guard against demons and devils and demonic activity. And don't get tricked and suckered into people's conversation when they're gossiping and talking about folk. You stand up and, and, and go, for the, go and declare and say, and rebuke them in the name of the Lord. You say, hey, they're not here to defend themselves, and I'm not going to allow that Lucifer spirit around me. Uh, it's got to go uh, today. And you do it in love. I'm not talking about abusing nobody. I'm not talking about mistreating nobody. I'm not talking about mishandling anybody. But I'm talking about correcting somebody. Me and Dr. Lysi were talking on yesterday uh, at our fellowship time that we had together. And uh, Dr. Lysi talked about Peter and how Peter was hypocritical and how Paul withstood him to his face and said, you are to blame. He didn't bite his tongue. So often when people are talking about each other, tearing one another down, being jealous towards one another, we feel an obligation to be apart. <laughs> we feel an obligation to put our two cent in. Well, you know, they didn't really handle me. I remember back, you know, shoot, I was wondering what the deal was. Thank you for that revelation. Now I know what the real problem is. <laughs> And we think then, now we got this revelation and we join in. Instead of taking leadership and taking charge and say, I am not going to have this in the house of the Lord. I'm not even going to have it on my job. I'm not having it in my home. I'm not having it around me. Because I know that spirit of jealousy was birthed through Lucifer because he was angry with Adam. He was upset with Eve. And now ultimately he upset with me. <laughs> because <laughs> because he, he's upset with you i want you to know satan is upset with you because now you are in the image of god yeah. i mean you are you got to know you are somebody that's right see so often we're beat down we're beat down told that we're less than told we can't do it because you know we go through life growing up 
you know, we're in our, our mother's belly for nine months, got it made in the shade in that nice water bed, you know, just chilling, taking it easy, enjoying it. Mom is, is uh, feeding us and we're eating real good. Don't have to do no work, you know, just laid in the water bed. And then, you know, all of a sudden, after nine months, our world is interrupted. Bam! We out, out and we go, ah! Dr. Bam hits us, and we got to deal with life. And then, as we're dealing with life, we are told no. You can't do this. And we're told more what we cannot do than what we can do. And so we go through life fighting for a yes. <laughs> Because we've been told no, 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 no. I'm sick of no. <laughs> I want a yes. So now we're, we got this quest in life looking for a yes. So when we get acceptance from some people, then it's on. Okay. And, and then what happens is the violation comes in our life. And life doesn't have the workability. We didn't honor our parents. We didn't honor our mother and father. Uh, and now our lives are all jacked up, tore up from the flow up because we were looking for a yes. And when we found that yes, that yes was not the best. <laughs> and so now life for us has become a challenge. But we know something wrong. And then throughout that time, in our hearts, there's this longing for to be whole and complete. There's this longing to find peace. Is, is this longing to connect? Because we're disconnected. There's a separation from God. There's a separation from, from who we know we should be. And so now we're on this quest to find peace and find love and to find happiness. And all of a sudden, we meet Jesus. All of a sudden, Jesus comes into our heart. And we accept the Lord, and we're delivered. And, and that euphoria, that initial experience is awesome. It's extraordinary. We're now we're set free, and we're whole and complete. But now we don't know what to do. We got saved, so now we know we're saved, but we don't get into the word of God. You would be surprised at the people. You would be surprised at yourself if you do an examination of how much of the word of God you know. Or how much you was told. Dr. Lysey and Sharon Lysey was having a uh, on Talk Back Sunday, and they were talking about uh, certain scriptures that, or <laughs> here, let me do this. Before, before I do that, Turn your Bible to Hezekiah real quickly. Turn it. <laughs> okay, some of you got it. Okay. That's not nice. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lexi, for that rebuke. <laughs> okay, but my point is, some of us think Hezekiah is a book. Okay? He was a prophet. Okay, we're going to turn... My point is, we need to know the real thing, as we were talking in Talk Back Sunday, that we need to know the real thing so well that we can know the counterfeit. Now, Reverend Sharon Lightsey, she immediately said, there's not a book, Hezekiah. Okay? Immediately, she identified with that. Dr. Lightsey knew it, but he knew where I was going, so he didn't say nothing. <laughs> But the point is, we need to understand and know God's word because once we come to the saving knowledge of Christ and we're delivered and we experience the experience of the experience, that's what you build on. But know that just like the drug dealers when they're out there selling drugs and you say, I got saved, and they say, saved from what? Not from me because you're going to sell drugs. You started with us and you're going to finish with us. You can't get out. Well, that's the way Satan, Lucifer, is. Once he's got you, he says you ain't going to leave him. 
And so he's determined to keep you when you're determined to get out. And the only way you're going to get out is to stay in the word and fellowship with believers and withdraw yourself from those who don't know the Lord, come out from among them, and then get strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and then get courageous and go back and charge and share your faith and share your story and share your testimony and tell them, I understand how you feel. I felt that way myself. But here's what I found. I found that I serve a God who can deliver and set free. Uh, I was once bound. Uh, I was once tied up. Uh, I was once in chains. Uh, but my God set me free. And I'm a brand new creation. And if anybody in Christ, uh, they're a new creature. The old is done away with and the new has come. And guess what? The new has come to me. And I'm excited and ignited, enthused and infused. And guess what? I'm anointed and appointed. Hey! That's when you experience and remove the blessing blockers in your life. Because the blessing blocker will come and knock on your door and block you and stop you and hinder you. But you got to recognize and not be ignorant of Satan's devices and how he wants to hinder you from moving into your greatness. Every single one of us were called to be great for God. But Satan says over my dead body, I'm mad at Adam, and I'm now I'm mad at you. So he's mad because he lost out. He, because iniquity was found in him. Yes. Listen to me. Don't let iniquity be found in you. Because you are born again to live again. And once you are born again and born from above, you have to guard against evilness. Yeah. You have to protect yourself. You have to dress for success with the armor of God. Dress for success. Dress to impress. And certainly dress better than the rest. And make sure that you're dressed with the whole armor of God. And any adversary comes your way to steal, to hinder you, to devalue you, to put you down, you recognize that's a blessing blocker ready to block me from moving into my destiny. It's out to hinder me. It's out to work against me and refuse to let it hinder you. I'm going to close with this. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. When you have it, say amen. amen. Now, this was a church that didn't know Christ. The Corinthian church was a church that had all kind of sexual immoralities going on in the church, inside of the church. As a matter of fact, it was so bad that one guy was going with his stepmother in the church. And so Paul writes a letter to him and says, hey, deliver him over for, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his soul will be saved, Paul says. So this is a church that had, had mega issues with sexual immorality and sexual issues in their life. And I was talking with someone, I think it was Reverend Sharon Lightsey, was talking about homosexuality and how it's so strong that it connects to the very core of your being. And that it ties you up and, and, and binds you and hinders you. And violations from a young age hinder us and, and keep us from moving into our greatness. We feel less than because we have been violated and it becomes a blessing blocker. So because of these issues that was in the church, Paul wrote a phenomenal letter. And I want to explain this letter to you clearly in closing. Verse 11 says, would to God 
ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous. There is a good side of jealousy. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I might present you as a chastened virgin to Christ. The Apostle Paul says, you guys have had orgies, sexual involvement inside the church. You have lived ungodly lives in the name of the Lord. But because now that I am a man of God called and I am the third Adam, one of the third Adams, now I'm going to pull my rank and I'm going to pull charge and take charge here with this situation. And this is what he says to them. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a chastened virgin to Christ. He says here, I'm going to deal with you now in your sin. I'm going to chastise you. And I'm going to deal with you. And once I deal with you, it's behind the blood. Once I deal with you, it's thrown in the sea of forgetfulness. And furthermore, I'm going to present you as a virgin, a chastened virgin unto the Lord. As if it never happened. All your sexual immorality, all your sexual perversion, I'm dealing with it now, and I'm rebuking you now, and I'm correcting you now, and I'm wiping your slate now, clean now, and I'm going to present you as if it never happened. So when you get married, you can wear a white dress. <laughs> when you get married, uh, you are pure. You get married now, uh, you are put on the altar of God, uh, and I'm putting you on the altar of God. And once you put on the altar of God, you're sanctified with God. And he puts them on the altar of God and sanctifies them and sets them pure before mankind. I'm here to declare to you today, uh, no matter what you've been involved with, no matter no matter how the enemy has deceived you, no matter how the enemy has devalued you, no matter how the enemy has hit, hurt you, no matter how the enemy has, has, has mishandled you, no matter what has taken place in your life, today, Pastor Randall Hall Walker, as the third Adam, uh, is going to present you as a chastened virgin unto the Lord, as if it never happened. The blood of Jesus now cleanses you of all of your past, uh, anything you have done, uh, anything that you've been involved in, anything that has been hindered you, any blessing blocker in your life, uh, anything that has worked against you to harm you, anything that has tried to destroy you, today I'm presenting you as changed in virgin, virgins unto the Lord as if it never happened and put you on the altar of God and the Shekinah glory of God coming down and is going to sanctify you and set you apart and drive you to a place of completion in God. Can you stand to your feet and get Give God praise. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air, go to fwccharlotte.com and click on give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you.
I'm really excited about Black History Month, and we've had an extraordinary, wonderful service, and I thank God for all of you who have shared and have done just a phenomenal job with representing our culture, representing where our, our roots. I want to special thank my darling, darling baby, Bradella Hall Walker, for the awesome job. And today, and all of you who, who uh, poems and different things, and all of you who work so uh, diligent, and thank you so much. And so we're going to tie, uh, tie our message into that to some degree. And I want to honor how you look. All of you look so wonderful. Amen. I really, yes, give the Lord a big hand. But I want to continue also my series on blessing blocker, blockers because I'm convinced that in order for us to live life powerfully, we have to get rid of the blessing blockers that hinder us from receiving what God has already blessed us with. As you all know, that the scripture says that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. So our job is to get heaven down on earth. And our adversary, the devil, goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he can destroy and hinder and work against you. So today I want to deal with uh, racism. And I believe, no doubt in my mind, that racism is perpetrated by the enemy, by Satan, to divide and conquer. There's no question about no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Because the scripture is clear that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against high-ranking de devils and demons and demonic activity that hinder us from receiving what God has already blessed us with, but our adversary, the enemy, works against us. So I want to I want to deal with racism briefly. I'm not going to go into it long, uh, but I want to deal with it because being Black History Month, I feel an obligation before the Lord to deal with it. First John, turn your Bibles to First John. When you have it, say Amen. First John chapter four. I want to I want to read verse twenty to you real quickly. It says, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. <laughs> you know, I like this. It's not sugar-coated at all. He's a bold-faced liar. Amen. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how, the question is asked, how can he love God whom he's never seen? Makes sense, doesn't it? And this is the commandment have we for him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. So the key here is loving people. You cannot love God without loving his people. You may think I go all day long saying I love God, I love this person, I love, but if, you, but if your actions doesn't demonstrate what you really believe, then you are lying and saying I love God, but then you don't love his people, and you don't love your neighbors, you don't love your cousins, and you don't love different ethnic groups, different individuals that don't look like you. <laughs> so the bottom line here is we have to love everyone. You know, we talk about the black race, the white race, the brown race, but it's all about the human race. Amen. That's what it's about. It's about the human race. So I want to deal today with racism. I want to deal with the fact that there are three ways that I see racism. Number one, prejudice by law. Number one, prejudice by culture and prejudice by nature. Let's look at those for just a moment. Acts chapter 10, I'm gonna ask Dr. R.J. Leitze if he would be so kind to read. Acts chapter 10, when you have it, say amen. amen. Let's start at verse Acts chapter 10, and let's start at verse 28. Acts 10, verse 28. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an awful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Okay, let me just read it here from the King James to bring out clarity. It says, And he said unto them, you know how it is unlawful 
for a man, for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into another nation or another ethnic group. That word here where we see nation means ethnic groups. So it is unlawful. In other words, it reminds me of the Jim Crow law. That there is a law that segregation must prevail. Now, growing up in Detroit, Michigan, I got to I got to confess, I knew nothing about segregation, but I heard about Dr. King and I heard about his goal and I heard about his mission and I heard about all of those who lost their life. Emma Till, who lost his life because he whistled at a white woman. I heard all of those horrible stories, didn't know that it was a reality being so young. But the fact of the matter is that segregation was legal. It was legal in the South that you, that you had to be divided. And from what I understand in my study is that there were white water fountains and black water fountains, that there were b black restaurants and, and white restaurants, and it was, we were segregated. But it was amazing that it was the law. <laughs> That's what's so amazing to me, that it was by the law. So we can be prejudiced because of the law. And Peter was prejudiced because of the law. He was unlawful for him to hang out with anybody else. And they didn't like the Samaritans because they were half-breed, they were mixed. So it was a racial thing even then, back in, old, back in the day with Jesus, it was a racial thing. And it's a racial thing today. And it takes people like you and me to, to change that, to break all of those shackles and those chains of racism and say, hey, he hell or high water, I'm going to love you whether you love me or not. I don't care how you treat me, I'm going to love you. And I think Dr. King sent a powerful message to the world when he said this statement that the most segregated hour in America is at 11 a.m. Uh, we're so divided in our nation. And today, our nation is even worse uh, in, in, in division and being divided. It takes a group of people to come together and pray and bombard heaven and say we're going to break these laws of the spirit where the demonic activity and the satanic spirit is dividing us uh, and we got to break through demonic forces and satanic spirit and begin to bombard heaven on our behalf and say uh, for God I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe you to break every shackle, every yoke of racism I'm going to love white people whether they love me or not <laughs> well pastor that's you man I ain't with that <laughs> I heard how they did my ancestors and we saw that today as Rosinka Snipe Wilson dragged the young lady, my precious wife, dragged her. And that went on. And we understand that if we watch Roots and we watch all the different television series and it paints the picture, that we can become bitter. We can become resentful. We can begin to hate. And we can begin to develop animosity. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus came on the scene to show us how to love one another. In spite of racism, he says, uh, I, I must go to Samaria. Why did he have to go to Samaria? Because the Samaritan people didn't like the Jews and the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. There was a racial thing there. And so we see that it was, a, it was lawful for them to be segregated. And today, thank God, there's no law that you have to be segregated against any race or denomination or any, any. We are at Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte and we are living in freedom today and no demonic forces and no satanic spirit can tell us who to love and who not to love, but God tells us to love everybody. Now y'all don't have to shout me down today. I know I'm telling the truth. So, we have to love one another. In spite of the way, and what happens is people that don't look like us, we don't feel comfortable with them. Or don't, don't have it where they hurt you. Don't have it where they hurt you. When they hurt you, then every white person you see, they remind you. I, hey, now that I can testify. I remember I had a deuce and a quarter, electric 225. Go 
I mean, I'm telling you what, I, I had it going on. Sunroof top, digging the scene with a gangster lean. Ooh. <laughs> and I was coming from Ford Motor Company one night, and this Caucasian gentleman came and bam, I mean, pulled out, ran the light, and, and tore my deuce and a quarter up. And I was hot to try. And, and then the, he had the nerve, not only to tear up my car, he gonna drive off. <laughs> and so I am furious. And then there was a car on the side of me, a Caucasian gentleman. And I grabbed his car door and I said, hey, let's catch you. He said, woo, and left me standing there holding the, the door knob. I became angry. I became resentful. And I didn't like white folk because of my deuce in the quarter. It was I love things rather than I love people. So I'm upset and I'm mad. And for a couple of years, I went around angry towards all white folk. And then I talked with a dear friend of mine one day. And I shared with him how I just thought it was so wrong for how that guy did me because he helped his white brethren and how we as black brothers don't stand together. And if he had been a black guy, he would have jumped in and said, come on, bro, let's go. <laughs> oh, I thought that was funny. <laughs> and so, so as I was seeking counseling on this issue, I'll never forget. The counselor told me, said, you know what? You're looking at that all wrong. Perhaps the gentleman just didn't want to get involved. Didn't have nothing to do with him tearing up your car. It's just he didn't want to get involved. And that released me from a moment of racism because I came to, my, to the senses that that perhaps was the case, that it had nothing to do with race. And so often we can think that everything that happens to us, we can equate it to racism. If our boss mistreats us, it's racism. If our neighbor throws junk on our, on our property, it's racism. If, if they cut us off as we're driving down the street, it becomes racism. But I'm here to tell you that our battle is not against flesh and blood. We must understand the scripture is clear that we fight demons and devils that are out to divide and conquer. And when the enemy can divide you, he can conquer you. One of the most powerful tools that we have in the body of Christ is to love one another. Amen. In spite of what has happened, in spite of what has gone on, in spite of the history, we can love regardless. Let's read. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Stop right there. So he says, the reality came to him that God showed him that he, that he shouldn't be racist. And God has to reveal to us, and I trust today in this message, that God will reveal to us that in spite of what has happened as we celebrated Black History Month today and as, as the skit de depicted racism and, and as we listened to what was taking place in that era, that we won't get bitter, but we'll get better. Amen. We won't be resentful, but we'll love. We won't develop a spirit of hatred, but we'll de develop a spirit of love. Let's read verse 34, and I'm almost done, y'all. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. It came by revelation. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying to you it has to come by revelation. He, it came to him by revelation that God is no respecter of persons in any ethnic group or in, cause the word nation, cause in his ethnic group, any ethnic group or any race or any color, it came to him as a revelation 
that God was no respecter of persons. And Dr. King said it like this, that we should not be judged by the, uh, by the, by the, the content. We should not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. That's what we should be judged by. And we as individuals, regardless of where we're at spiritually, I'm here to declare to you today that it's vitally important that it comes through revelation to you that God is no respecter of persons, that God loves them just like he loves you, and that you are to love every individual regardless the way they treat you, regardless the way they feel about you, though regardless the way they treat you. So not only are we prejudiced by, by, by law, but we can be prejudiced by culture. If we're not careful, we'll be prejudiced by culture. It's the very culture that we live in. I remember quickly, and I'm, I'm wrapping it up as quickly as I can, but I'm reminded of the O.J. Simpson trial. As, as this verdict was read on that day, I'll never forget how the news media painted that, that black people were celebrating. Black people were, were just so amazed and celebrating. And then on the flip side of that, they showed where the white folks were all crying. And all of them was crying. The black man done got away with murder. That was not true. There were those who, who sympathized with the Gordon family. There were those who sympathized with Nicole's death, black or white. But the news media, by culture, painted a picture, and we bought into it. And it's amazing, as I think about, as I think about being in Florida, pastoring 22 years, and, and with Trayvon Martin, and the situation with Trayvon Martin, and how they painted that into a racial thing. The guy wasn't even white. He was a, he was a Hispanic guy. But they used that and perpetrated riots and, and, and all over, and it was a racial thing. The bottom line, they were fighting, and one lost, and, and the other one shot them. Bottom line, that's what went down. If you just follow all the, all, and follow the story, and it looks like that Trayvon was winning. <laughs> and I guess uh, my friend felt like he'd get an equalizer. <laughs> Some of you catch that later. <laughs> but the fact is, we must understand that we cannot be swayed by the media about racism. And sure, you've had some bad experience. We all have. Sure, we've had faced some sin, but that doesn't give us the right to not love them and not be sensitive to them and not pray for them. That doesn't give us that right. We have to let go and let God and love a person. The scripture puts it like this. When you forgive them, it's like heaping coals of fire on them. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. And if you take care of it, God won't. <laughs> but if you back off and let God take care of it, God will take care of it for you. Amen. But regardless of the situation, we must learn to love. Amen. Last but not least, we can be prejudiced by nature. The very nature of us by what's been implanted in our lives and what's been instilled in our lives and growing up or what we have seen, it can become our very nature. And we respond based on our nature, what, what has been deposited in our life, what we've been taught. Because you say, well, that's not true, Pastor. Well, I can take two kids, black and a white one, put them together, and they'll play and have fun. And they'll enjoy one, one another, and they'll have a great time. Until mama come over and say, you can't play with that black boy. You can't play with that white boy. And then they confused. Then they don't quite understand until the nature, the very nature of hatred has been put into them. Go with me, if you would, to Galatians chapter 2. I'm almost done, y'all. Galatians chapter 2. Let's look at verse 11. Galatians chapter 2. When you have it, say amen. amen. Galatians chapter 2. Let's look at verse 11. Let's start reading. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. 
But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away within their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, yes, sir. even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Mm. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Stop right there. Let me wrap this up real quickly. Here we see the Apostle Paul. We see him recognizing racism. We see him recognizing the fact of Paul being hypocritical, or excuse me, Peter being hypocritical. Recognizing the fact that he's sitting around eating with the Gentiles and telling them they shouldn't be eating pork and yet he having him a pork chop. <laughs> He's sitting there eating, being hypocritical, and Paul withstood him to his face. Because Paul says, I came against the Jews. He withstood him to his face. He got up in his face and told him just point blank, the way you're, you're being hypocritical. And furthermore, you're influ influencing uh, Barnabas, and you got Barnabas all confused about this whole thing because of the way we live. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that when we hear about racism and we hear about the white man and we hear about the division that's taking place, we have to take a stand for what we know is right. We have to take a stand for God. We must declare before men and women, it's not about hating anyone or coming against anyone or mishandling anyone or mistreating anyone. It's about loving them. Huh? It's about caring for them. It's about having their best interest at heart, regardless, because they are not black. They're not white, but they are a human being, and we're to treat human beings like they're supposed to be treated. I'm closing with this. If you are going to hate, then let me suggest to you to hate what God hates. Turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. And if you make up in your mind you want to hate, then I, I'm good with you, but hate what God hates. If we're going to hate Let's hate what he hate. Let's not hate people because of the color of their skin. But let's love and care for one another. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. We'll close with this. Proverbs 6, 16. For these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Stop right there. 
So if you want to develop a spirit of hatred, God tells you that, hey, these are the things that I hate. I hate a proud look. I hate a liar. I hate one that, that causes discord in the body of Christ. I hate one that puts false witness. I, I, I hate one that, that uh, sheds innocent blood. I hate those who are swift, swift to go carry a bunch of garbage and be in the ears of people talking foolishness. That's what I hate. So if you want to hate something, God said, hey, hate the things that I hate. Uh, and I want to encourage you today uh, that you hate the things that God hates. Uh, if you want to hate, then you got the right to hate, but hate the things that God hates. But I got the flip side to it. Uh, love the things that God loved. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish uh, but have everlasting life. Uh, I'm here to declare to you today uh, if you're going to hate these are the things to hate. But I'm declaring, if you're going to love, then love what God's love. And that God loves people. Can you put those hands together and praise God? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That our Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth. Walked this earth and met with mankind and showed them and demonstrated love contrary to what the world's standard was, where they were divided and hating one another, nation against nation, people against people. He came and he said, I must go to Samaria. I got to take good news to Samaria. I got to go to the half breeds and tell them uh, that I love them, even though I'm a Jew. I love them just as much as I love my brother. And uh, he demonstrated love. Will you demonstrate? love as you go through your journey to greatness? Will you demonstrate care for individuals as you go through your journey to greatness? Will you care about individuals uh, as you go through your journey to greatness? Will you love on people that don't love on you on your journey to greatness? Uh, will you care about those that don't care about you uh, on your journey to greatness? Uh, will you embrace those that don't care about you? Uh, will you love them in spite of? Uh, will you care about those that talk about you and backbite you? Will you care care about them, uh, even though they mishandle you, even though they mistreat you, would you care about them? Uh, you say, oh no, pastor, I can't care about them. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can't care about God because God says there's no way uh, that you can love me uh, who you've never seen uh, and mishandle your brother, mishandle your sister, be hatred towards them, uh, be resentful towards them, be bitter towards them. Uh, racism is of the devil uh, and I'm here to buy I'm here to declare to you today uh, that racism comes from the very pit of hell. And we need a church uh, that will rise up in the name of Jesus. Uh, we need a church uh, that will open their mouth and declare before the world, I don't care what goes on. I'm going to love you whether you whether you like it or not. And you can't do nothing about it. Nah, 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 nah. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air? Go to fwccharlotte.com and click on Give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you. I'm going to continue my series on blessing blockers, but I'm going to shift just a little bit here in my uh, delivery. Um, all of us understand that Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. 
And also Ephesians chapter 6 says our battle. The struggle that we have is not each other. It's not each other. That's not the, our struggle. Even though sometimes we think that, that's not the case. Uh, your wife is not your problem. Uh, your husband is not your problem. Your kids are not your problem. Your mother's not your problem. And your dad's not your problem. And believe it or not, your boss is not your problem. <laughs> But the problem is that we wrestle against flesh and blood. So the scripture says uh, we wrestle against demon powers, in other words. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against demons and devils, high-ranking demons and devils who target us from receiving what God has already blessed us with. And a blessing blocker I want to deal with today is sickness. Sickness is a blessing blocker because the scripture is clear in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ as he overcame and, and destroyed principalities and powers, which gives us the ability to be healed and made whole, right. gives us the ability to live life whole and complete. And so often our adversary wants to put sickness and disease on us, and it's a blessing blocker. How many know you can't be effective in anything sick? But the word of God has much to say about us healed and made whole. And the blood of Jesus is key. The blood of Jesus is key to our healing. Uh, doctors will tell you that whenever there's a cut, the blood runs straight to that area to heal. Uh, and you notice young people get healed much quicker than us older folks. <laughs> but the blood rushes. Uh, it's, it's the blood of Jesus is ready to rush to your sickness and your disease. But we don't understand our benefit package. You know, we can so often uh, be on a job and have benefits available. And we don't understand our benefit package. Some of us pay doctor fees, and I remember my precious wife, we went to the eye doctor somewhere, and I said, honey, doesn't our flex car take care of that? She said, yes, I forgot. <laughs> she forgot her benefit. <laughs> we cannot forget our benefits. I'm going to read, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Lightsey to read some scripture, and I want you to get present to the power of the blood of Jesus. I want you to get present to what Calvary's cross and what Jesus Christ has done for us that we can get rid of the blessing blocker of sickness that we can live life whole and complete and if we're sick we can believe God for our healing in Jesus name turn your Bibles if you would to Psalms 103 uh, let's look at verse 1 when you have it say amen Psalms 103 You'll find these words, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget, say forget, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgive us all of thine iniquities, who heal all, say all all thy diseases. Father, I thank you for your word, and I ask in the name of Jesus that, God, you anoint me afresh and anew, that as we have this time of healing and deliverance today, that many will get healed as we prepare our hearts for communion, as we understand the power of the blood and how the blood rushes to our defense and how the blood rushes to fight on our behalf. And Lord, we're so grateful for your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Saints, turn with me. I'm going to ask Dr. R.J. Lightsey to read Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 through 5, because the scripture tells us in the Old Testament, and keep in mind, the Old Testament is truth concealed, and the New Testament is truth revealed. So let's look at something that was concealed in the Old Testament that was revealed in the New Testament for us. 
Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 through 5. Let's read. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was what? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes we are healed. Now the prophet Isaiah was a spokesman for God. And he prophesied more about the coming of Jesus than any prophet. And he made this declaration to a people who are hurting, a people who are in pain. And he's given them hope in the midst of all diseases taking place. Uh, all leprosy and all types of diseases are taking place and running rampant. And so Isaiah has a message of hope that there's a man that's going to come by the name of Jesus and he's going to deal with our sickness. Go with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. You'll notice that it says we are healed. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Let's read. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. We were healed. We are already healed. And it's a blessing blocker when you don't realize that you've already been healed. Because you're dealing with the reality of I'm sick, but the word of God says we walk by faith and not by sight. And so we have to move in faith and declare and decree before the devils and demons that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died and rose again that I might have life and that I might have abundant life and I am the healed of the Lord. You got to declare that I am healed, that I am the healed of the Lord. Well, some of us say, well, you know, because... This sickness and disease has gotten the best of me that God can heal some things, but maybe he can't heal mine. Let's look at five categories in Jesus' day that Jesus dealt with and healed all these categories. And in these categories, there's sickness and disease in these five areas. Jesus dealt with five known diseases and sickness in his day, and he was able to heal them all. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 24. We're going to deal with, in Jesus' day, there was a sin or there was a sickness that was called Malachian. And it had to deal with the, the uh, losing of the ability to move. It, 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 was, it would cause individuals to be powerless. It, it made them... Uh, incapable of functioning, and it was called Malachian, and that's spelled M-A-L-A-K-I-A-N, Malachian. Jesus dealt with Malachian, and that has to do with the palsy, and Jesus, we're going to see how he healed. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 24, when you have it, say amen. Let's read. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And he healed them. So if we're having a sickness and disease or a problem in our body, we must believe by faith that our God is a healer, that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to his power that's ready to work on your behalf. But so often we never turn our face to God and say, God, I need you to do me a favor, God. I'm sick in my body. Uh, I need you to touch my body with the finger of 
love. I need you, God, to touch me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet and lay hands on yourself and say, I am the healed of the Lord. If God can heal Malachi and uh, he can heal my sickness right now. In the name of Jesus, I declare that I'm healed and I'm whole and I'm the healed of the Lord. Can somebody help me preach this morning? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 16 through 7, we see Caicos disease, which has to do with, with demonic activity, or the spirit of oppression. You know how people have oppression and depression and how the spirits attack their bodies and their minds. And they, it reminds me of the guy that was in the grave who lived in the tomb, who uh, was cutting himself Constantly, he was cutting himself. He wanted to die, and he, he he was just miserable. He stayed in the graveyard. He lived there, and he stayed there naked and and unclothed, and uh, he just was all jacked up, toe up from the floor. <laughs> and he lived in the graveyard. And the scripture says, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran to Jesus, and Jesus healed him. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, let's look at the, let's look at the Caicos disease, which if you, for those who are taking notes, it's K-A-K-O-S, Caicos. It's evil spirits, it's seducing spirits, it's unclean spirits under demonic attack. Jesus was able to heal the folk because the word of God says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. Somebody ought to get excited today. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse, uh, excuse me, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 16 through 17. Let's read. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So here we see he's quoting Isaiah. He's quoting Isaiah who said that he heals all our sick, sickness and disease. We're seeing the quote, the quote from the Old Testament that Jesus Christ healed the man. And he's quoting the Old Testament scripture, which we read, that Jesus can heal those who are demonic, uh, attacked by demons and devils and demonic spirits, those who are tied up and being manipulated and controlled. And if it's you that's being controlled by oppression and depression and demonic activity that takes control over you, and sometimes your life is out of control, sometimes you can't function because of the spirits that attack your body, I'm here to declare to you today uh, that Jesus Christ is a healer. Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died on Calvary's cross and was resurrected with the blood of Calvary to take care of sickness and disease for your life, uh, that you can live as an overcomer, that you can live whole and complete. You don't have to be attacked by demons and devil. You can plead the blood of Jesus over your life, uh, that you can walk uh, upright before God. Uh, you can walk straight strong and mighty and courageous and bold, determined that you are king's kid, uh, that you're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who took your sin upon you, that you might be the healed of the Lord. Uh, and no demon and no devil is going to attack your body because the Holy Spirit surrounds you and you're protected about, against all demonic activity, all satanic attack. The blood of Jesus surrounds you. And when the Satan comes, the blood rises rises up to the occasion and drives demons and devils far away from you. That's what the blood does. It rushes to your defense. That's what the blood does, just like the human body. The blood of Jesus rushes to your defense. But if we don't understand the benefit of the blood, if we don't call the blood forth, if we don't say, blood of Jesus, come and surround my family and protect my family and protect my loved ones and protect me as well. So if Jesus was able to heal those who were oppressed in the demonic activity, certainly he can heal your little sickness. Your, 
your little, <coughs> your little cough. But it takes faith and believing. It takes the determination that you're going to declare that you are the healed of the Lord and tell the devil enough is enough. I'm not going to tolerate you putting sickness on me. I walk, listen to me, I walk in divine health. Tell the devil and declare before the heavens uh, that I walk in divine health, uh, that God surrounds me, he protects me. Uh, I'm his property. Uh, I belong to God, so no demon and no devil and no sickness can come my way uh, because of who I am and whose I am. Can somebody get excited this morning? So not only does God deal with the Malachians and the Caicos, but the Rostas folks. And you say, well, Rostas folks. <laughs> you know, you got some Rostas folks. And those Rostic folks are those who are mentally or physically, uh, they're like comatose people. They walk around in a stupor. You know, they're not connected. They, how you doing? They're space cadets. They're not, they're not in touch with reality. They're, they're, out of, they're out of touch with life. And when you're talking to them, they space out all the time. They, those are called Tomacos people. Uh, they're, they're mentally connected to demonic activity. They're more focused on demons and devils and, and the unseen realm, and they're out of touch with the fact of reality. But Jesus came and healed those individuals. Go with me, if you would, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 14. Jesus was able to heal these type of individuals. So if he's able to heal all of these and show us proof and evidence, how dare we walk around constantly sick and not pleading the blood and not using our benefit package as was given to us? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, let's read verse 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. He, he saw these individuals, he was moved with compassion because they were not connected to life. They were just wandering around. They were not connected to what was happening. They were just clueless on life. And Jesus saw that, and he saw, and he was moved with compassion because of their problems in life. And so often, we can have problems in life. We can have situations and difficulties in life. And those situations and problems take charge over our life. They take control of our life. And they begin to dominate our life. And we begin to live in oppression and depression and feeling sorry for ourselves. For poor me, this shouldn't have happened to me. I don't deserve this. I'm, I've been good. I'm a good boy. I'm a good girl. I'm a good man. I'm a good wife. I'm a good. This shouldn't happen to me. But we forget our benefit package. Problems are part of God's plan to design us and to make us and to let us know who we are so that we stand strong and courageous. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God promised to lift a standard against him. But we have to cry out to our maker. We have to cry out to God. We have to get in touch with him. We have to call on his name. Call on the Lord and he will answer thee. We gotta learn the power of picking up the phone and dialing 1-800-HEAVEN and saying, God, I need you. I'm going through a difficult time in my life. Uh, I'm being attacked by demonic activity. I'm being attacked by Satan. I'm being attacked by situations and problems. That's the time not to run from the problem, but that's the time to run to the problem with the blood of Jesus and release the blood uh, that goes on your behalf. Uh, 
to release the blood uh, to go and fight for you, to reach the blood to go and drive demons. Uh, they run from the blood of Jesus. Uh, when you cry out the blood of Jesus, demons take flight. Uh, they get to stepping. Uh, they get to running. Uh, they take flight. The moment you call on the blood of Jesus, uh, demons got to run. Uh, they can't stay around the blood. Uh, they can't stand the blood. Uh, they don't like the blood. Uh, they want nothing to do with the blood. Uh, that's why you've got to have the blood running and have a blood transfusion and have the blood of Jesus going through your veins uh, so demons and devils uh, will smell the blood of Jesus on you and it'll keep them away from you for the glory of God. Me and my wife in our house, we have these, uh, my wife, swear by them at first I was, see how that's going to work plug a device in and it's going to run all kind of spiders and everything uh, plug it in the wall and it makes sure that you don't have any roaches or anything like that I'm like like I ain't buying that plus it was too much money and then she had the nerve to tell me you got to buy one for each room but how many know a happy wife is a happy life? So guess what? I bought them. <laughs> and to my amazement, we've been living in our place for six years. And I have never seen a bug in our house because of those bug protection. I'm here to tell you the blood of Jesus is a protector for your life. When you plead the blood of Jesus, demons and devils cannot come around. They cannot hang around. They cannot attack your body. But it causes you, when we don't believe and we don't walk in faith, then we give access to demons and devils. Then we give an open door to them. We open the door and crack. And how many know if you crack the door on demons and devils, they're going to rush right through. That's why they tell you, be careful who you open the door for. Because you might open the door. Brenda Campbell came to our house on last night to drop off some package. And uh, I'm not afraid of anything. I feel like people should be more afraid of me than I am them, right? I guess that's a little pride in me. Or, or my background one. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, she, she knocked on the door. And I just opened the door. And she came I said, come on in. And I thought about it. I said, you know, you just opened. That could have been a robber. That could have been a home invasion person. But if it was, he would have wished to God he didn't come into, free, come into my house. Amen. But anyway, 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 the blood of Jesus is designed to protect you. That's what the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Fear, fear has torment. You cannot be afraid. You can't, you can't. See, listen. Listen to me. Fear is the opposite of faith. And if you fear, people will, 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 will just pounce all over you if you fear. All of us know that, that when we were in school, we seen the bully that bullied everybody and, uh, you know, he constantly bullied and bullied and bullied. And then we have seen those that rose up to the occasion and said enough is enough and punched that bully eyes out. And then the next thing you know, that bully became a wimp because he met his match. That's how you have to do Satan. You got to let him know he met, you, met his match. Amen. When he met you, he met Jesus again. Amen. Somebody ought to help me preach this morning. So not only are we dealing with the Rostis folks, those who are in comatose, who uh, goes into a, a stupor, but Jesus healed those who were terminally ill. And, and that, that's gnosis. That's N-O-N-O-N-O-S, gnosis. Uh, those are those, uh, you got a fatal disease, cancer. You know, because you hear the word cancer, people put you in the grave. 
man, the moment they, Mike got cancer, uh, cancer, Joe got cancer, Sally got cancer. Man, once you hear that, oh man, they, they dead, they dead, they dead, you hear me? Well, the first thing coming out, coming out of mind, oh, they gonna die. Well, all of us gonna die one day or the other, if you didn't know it. <laughs> so, but the fact is, Whose report are you going to believe? We're going to believe, and I choose to believe the report of the Lord, and that is our God, our, our Savior, is a healer. So let's go, if we would, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, and we want to look at the terminally ill individuals that Jesus was able to heal. And my point is, in this message, if Jesus, in these five categories, that all of the different uh, sicknesses and diseases are come out of these different five areas. And I believe it's 39 stripes that Jesus took on his back. Those 39 stripes, there's according to medical profession. Now, y'all listen to this. Don't miss this. According to medical profession, that all diseases is connected to 39 stripes that Jesus took on his back. If you talk to any professional doctor, he'll tell you that there's in that category is 39 different types of diseases. So when Jesus took those stripes, those 39 stripes on his back, it activated the blood of Jesus to heal you and deliver you and keep you safe. Somebody should really shout glory to God. Glory. Mark's gospel chapter one, verse 32 through 34. Let's read. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of divers diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak. Told him, shut up. <laughs> because they knew him. Did you hear, did you hear what he just said? They knew Jesus. Do they know you? Does demons and devils know you? They should know you by the blood of Jesus that's in your life. The blood, once you, listen, once you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a candidate for all the benefit package. Amen. Oh, my. Let me say that again. I think y'all missed that. When you accept Christ into your life, you are now have access to all benefits as a believer. So sickness and disease cannot live in your body. Sickness and disease cannot dominate. You have to begin to use your benefit package. All right, I'm wrapping it up, y'all. So not only the, the terminally ill people, uh, the uncurable diseases that according to man is uncurable, but with Jesus, it can be cured. Amen. The last area is mastigos. And mastigos is M-A-S-T-I-G-O-S. It's a debilitating drug, or excuse me, abilitating uh, sickness, it is. Uh, it, it works at the bones and it eats away and it gets worse rather than better. It's, it's like a leprosy disease that, that eat away at the bones, anything that gets worse. It's like the woman with the issue of blood. The woman with the issue of blood, the scripture says she got worse rather than better. She had paid all of her money to the doctors and, 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 and physicians, spent all of her money, and uh, was still getting worse. That's a master goss. Jesus can heal Mastigos, folks. Reminds me, I got to sing my song now. There was a woman in the Bible days who had been sick for so very long. The doctors, they done all they could and medicine could do the woman no good. She spent her money here and there till she had no more to spare. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, 
I know I'll be made whole. She cried. Okay, yeah, yeah, I forget it. Okay, I, okay, thank you very much. May the Lord bless y'all. <laughs> Choir rehearsal is just coming uh, Wednesday, okay? But the woman got worse. So, so the, my point is that when you see a sickness getting worse, that's a master God's sickness. And Jesus healed those type of sicknesses. So as we prepare our hearts for communion, I want to begin to close by Mark Gospel chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Mark's Gospel, when you have it, say amen. Mark's Gospel chapter 3, we see where Jesus ordained the disciples and released them and sent them out and gave them power and authority. And I'm here to tell you today, when you have accepted Christ and you're in covenant with relationship with him, you have the same power as the disciples able to go lay hands on the sick and pray for the sick that they'll recover. Let's read Mark's gospel. And he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Do you see that? that he gave them authority and he gave them power and he sent them forth. As a matter of fact, in one gospel, it says when he sent them out, they came back amazed and they said this, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Even demons tremble, tremble through us. They were shocked, they were amazed. And Jesus said, hey, it ain't no big deal. I saw Satan fall as an angel of light from heaven, he told them. He said, you don't rejoice that demons are running from, just rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that now you have access to the power. And when your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, uh, it gives you power and it gives you authority over demons and devils and demonic activity and all the fiery darts of the wicked. You are an overcomer when your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to know today, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Uh, does Jesus Christ know your name? Uh, are you in covenant relationship with him? Do you know him? Uh, and is the blood of Jesus covering and protecting you? Yes, amen. Mark's, gospel, Mark's gospel chapter 6, verse 5 through 7, as I begin to close. Mark's gospel chapter 6, when you have it, say amen. Let's start at verse 5 and read through 7. And he could do there no mighty work. What? And he could do there no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. And he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Listen to me. He could not do many miracles in healing. Why? Because of their unbelief. Your unbelief will cripple you. It is a blessing blocker. Unbelief hinders you from moving into your greatness and becoming extraordinary. Because if you doubt, you out. You cannot afford to doubt. You have to believe and stand on the word of God. You have to begin to open up your mouth and command and demand in the name of Jesus and make your declaration before the world as you rise up in the morning and tell the known world that I am the healed of the Lord. Uh, I walk in divine health. Uh, I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My benefit package, I'm taking advantage of all of my benefits. I'm going to walk as an overcomer. I'm going to walk strong. Uh, I'm going to walk victorious. Uh, I'm going to walk mighty and courageous because my God 
God uh, went down to hell uh, and stripped the devil of all of his power and all of his authority. Uh, my God, who those Roman soldiers nailed to the cross, uh, who those Roman soldiers began to abuse him as they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. Uh, I'm here to tell you today uh, that, that when they killed our Lord, uh, they thought that they had won. Demons was having a party. Demons was celebrating. Uh, demons was saying, wow, we killed the Messiah. We killed the one called Jesus. Uh, we are uh, conquered over him. Uh, he talked about all oh, how powerful he is. Look at him now. He's up on that cross. Uh, and one, uh, one soldier, Roman soldier, had the nerve to say, uh, hey, if you are who you say you are, come on down off of that cross, uh, and then we will believe in you. But the body of Christ doesn't believe in him because he came down. Uh, we believe in him because he stayed up. Uh, because he stayed up and said, no man take my life. Uh, no man destroys me. Uh, I give my life up. And he gave up his life for you. Uh, he gave up his life for your benefit package. Uh, he gave up his life to destroy principalities and demons and sickness and disease. He gave up his life uh, so that you could live the abundant life. Uh, he gave up his life uh, so you could be an overcomer. He gave up his life so you can walk powerfully, that you can live life intentional, that you can move into your greatness and become an extraordinary, powerful human being. He gave up his life and died and was in the grave and buried for three days. But the grave couldn't hold him down. The scripture declares, and three days, on Easter Sunday, <laughs> he got up, uh, he got up, uh, he got up uh, with all power and all authority and conquered sin and death uh, and destroyed principalities and made him embarrass him openly for the glory of God. Today's a special day. And that day is, this is Resurrection Sunday we can prove to Satan that our God reigns. We can prove to God, we can prove to, to the world that our God conquered over sickness and disease. Because listen to me, Jesus rose from the grave to come back to see if you're gonna use your benefit package. Jesus came back alive to see if you were going to believe and take advantage of your benefit package. To take advantage of the fact that the benefit package is provided for you to live the abundant life. To live strong, to live courageous, to live bold, to live as an overcomer, to live mighty. Do you know your benefit package today? As I close the benefit package has been given to you to show the devil that he's defeated when you use your benefit package you smack the devil upside the head when you use your benefit package you defeat demonic activity when you move in faith and declare before the world I am not going to have a blessing blocker of sickness in my life. My God died so that I might be healed. And by his stripes, I am healed. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air, go to fwccharlotte.com and click on give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you.
blessing blockers because uh, I think it's being effective and I think it's ministering to you. How many are getting blessed by the ministry of blessing blockers series? Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm going to continue my blessing blocking blockers series and, until the Lord uh, switches me up here. But I want to deal with a blessing blocker today that I believe will help empower us and excel us in our spiritual growth and in our spiritual maturity. Uh, in this season of growth, it's very important that we understand the scripture and we live according to the word of God because that's where your growth will come from. It's obedience to God's word, when you're obedient to his word. So I'm going to read one scripture, uh, and then I'm going to have my lovely wife uh, read as well. But I want to look at a story of an incredible, awesome, extraordinary, amazing uh, man that lived a life of integrity. His life was full of integrity, and he was on such an awesome example to our lives. If anyone understands that all things work together for the good, he did. He understood that all things work together for those who are the called of the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. If we really believe that, we wouldn't allow the enemy to discourage us and get us all out of whack and get our emotions all messed up and get jacked up, toe up from the flow up, frustrated, uh, busted, disgusted, and can't be trusted if we really believe that all things work together for good. So I think this was a good point of reference for us to get present to the fact of understanding that all things work together for the good to those who are called according to his purpose. In other words, simply this, God is working his divine plan, whether you like it or not. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. So as I continue my series on blessing blockers, the scripture says, just a foundation for uh, this message, the scripture is clear that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Our blessings are already been released. Every blessing that you're going to get has already been, been released into the atmosphere. It is, it is in the atmosphere. It has been released in the heavenlies. The scripture is clear there. But it says our battle, our struggle is against demons and devils and demonic activity in heavenly places. So right where we're blessed in heavenly places, we're also fighting demons and devils in heavenly places that stop us and hinder us from receiving what God has already blessed us with. And so what happens is the blessing blockers that we allow to hinder us from getting heaven down on earth. Because the scripture says that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So our job is to get heaven down on earth. When you look at your life and play the DVD, you should see your life prosperous. You should see it blessed because that's the plan of God for your life. God would above all that you prosper and be in good health as your soul prospers. But what happens is because of our carnality, because of our worldliness, because of our fallen nature, we are tricked and bamboozled by demons and devils that steal from us because they come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. So we have to keep Satan in his place under our feet. But there are things that activate him. There are things that make him come alive. You know, he can play dead. You ever seen those movies where uh, someone is killed and, and, and then they're laying there and then all of a sudden they come alive? Well, that's the way Satan will do at times. He will act like he's dead, but we'll do something or say something that will bring him to life, and it causes a blessing blocker in our life. So I want to deal with this blessing blocker of integrity. Integrity, uh, the lack of integrity in our life is a blessing blocker. Integrity is key for your success with God. 
Integrity is, is one of the foundational stones to build your life on, is integrity. And when we lack integrity and we don't honor our word and we're not honest with God, we're not honest with ourselves, we, we, we sabotage ourselves and we cause ourselves to, to live in defeat. And let me tell you something, the graveyard is full of folk who never fulfilled their God-given assignment, their purpose. They never reached their full potential. They never brought to the table what they were created for. They died early because they were hoodwinked, tricked by the enemy, made bad choices, made bad decisions, and did things that didn't bring out the greatness that's inside of them. Because inside of you is an awesome, extraordinary, powerful, amazing human being inside of you. But what we see a lot of times, what we visualize a lot of times, which is a lot of negativity, and then we digest that into our spirit, and it becomes part of who we are. And so we have to understand that scripture says, and I'm turn there if you would, I'm gonna read one scripture, and then uh, First Lady is gonna read uh, Joel, and we, uh, Job, and we're going to look at this incredible story of this young man with such integrity. But Proverbs chapter 18, turn there real quickly if you would. Proverbs chapter 18. You have it, say amen. Let's look at, let's look at verse 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat of the fruit thereof. Now, if you listen to people closely when, when they quote this scripture, most of them will quote, life and death is in the power of the tongue. But that's not actually how the scripture is quoted. It says, death and life is in the power of the tongue. And so often we eat a lot of negativity, a lot of things that are negative to our spiritual life. Because scientists have found is, is that not only does the brain have neurons that communicate, but now they found out that our spirit, our heart, not the blood pump, but our spirit has neurons. So they're in constant communication with each other. And that's how so many individuals get, get hip wink and bamboos and tricked because within them is this fight in this battle with the spirit and the mind. And when there's a conflict between the mind, guess who wins? The heart wins every time. So it's what you put in your fear, in your, in your spirit. So a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Not that blood pump, but where those neurons are communicating to your brain, and your brain is communicating. And when they get all out of whack, let me tell you something. You confuse the spirit realm. And when you confuse the spirit realm, the spirit realm don't know what to do for you. Because you're confusing it with you're not sure one of them is communicating one way, the mind, and the spirit is communicating another way, and they're both in communication, and you're confusing the, the spirit realm, and so it brings about a lack of integrity until you're fully persuaded in knowing the direction and the plan of God for your life, and you're strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and the decisions that you make, you stand with them, and it's not be wavering, but you're steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, you're committed, you're dedicated, you're faithful, and you know where you're going, you know where you're headed, and you're not wishy-washy and washy-wishy, and you're not a double-minded man, because the scripture declares that a double-minded man uh, is unstable in all of his ways. Uh, that's why we see so many uh, never fulfill their greatness, uh, never fulfill who they are, uh, because the enemy tricks them, uh, and they get confused in 
their mind. They get confused in their heart. I'm here to tell you today, when you stand on the principles of God, when you make God the foundation, when you make the word of God, uh, that which you are anchored uh, and that which you are standing on, uh, when you make your decisions according to the word of God, uh, you can't lose with the stuff we use. Somebody ought to say amen. So as we look at this message today, I want to deal with the fact of integrity. And integrity is learning how to honor your word. It's learning how that your life should show up and be in communication with yourself. And when you communicate with others, it's in one accord. Because one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000. There's power in agreement. And so when you come in agreement with the covenant of God, when you come in agreement and alignment with the Holy Spirit, when your life lines up and it's in alignment, you have power with God and you have power with man. When you stand in the integrity of God, uh, not wavering of who you are and confident of who you are, knowing that you're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ, knowing that you were created in the image of God, uh, that you favor God uh, and you speak your words with integrity, uh, your words have power in the heavens and you break through demonic activity, you break through demons and devils, and you call those things that be not as though they were, because you're talking faith talker. Uh, you refuse to talk negative. You refuse to be a doubter. Uh, you refuse to be a powder. Uh, you refuse to be a do it out uh, You stand on the word and you declare and decree what thus said the Lord God Almighty with confidence, uh, knowing that your God is with you and all of heaven is supporting you. You're not by yourself. Uh, all of heaven is backing you up. Uh, all of heaven is supporting you and you got to know uh, that hey, all of heaven is supporting you so you go after demons and devils and you declare to them and you let them know uh, who you are and whose you are. So let's look at this incredible story of this man named Job. Turn your Bibles there, a man of integrity. And I want us to look at his life and how he was able to maintain his integrity. Not only did he maintain his integrity, but he understood that all things work together for good to those who are the called of the Lord. So turn your Bibles to Job. And let's look at the story of this amazing young man that faced difficulties, trials, and tests, but held his integrity. Let me ask you this question this morning. When you face trials and tests, can you hold your integrity? When you're giving too much money at the bank, can you hold your integrity instead of saying, Ooh, look what the good Lord blessed me with. <laughs> or can you turn and say, excuse me, you've given me too much money. Or do we have a lot of broken promises and broken agreements and broken arrangements that we've made and saying we're going to do one thing and not do it? You have to honor your word in everything, not in just the big things. But in the little things, one of the things here at Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte, we built on, we're starting on time. If we don't start on time, time, some of the leadership have dropped the ball. And that's a lack of integrity. Because when we tell God we're going to meet with you at 11 o'clock or 11.15 or whatever time it is, that's the time that God's here waiting on us. Why keep God on hold? Why have him waiting on us? <laughs> well, well, after all, I have everybody else waiting on me, so I might as well have let God. He can wait on me, too. <laughs> no, no, no. We have to be people who honor our word, people of integrity. Integrity is key for your life, for workability. You will never be successful in life until you understand the importance of honoring your word. Because when there's broken promises, broken 
arrangements. You confuse the heavenlies, you confuse the spirit realm, and you confuse others. You confuse them. And then you wonder why things doesn't work. Because unknowingly, they're not going to work. And you're frustrated. Some of us are frustrated. We don't know what in the world is wrong. Why am I not where I need to be? Why am I not getting the blessings like Sister Suki and Brother Bobo? Why, why am I not getting the same thing as them? Why, why not? I suggest to you it's because of the integrity issue. Because God honors integrity. Your life will have workability with integrity. We'll see that with our, our brother Job. Okay, let's start at verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Stop right there. It is clear that he was a man of integrity. Now, there are those preachers who suggest that fear caused his trials because Job said, the thing that I feared has come upon me. That may be the case in, to some degree. But the real problem with his trials, or really what he faced, the real issue was because he was perfect, the scripture said. He avoided evil. The cause of his problem, of his trials, was that God wanted to prove to Satan that Job would serve him no matter what. God was counting on Job. Job was his man. Can God count on you? Can God depend on you? Because he knew he could depend on on Job because the scripture says Satan you moved against him without cause the scripture says which suggests to us that there was no cause for what he suffered and what he went through he was a perfect man but what the what the problem was that God wanted to show Satan I got a man who in, has integrity I got a man that if he loses everything he will still serve me just because his car is repossessed, he's still going to serve me. Just because he's evicted from his home, he's still going to serve me. Just because he just got fired from his job, he's still going to serve me. Some of us get mad at God and we turn our back on God and don't want to serve God. And we blame God for our lack of integrity and our loss. All things work together Hallelujah. for good yes. to those who love the Lord. Let's read. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 5,500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. So simply this, he was wealthy. He was a rich man. Okay, bottom line, he, he, he was a tycoon. <laughs> All right? He couldn't count his wealth. He had so much. Okay, let's read. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent the call for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent the and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. In other words, he was a priest of his home. He honored God. He worshiped, his, he worshiped the Lord. He took time to respect God. God was number one in his life. Question, is God number one in your life? God was number one. He put God first. Just in case his kids had sinned, he would go before God on their behalf because he wanted to honor God. He wanted to respect God. And if his kids made a mistake and sinned and messed up, he went on their behalf to get it right with God because he knew the importance 
of keeping his family in prayer. He knew the importance of protecting his family through the spirit realm. He knew the importance of praying and being a man of integrity and a man of God that prayed for his family. I want to suggest to you that it's very important as men is that we pray for our family. It's very important that we take time to get along with God and pray for our family and wish the best for them and ask God to have a hedge of protection around them as they go out into the dangerous high ways and the byways as they go out into this sick world that a hedge of the anointed one and his anointing would be upon them to protect them from all the fiery darts of this wicked world and all the satanics attack it's important because as men of God we have the greatest power ever known unto mankind and we have the anointing and we can speak and declare and put protection and we can send our ministering angels to be encamped around about them I want to encourage your men uh, don't just get up in the morning and not seek the face of God. Get up in the morning and acknowledge God for your family and also for your friends for the glory of God. Let's read. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So we understand that that's Satan's job is to go about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy the scripture said that Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he can intimidate. See, see who he can push around. He can scare and make afraid. Because, you know, he can't hurt you, but he can make you hurt yourself. <laughs> he can make you run into a, a brick wall. Or he can make you so afraid that you, that you run in one direction and actually run into something. Because he can put fear upon you. But the scripture says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us power, love, and a sound mind. So we got to understand that fear has torment. And the scripture says that the fear has torment. And if we have torment and we have fear, then we're not, the scripture says we're not made perfect in love. The key to conquering fear is to be made perfect in love. Because the scripture says he that fear is not made perfect in love. I'm here to declare to you today that God has made you perfect in his image. He has made you in his likeness. You look like God. You favor God. Uh, you have the co-created power with God. We just got to rise in the authority of the anointed one and his anointing and not let fear and frustration and all of our emotions get out of a wax so we don't we don't mess up the spirit realm so when we speak and declare to the to the world we have power in our word because death in life is in the power of the tongue but I'm here to declare to you today uh, begin to declare and speak those things that be not as though they were begin to tell the devil who you are and who you are begin to tell the devil that you're more than a conqueror begin to tell the devil I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me begin to tell the devil he can't stop you begin to tell the devil I'm determined to succeed begin to tell him uh, you're not gonna cause me to quit uh, you're not gonna cause me to give you begin to let the devil know uh, that you're going with God uh, and you're going all the way uh, and hell or high water uh, you're gonna stay with God uh, for God I live and for God I die uh, let the devil know your position and guess what honey guess what sir he He'll leave you and go mess with brother Bobo and sister Suki and leave you alone because you let him know uh, you can't touch this. Uh, this is God's property uh, and you're not having it. Uh, I am who I am in God uh, and I'm going to succeed whether you like it or not. Nah, 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 nah. That's how you have to treat the devil. Don't let him whip, push you around. He's a bully. And he'll push you around if you let him. Don't let him push you around. Let's read. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not made an hedge around him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side 
Thou has blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in, my, in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Oh, this is powerful. And there was a Hold day. on, hold on. This is powerful. God gave him permission to touch Job. A man of integrity. But it was to prove to Satan that Job was going to serve him no matter what. He wanted the devil to know that a free moral agent that had choices would choose him over Satan. God is believing that you will choose him over Satan. When there's put before you two open doors, the question is, are you going to pick door number one or door number two? And if door number one says God, then would you pick God or door number two, would you pick Satan? Reminds me of the story of when St. Peter was in heaven and a gentleman came up to heaven and so he met him at the pearly gates. He met him at the pearly gates and he says, come this way, follow me. And as the young man began to walk with him, he noticed on the door, he noticed some names of some people's friends and people that he had known on earth. And he saw their names on the door and he was like amazed. And he says to St. Peter, hey, what's the deal with the, the, the names on the door? He says, don't worry about it. St. Peter said, hey, don't keep bother yourself with that. Keep on walking. So he kept on walking and then he kept seeing these names. Then he got to one door and he saw his name on it. He said, wait a minute now, St. Peter. Okay, now wait a minute. It was all good before, but now I see one with my name on. You got to tell me what's going on. He said, do you really want to know? He said, oh, oh yeah, I really want to know. He said, do you really want to know? He said, yeah, I want to. He said, okay, you want to know? He says, let me open this door. And he opened the door. And he, as he opened the door, in this door was a bunch of packages. And these packages had his name on it. And these were packages, he told him, he said, listen, these are packages that were sent back from earth to heaven because you never claimed them. You were saved, but you didn't walk on Faith Street. And those are the packages that was returned to sin. We couldn't find you. We searched for you. We looked for you. But you wasn't living on Faith Street. You wasn't living like you with a man of integrity. Yes, you were saved. Yes, you loved the Lord. But all of these packages was returned to heaven because you didn't have the integrity to walk on Faith Street. So I'm here to tell you today, you don't want to get to heaven and there's a room of packages that's returned and blessings that was, had your name on it that was designed for you, but you didn't live a life of integrity and you lost out on your packages. Let's read. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's home. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said. Now you think when it gets hard, you think it's not going to get any worse? It gets worse. Have you ever been in a place in your life when things, all hell was breaking loose and you felt like it couldn't get any worse? And to your amazement, it got worse. Well, this is what we see with Job. When all hell is breaking loose, it's getting worse. Let's continue to read. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. 
While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servant with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's home. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now listen. Now look how bad this is for his life. Here is a man who's committed to God, dedicated to God, just like you. He was kept, committed, dedicated, faithful, and all hell broke loose in his life. What a lot of times we don't understand is that God is building integrity in us, that God is working his divine plan. When you're facing difficulties and trials and tests, God wants you to pass the test. Because here, let me tell you, that if you don't pass the test, you're going to have to take it again. So it's best to ace it the first time so you don't have to take it the second time. So you have to be careful on how you answer. <laughs> you have to take the time to answer properly to let God know that you understand that all things work together to those who love the Lord. That you understand that he is in control. Because when you don't answer correctly, you're saying to God that I don't trust you and that you're not in control of my life. But when you answer and say, God, so be it, I accept it. It's, if it's your plan, if it's your work, I submit myself to you. Because if we really believe and trust in the Lord, if we really look to him, trust in the Lord with all our heart and don't lean to our own understanding, if we really acknowledge him in all of our ways, when hell and high water, when problems come, when difficulties come, when tests come, we stand anchored on the word of God and we say, God, uh, I know that this is difficult, but God, you have your way in my life. And when you honor God, God will then honor you. Glory be to God. But you got to honor God. Amen. You can't say, oh, God, I'm getting mad at God. Because you're going to take that test again until you, t till you pass it. Amen. And, it and sometimes it, it, he may increase the you know, number of questions. <laughs> <coughs> And it might be a little harder next time. So ace the, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying to you, in life, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh endurance, the scripture says. Count it a joy. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Your attitude will determine your altitude. Your attitude towards what happens. Look at his attitude towards what has taken place. He didn't get bitter. He didn't get angry. He didn't blame folk. He didn't come against and cause a ruckus. He didn't go around complaining, murmuring, and pouting. He didn't do that at all. And I want to suggest to you today, when there is a problem, you stand strong in the power of God's might. You put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against every demon and every devil and every trial. You get dressed for success. You get dressed to impress and you get dressed better than the rest. And you stand firm and anchored and rooted and grounded in the things of God. And don't, don't give up. Take a licking, but keep on ticking for the glory of God. All right, I got to wrap this up. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Listen, all, go ahead. In all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Are you all in here? After all that happened to him, he didn't charge God foolishly at all. He didn't complain. He didn't murmur. You know, the so often we murmur and we complain when we face problems. And we start talking about how things, bad things are. And in reality, we then 
execute a plan for them to get worse. But he was smart enough to sanctify himself and get before God. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying when you're having trials, when you're having problems, when all hell is breaking loose in your life, I'm here to suggest to you and declare to you today, that's a time to sanctify yourself before God and say, God, I'm going to get into your presence and I'm not going to move till I made you happy. And in closing, I want to suggest to you today to be a, a person of integrity. I want to suggest to you to honor your word. If you say you're going to do something, Amen. by all means, do it. Amen. And if you don't do it, at least clean up the mess. At least call and say, I know I promised you that I was going to come by and loan you $50. But you know what? I lied to you. I ain't never had no chance of giving, loaning you a dime. Okay, no, 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 I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing. No, but the point I'm trying to say, be honest and just say, I, didn't, I couldn't do it. And I'm calling you to let you know I told you I would. Clean up your mess. Because if you don't, it'll start to stink. If you create a mess, and so often we have a lot of mess in our life, and it's starting to smell. So I'm saying to you today, let's develop integrity because the blessing blocker in our life is a lack of integrity because when we do not honor our word and have broken promises, broken agreements, broken arrangements, as long as it's an unresolved issue, listen to me, I'm closing, as long as as it's an unresolved issue and not resolved, you can never move forward with unresolved issues in the past. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air, go to fwccharlotte.com and click on Give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you. series on blessing blockers because I'm convinced that God has already blessed us with spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So we're already blessed. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're already blessed. You are already blessed. But also in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against demons and devils and demonic activity that's hindering you from receiving what God has already blessed you with. So right there in the heavenlies, because it says they're in heavenly places as well. So right there in the heavenlies, we're fighting demonic activity that's hindering us from receiving what God has already released to your life. Everything that has been blessed, all your blessings is already done in the heavenlies, in the spirit realm. It's a done deal. But our adversary, the devil, Satan, and demonic activities hinder you from receiving what God has already released and blessed you with. Amen. So we have what is called blessing blockers. 
that hinder us and work against us. And God has equipped us to fight demons and devils and demonic activity has given us the whole armor of God that we can stand against them, that we can cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we have to pull down the strongholds. And the scripture says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we got to get heaven down on earth. Somebody ought to say amen. And so in order to do that, you got to get rid of the blessing blockers. Uh, you got to get rid of those things that's blocking you and hindering you, that's stopping you and working against your spiritual life so you can receive what God has already released to you, so you can walk in your greatness, so you can walk and be extraordinary and powerful, walk in the anointing and flow in the anointing, live in the anointing, walk in the anointing and flow in the anointing of God, that your life can have workability. Then, I mean, you walk around living life powerfully, living life on tension, intentional, and living life on purpose. And so in order to do that, you got to get rid of the blessing blockers. So today, I want to talk to you about a blessing blocker today. And the blessing blocker I want to minister to you today that I, I believe hinders a lot of folk. And it is the refusal to let, let it go. The refusal to let it go. We refuse so often to let things go. We hold on to them. And the graveyard is full of folk who died in defeat, that held on to things, refused to let it go. I mean, died totally in defeat. They were hoodwinked, bamboozled, and tricked by the devil. And they got sidetracked, and they never moved into their greatness. They never accomplished and fulfilled their God-given assignment and their task that God had created them. And they robbed us because God brought them on the world, in this world to deliver to us substance and, and, and their abilities to the church. And they never, never entered into it because of the, the blessing blocker they refuse to let it go. So today I want to minister to you, don't refuse to let it go. Amen. Go with me if you would to the book of Exodus. When you have it, say amen. Exodus chapter 10. I'm going to read verse 1 through 3 and then Dr. R.J. Lightsey, my awesome associate pastor is going to read from there. But when you have it, say amen. Exodus chapter 10. Amen. Let's, let's start at verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servant, that I might show these, these may, my signs before him. And that thou mayest tell in the ear of thy son, and thy son's son, what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how I am the Lord. And Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, God of the Hebrews, how long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let me go that I, might, that I may serve me. Let, me, let me. let my people go that they may serve me. Father, I thank you for your word. And I ask for an anointing upon my life. Anoint me afresh and anew as I minister this blessing blocker to allow individuals to be free in the spirit to break through the demonic forces and that which is holding them and hindering them from moving into their greatness, that which they're holding on, that they refuse to let go. Today, God, Holy Spirit, reveal to them that blockage in their heart and in their life that's hindering them from receiving what you've blessed them with. I ask for the power of the anointed one and his anointing to come upon me and anoint the hearers to hear what the Spirit will say, knowing that it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, said the Lord. Saints of God, blessing blockers are dangerous to our life. And if we would allow the spirit of God to empower our lives, if we would allow ourselves to be humble before the Lord, and get filled with his presence and his anointing and his power and live life powerfully and hear the voice of God and 
Hearken unto the voice of God. That word hearken means to hear and do. Not just to be a hearer of the word, but to be a doer of the word as well. Amen. We see here in, this, in, this, in the word of God that warning comes before destruction. A warning comes before destruction. Go with me, if you would, to verse 2, chapter 10, verse 2 through 5. Let's read. Exodus 10, verses 2 through 5. And that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. So there is always a warning before destruction. God warns us first, but so often we never take heed to the warning signs. So often we get warning after warning after warning, but because we're so committed, so stubborn, so dedicated to doing our own thing and having it my way and doing what I want to do rather than flowing with God, that we refuse to obey the voice of God. And when we refuse to obey the voice of God, then sooner or later, destruction will come your way. But God will warn you first. The great thing about God, he is a God, a loving God, a caring God. And he will tolerate you. He will put up with you. He will send you signs. He will send you messengers to warn you of that issue in your life that you have a Attached itself to you, that it has befriended you, and it's your buddy, it's your ace boon coon, and you refuse to let it go. It could be anger, it could be fear, it could be frustration, but whatever that is, you refuse to let it go. You refuse to, to let it die, and the best way to get rid of things that are attached themselves to you, the best way to get rid of them is to starve them to death. When that flesh begin to cry out, uh, when that flesh begin to holler, when that flesh begin to demand, uh, when that flesh begins to say, help me, uh, when that flesh begins to say, do me, when that flesh says to you, I want you, I'm here to tell you today, the best way to handle it is to starve it to death, because once it's dead, hallelujah, you can celebrate and have his funeral and rejoice that it is dead and God can come alive. Can somebody say amen? amen. But so often we never really crucify the flesh. Paul said it like this, I am crucified with Christ. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul identified the fact that I'm crucified. I'm a dead man. I walk around dead in the flesh. And I'm here to tell you, saints of God, if you want to live life powerfully, you got to die to the flesh. You got to let it go. You got to send it forth and let it drop out. That unforgiveness, that resentment, and that hatred that you have, that within you uh, that has attached itself to you, that you, it lays dormant and at times it comes life. Uh, at times uh, it's resurrected. At times it comes forth and you know what it is, but it's deep down what's inside of you. But I'm here to declare to you today, today is the day to let it go and send it forth and let it drop for the glory of God. Amen. Don't be like those that's determined to hold on to the past. Let the past remain in the past. Crucify the flesh. Let the flesh die. Let your past die. Don't keep resurrecting it. If it's a struggle in your life, crucify it before it's too late because God will always warn. Just as he warned Pharaoh. He warned Pharaoh that, hey, if you don't let my people go, I'm going to send plagues. I'm going to send so much on you, you're going to wish to God that you had let my folk go. He says, uh, if, you don't, if you don't let them go, you will wish to God that you had. And I'm here to tell you today, uh, if we don't let it go and send it forth and let it drop, we'll wish to God that we had. It's time when we have an opportunity, when the Spirit of God is moving in a place like this. Uh, that's the time to get present to what's going on in your life, uh, to let God x-ray you and see if there's anything that's not like him. Uh, let God x-ray you and see if he finds anything that's not like him. Uh, and then once uh, God 
God uh, x-rays your heart uh, and shows you what is inside of you. That's the time to say, for, hey, God, uh, I'm surrendering it all to you. I'm sending it forth, and I'm letting it drop. I'm releasing it. I refuse to hold on to it. I'm going to let it go today, uh, and I want you to know today, uh, once you let go, uh, you'll be so free in the spirit. Uh, once you let go, uh, the power of the anointed one and his anointing will come upon your life, uh, and you'll be able to move in your greatness. You'll be able to soar high. You'll be able to move forward. You'll be able to launch into the deep. Uh, you'll be able to do great things. Uh, you'll be able to do exploits. Uh, you'll do great things for the kingdom of God once you let it go uh, and let God be God. Can somebody put those hands together and give God praise? But here's the deal. We're so stubborn. Just like Pharaoh was so stubborn. Go with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Let's read. Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. What? Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. I'm not doing it. I'm going to refuse. I'm stubborn, and I'm not going to do it. And so often when the Spirit of God speaks to us to do things in our life, to let it go, to send it forth, we still continue to hold on to it. We continue to hold on to it. Why do we hold on to it? It's because it has befriended you. It's because it's a security for you. It has befriended you, and you run around with it, and you need it. You need it for your own safety. You need it for your own security. It has become a part of your life. And so you need that. So you're going to hold on to it, and you're going to hold on to it, and you're determined to be stubborn and refuse to let it go. And so many people have died in defeat, never fulfilling their greatness, holding on to things that have trapped them, because things will trap you. The enemy has a trap. He comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And he wants to lure you into a trap. And once he gets you in that trap, then he, when he has you, and, it, and then he'll make it comfortable for you in that trap. And you'll start enjoying the trap. And you'll start living in the trap. And you'll think you got it made in the trap. And before you know it, uh, the trap will destroy you. And I'm here to encourage you today, get present to what God wants to release into your life and what you can release unto him. Because as you minister unto him, as you minister unto him, God will in turn minister to you. Then and then only are you capable to minister to others. But so often we try to minister to others and haven't ministered to God and God hasn't ministered to us. And then we're just a bunch of air, empty, trying to do good, trying to be effective. But once you minister unto the Lord, and once you allow God to purge you, cleanse you, and nothing's tying you up, you're loosed, and you're unstoppable, you're unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, determined to succeed, determined to fight off all the fiery darts of the wicked, determined to let Satan know in all of his hosts, uh, you can't do nothing against me because I'm a king's kid. I was born in the image and the likeness of God. I look like God. I favor God. And me and God got a thing going on, and you will not win over me. I'm not going to let you hold on to any, hold on to me in any kind of way. Uh, I refuse to be in bondage. I refuse to be tied up. I refuse to be gagged. I refuse to have you in control of my life. I refuse to be a puppet to you. I refuse for you to hold on to anything in my life. I'm letting go and let God. I'm going to soar high for kingdom living. I'm going to do great and mighty things for the kingdom of God. I'm called by God, anointed by God, equipped by God, and prepared by God. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 
Well, Pastor, you know, that's all sound all good, but I'm telling you what, this thing is tough fighting all them demons and devils. You ain't in my shoes, Pastor. If you was in my shoes, you know what I'm dealing with. I mean, I got a wife that gets on my nerves. The children get on my nerves. A boss just always on my back. Life is rough. My life is jacked up, toe up from the flow up. I'm just, just I, I just don't know what to do with myself. I'm here to tell you today, let it go, 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 let it go. Surrender unto the Lord uh, and let God move in your life. Uh, quit putting God in a box and let him operate as God. So often we put God in a box, uh, but if we would just let God be God, if we let him operate within us and humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and put our hands in the master's hand, put our life in the master's hand, uh, put our all and all into the master's hand and say, God, uh, for God I live and for God I die. I'm going to lay myself on the altar of God. Uh, I'm going to submit, submit myself as a chastened virgin unto the Lord. I'm going to commit myself unto the Lord. I'm going to put myself on the altar of God and say, God, uh, purge me, cleanse me, deliver me, and set me free. Clean me up uh, so I can be great for you. Clean me up so I can do great things. Clean me up because today I'm letting it go. I refuse to hold on to it. I'm sending it forth in Jesus name. Amen. But so often we're just headstrong, stubborn. I ain't moving. You can't make me. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want to do. It's my thing. I do what I want to do. It's my prerogative. <laughs> and we find ourselves tied up. We find ourselves jacked up, messed up, because we won't let it go. Yeah. It's not all that. You think it is. It has deceived you. And deception is bad because deception is you think one thing and in reality it's another. And see, it can make you deceive you to make you think you need it, that you can't live without it. Y'all know that man I'm talking about. Y'all know that woman I'm talking about that you can't let go, you know that that's not what God's perfect will for you. You know that woman, you know that man is not God's perfect will, but you're gonna hold on to him anyway. You're gonna hold on to her anyway, when knowing that it's a detriment to your spirituality. But we'll hold on it anyway. We won't send it forth, let it go. As Jackie O was singing this morning, let it go, let it go. I've never been a singer, but. Uh, <laughs> Let it go. Let it go today. I'm here to bring a message to you to let it go. Yes. Don't hold on to it. Because there's consequences in disobedience. Go with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 8, verse 1 through 2. Let's read. There's consequences for disobedience. Yes. Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go... What? If thou refuse, what? If thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all the borders with frogs. Wow. That's the consequences of disobedience. There is consequences in disobedience. So often we think we get away with it. Oh, the consequences will be okay. Oh, I'll weather through it. Oh, I'll get through it. Oh, it'll be all right. Oh, it's gonna... And then when you get over your head and you're drowning and you get to a place where God has to make you surrender, then and then only is it done. But why wait till the water is over your head? Why wait till you're in a difficult time of pain and destruction? Why wait when there's all hell is breaking loose in your life? Why wait when all the problems is just unfolded in your life? Why wait? Why won't we be proactive and just let things go and flow with God and, and, and let God flow with us? Not only will, is there consequences in disobedience, but Pharaoh refused to let the people go. He did not know the voice of God. So often we don't know God's voice. We're listening to the wrong voice because there's three voices. One's God's, one's Satan's, and one's yours. 
And so often we're listening to our voice thinking it's God's voice. You got to train your spirit to know God. You got to train your spirit to know the voice of God. Because so often you're going around, you hear folks talk, oh, here God said, God ain't said nothing. You know, what amazes me, for 400 years, God didn't talk to nobody. And then I come to Charlotte, he talking to everybody. <laughs> everybody hearing from God. And so, so <laughs> Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, let's read. Exodus, Exodus chapter 5, verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. He's, now, he's, bottom line, I'm not letting him go. I don't, listen, I don't care about the consequences. You don't threaten me. And sometimes we're threatened and we know the consequences, but we're just going to do our own thing. We're going to hold on to it. Hey, I'll tough it out. Pharaoh knew the consequences of holding on to God's people, but he didn't care. Because number one, he didn't know the voice of God. And when we don't know the voice of God, then we're not confident that God is going to venge unto us and, and move against us for what we've done. But once you know the voice of God, you'll be like Joseph. How can I do this thing against my God? Joseph said, how can I do it? I can't do it. And that's when you know God's voice. There's a time in life where we must understand who God is and know his voice. Amen. Know when he's talking to us and not already always listening to the voice in our head. Because this meaning-making machine that talks all the time that you can't shut it down is called a brain. It's constantly talking. It's constantly running. It's constantly saying things, suggested thoughts. But you have to know what voice that you need to turn your station to. Because these voices are going through your head. God's voice, Satan's voice, your voice. And you got to turn the station. You can't keep it on Satan's voice. You can't keep it on your voice. You got to turn to the station, J-E-S-U-S, -S, and tune in to the voice of God. And see, our Pharaoh would refuse to turn to the voice of God. He said, I don't even know the voice of God. I ain't going to listen to the voice of God even if I know it. I'm going to rebel. I'm stubborn. I'm strong. I'm bullheaded. And I'm going to do it my way. It's either my way or the highway. <laughs> and guess what? It was the highway. So we must understand hearing the voice of God. Train your spirit to hear God's voice. And how you do that is you spend time with him. Amen. When my wife talks, I, I know she can be talking way on the other side somewhere but I'm trained <laughs> to hear her voice. And we have to be trained to hear God's voice. And the only way you can do that is spend time with that person. I've been with my wife 33 years. I should be able to hear and know what her voice sounds like. Yeah. Amen. Well, when you spend time with God, you will know what his voice sounds like. Pastor Michael Davis, 45 years, he knows the voice of God. He knows what, how to hear the voice of God. And I want to encourage us today, understand how important it is to know the voice of God. Amen. Know clearly when God is speaking. Mm -hmm. And when he tells you to let it go, you let it go. Don't hold on to it. I don't care what it is. I don't care how, how attached you are to that thing. I don't care how much of a friend it has made you. I don't care how it makes you feel. You know, unforgiveness is a luxury you can't even afford. It costs too much, but it feels good to be even with them. Mm. They wrong me. Yeah. Zap them, God, like crispy critters. Get them, God. You know, we can have these attitudes towards people that have hurt us, but it's a luxury. It costs too much. It eats away at us unless we send it forth. And we got to understand how important it is to release things unto the Lord and let it go. X-ray yourself. Let God X-ray you and see. Now let's look at the consequences that our dear brother. Go with me if you would, Exodus chapter 7. 
I'm almost done, y'all. Thank you, son. Can somebody give me five minutes? Let me see. Can I, can I have five more minutes? Let me see. If I can have five minutes, let me see your hand. Hold it up. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 50. Whoa. I'm good to go. I'm good to go. <laughs> okay. Exodus chapter 7. You have it? Say amen. Let's look at verse 14 and 17 through 7. Let's look at the consequences. Now, the consequences of, of refusing to let it go. Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 through 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out unto the water. And thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come. And the rod which was turned to a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Okay, in this thou shalt know. Now, I had enough, enough. Enough is enough. There is a time when God says enough is enough. God has had enough. He done came to him several times and told him to let my people go. Now he's saying, no, I'm not going to let my people go. I'm not going to let your people go. And God had enough of it. God says enough is enough. Check it. Check this out. In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. All right. I'm going to give you water that's going to be blood. You're not going to have water. How many know you need water to live? He had enough. And when God has enough, when enough is enough and he's done, I'm telling you what, the consequences is severe. So I'm encouraging you today, saints of God, I'm encouraging to let it go. You know that thing that you hold it on to? You know that thing that's not like God? You know that thing that has you in bondage? You know that thing that is controlling you? You know that thing that the Spirit of God has spoken to you and told you to let it go? You know that thing and that place within yourself and who you are and the issues and the problems that you face as an individual, maybe the struggles and the difficulties that you have, maybe it's fear, frustration, and Anger, whatever it might be, you know what it is. I'm here to declare to you today, send it forth and let it go. Release it today, because uh, when God has enough and enough is enough, and he says, uh, I'm not going to tolerate it anymore, then you will be in trouble with God. So I'm encouraging you today, do not hold on to it. Let it go, send it forth, and let it drop so that the power of the anointing one can fill that space that is you are holding there that God wants to take and fill, and God wants to fill it up inside you. That void that you want to let go, God will fill that void with his anointing and it will empower you and impact your life. Uh, and then you can be like a disciple. You can go around uh, healing all of those who are sick. Uh, you can go around with the power of the anointed one and his anointing and you can do great things for the kingdom of God. Uh, why? Because now in that space of resentment, in that space of fear, in that space of unforgiveness, you have released that within. And now in that same space is the anointing and the power of God and dwelling within you. Uh, and now you are anointed and appointed. Uh, now you are so anointed and appointed by God. Uh, now you're able to do great and mighty things for the kingdom of God. Uh, no longer are you trapped. Uh, no longer are you bound. Uh, no longer are you tied up. Now uh, you are empowered. Now you can soar high. Now you can do great things. Now you are an overcomer. Why? Because you came over. Now you are victorious. Uh, now you you're not the victim. Uh, now you're the victor. Uh, now you're somebody. Uh, now you're a king's kid. Now you're more than a conqueror. Now you can do all things through Christ. Now you're an overcomer. Now you're a mighty. Uh, now you're awesome. Uh, now you're powerful. Uh, now you're courageous. Uh, now you're bold. Now you're mighty uh, for the glory of God. Send it forth. And let it drop. Send it forth. Don't hold on to it. 
I'm closing with this. Exodus chapter 9. As the music is playing softly. God will prove himself to you that he is God all by himself. Amen. God wants to prove to you that he's God. Will we let him be God? Exodus chapter 9, verse 11, 14. We're going to close with this scripture. Exodus chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. And the Egyptians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest knoweth that there is none like me in all the earth. Wow. There's none like me. God will establish himself in your life. God will make himself so known to let you know that I am not only God, but I am Lord. Amen. And Lord means owner. That's right. I bought you. Right. You've been bought with a price. Right. You're twice my property. Once, because I created you. And second, because I redeemed you. I bought you back with the precious blood of my son. And you're going to serve me, whether you like it or not. So I'm in, sent my messenger here today, Dr. Randall Hall Walker, to tell you to send it forth, let it drop, to let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air? Go to fwccharlotte.com and click on Give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Jose. I want to minister uh, briefly this morning on a blessing blocker. And I believe that this blessing blocker is going to help educate you and experience revelation. Uh, because the scripture says, without a vision, the people perish. Without revelation, without knowledge, and without growing and developing. So I want to minister the, on the book of Jose this morning. And I want to minister as a blessing blocker, the lack of knowledge. So turn with me to Jose chapter 4. When you have it, say amen. amen. And then Dr. R.J. Lighty is going to be reading for me uh, this morning. We'll start there with uh, chapter 1 and, and start the uh, story. But for now, let's go, if we would, to Jose. Jose chapter 4. When you have it, say amen. Let's look at verse six. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Be 
because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, and I will also forget thy children. Close your Bible. Thank you, Lord God, for your word, and I ask in the name of Jesus. Anoint me afresh and anew as I minister this blessing blocker of the lack of knowledge. I ask your blessings upon my life and bless the hearers to hear what the spirit will say, knowing that it's not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. Release an anointing in this house to break through demonic activity and demons and devils and the spirits that will hinder. And we put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We release an anointing in the house in Jesus name. Amen. This is an incredible story of a young prophet who was called by God to do some extraordinary and some amazing things. It's amazing how during this time, how God's people had rejected God. They had turned their back on God. They had taken the poor and made them slaves. They were very abusive to people. The kings were having prostitution in the temple and grabbing all of the beautiful women and making them out of prostitutes. And so God's people had just turned their back on him, on him and began to serve other gods. They began to serve the God of Baal and they began to serve all these different gods and they wanted to do it in conjunction with serving God, the true God, Jehovah and Yahweh. But God was not pleased with them. He was very upset with them because he loved his people. God loved them so much that he had their, their best interests at heart. He, was, he had reminded them of how they were in slavery and how the Pharaoh and how Pharaoh had them in bondage and how he brought them out of Egypt and to, was, took them to a place through the wilderness and provided for them, took good care of them, met their need and led them into the promised land flowing with milk and honey. And God blessed them with the abundance. And they begin to take that abundance and, and squander it and begin to use that to sacrifice uh, uh, unto idols and false gods and turn their back upon God. And God said, I'm married to them. I love them and I care for them. But they don't seem to get it. Their, the knowledge in there where they're thinking, they don't have the revelation revealed because knowledge is revelation. So the revelation wasn't revealed to them how much God loved them. They were clueless because of their own selfishness, because they're being egotistical, arrogant, and cocky. They could not experience who God was in his love. And so God wanted to reach them where they were at. So what he decides to do is he speaks to this prophet named Hosea. Yes. And he tells Hosea, he says, listen, I want you to go and rescue this prostitute. I want you to go and get her from the enemy I, because she is a, connected to a friend of mine. And the friend came to me and said, hey, I want you to help my daughter out. Uh, it's sad the way things are. Things that are in a mess. And, and I'm upset because they're making my daughter a prostitute. Would you help me? And in that dream, God showed him to go and begin to uh, reach out to her. And so he meets her and tells her, I'm going to take you away from here. We're going to get out of Dodge. Reminds me of a story when I was in Chicago. I was on the, uh, at a television station and I was a counselor there and a young lady called in. A Caucasian uh, lady said that her, her pimp had her hemmed up there in Chicago and that she was f afraid of him and she was scared for her life. Well, young and energetic young preacher, single at the time, ready to boldly go where no man had gone before, <laughs> very adventurous and everything so I got the phone call and I said where are you at and she said I'm, I'm, I'm uptown or downtown rather I'm downtown and I said well listen I know a place where you can meet me and I said I'll pick you up 
and I'll snatch you up out of there and get you out of Dodge. She said, you'll do that for me? I said, absolutely. I said, absolutely. Now here this prostitute calls and she's in bondage and she's in pain and she's crying and she's afraid of her pimp. And the courageous, bold man, the knight in shiny armor in me is rising up now. Hey, da 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 da. So I call, I, I, I tell her, I say, listen, meet me at 95th and State. And I'll, and, and I'll be there with the church van. And I'll pick you up. And so, and so I grabbed my girlfriend at the time. I said, honey, we got to go. I didn't say honey then. That, that, but I said, sweetie, or whatever I called her. I don't know what I called her. But anyway, because those are names are for my baby. My darling, darling baby. But anyway, I said, come on, go with me. So she, she gets in the van, and we drive down to 95th and State. And so I said, it would be easy to find her because it's all black area. Um, and so it's nothing but, but uh, 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 it's a black area. So she'll stick out like a sore thumb being a white girl. So I, I spot a white girl, okay? Now I'm the FBI in me and, the, and all of the, the uh, uh, tactic of, of, uh, of moving and, and manipulation and, and strategizing and everything is in play. So I, I, I get the van and I hit down on the van and uh, I tell the young lady, I'm, when I open the door, I'm going to snatch her in <laughs> and we're going to drive off. So, so we, we, I said, slow down. I remember telling her, slow down, slow down. So she slowed down and I yelled her name and she looked up and I grabbed her and threw her in the van and we took off and got out of Dodge. And I felt so proud of myself rescuing a prostitute. And so I called Detroit Teen Challenge. I said, listen, I just rescued a prostitute. I want to send her to you from Chicago. They said, by all means, send her. So I got her a ticket and, and uh, sent her to Detroit Teen Challenge in Detroit, Michigan from Chicago. And so uh, about a month later, I called to see how she was doing and she was doing great and I was so proud of my accomplishments. Yes. So about another month later, I called back to check on her. And to my amazement, the director got on the phone and he said to me, he said, Randy, that's what they called me back then. He said, Randy, we had to put her out. I said, well, he, she wouldn't cooperate here. And, and I was, I remember that just like it was yesterday. I was devastated. I was hurt. I was like, you could have done something. You, you all could have done something to save that lady. She's probably back on prostitution, uh, a prostitute and back out there on the streets. And I was really upset with them. I really was, but you know, I was young in the Lord. I understand a lot different today, but I was young in the faith, but real energetic. So I said, oh, well, moved on. So I went off back to Bible college at, in Ellendale, North Dakota. Went back to college and, and uh, it was uh, springtime again. And, and Spencer Jones, my pastor, wrote me a letter, said, I want you to come back to Chicago. You did such an awesome job as an intern. We want you back. So I said, great. And so I went back to Chicago. And I ran into the young lady, my girlfriend at the time, I ran into her mom. And she said, oh, I'm glad to see you. I said, yeah. She said, you remember that prostitute that you grabbed, uh, you and my daughter grabbed and snatched up and, and uh, sent her off to the Detroit Teen Challenge. I said, yeah, I got a letter from her. She's in Jimmy Swagger's Bible College. You talking about exciting. You talking about exciting to learn. I don't know where the young lady is today, but that was an experience that I, that I had as a young minister. So I can understand how this prophet saw this prostitute and had a burden for this prostitute. And God tells him not only to rescue her, but to marry her. Now, why would God say marry a prostitute? That always puzzled me the whole story until my study on, on, on it this week as I studied how, what God's purpose was, what he was up to and the difference that God was out to make when he orchestrated that whole thing, when in a dream, 
in a vision, he told him to marry this prostitute. And in the story, to my amazement, when they leave town, they leave and they head out of town and he builds a life for her and she has three beautiful kids. But the call of God is still on his life. The call of God and the passion of reaching the known world at that time to save them was still in his life. So he says to his wife, I got to leave and I'm going to head to Samaria and I'll be back. So he goes to Samaria and begin to share with the known world about destruction is coming, that God is upset with you all, that God is mad at you. He's angry and that you're going to perish for a lack of knowledge. You're going to perish because you've turned your back on God. You forgot about God. You're not worshiping God. You're not not being very active in the things of God. And, and he's now, God is upset with you and he's telling them how angry God is. They wouldn't listen. And to his amazement, he did everything he could to share with them that God was bringing doom and gloom if they didn't repent. Yeah. If they didn't turn from their wicked ways. If they didn't say they were sorry and change that he was going to have to destroy them. And they wouldn't listen. And so he returns home. And when he gets home, guess what? Guess what? what? Thank you for asking. <laughs> His wife is gone. She missed the old lifestyle. She sold her kids into slavery and, and took off. And he sold, sold her kids into slavery, took off and went off with a soldier back. And so that he's devastated. Of course, her husband, he's devastated because he loved her. He cared for her. He had provided, had three beautiful children, and now she wants to go backwards, and she wants to backslide, and she wants to go back to the worldly life. But he had a love for her. And God told him, say, listen, I want you to rescue her. I want you to go find her. So he sought to find her. And he found out where she was. She had become a slave. And, and, and his children had been sold. And he came at, to there and found her. And bought her back. Paid the money to, for her to be released because he loved her. And the whole purpose of the story is that God wanted to show that I'm married to my people. That regardless of them turning their back and committing infidelity and adultery and being unfaithful and not being committed, God is trying to show them and use our brother Jose to show them that I love them and I'm married to them. And regardless of their unfaithfulness, regardless of their infidelity, regardless of what they've done, I'm going to love them and I'm going to believe them for them to turn their lives around and to repent. But I'm going to punish them and show them that I'm the God who sits high and I'm in control, but I want them to know that I love them uh, and I, he used this awesome man to, as an example to show his love, to demonstrate his faithfulness, to demonstrate his commitment, to demonstrate his loyalty to demonstrate who he is for the people, he had a love for his people and I'm here to tell you today, uh, no matter what you do against God, no matter how you sin, uh, no matter how you turn your back, uh, no matter how you go to astray, uh, I want you to know uh, God is married to the backslide God loves you in spite of you may commit all kinds of sin you may commit infidelity you may go against God's plan you may hinder the work of God but no matter what you do God is still married to you God still loves you and he used this story to show his people an illustration uh, to be symbolic uh, of his love uh, for to take a prostitute uh, one who is pushed aside who's unfaithful uh, to love her regardless that was love in action to love a prostitute oh so God used him uh, in an awesome way to show the world uh, that I love you uh, no matter what you do uh, you can go out and do this and you can do that uh, you can turn your back on 
me. You can be unfaithful. You can be undedicated to me. But regardless of that, I'm married to you. I'm dedicated. I'm committed to you, whether you are to me or not. Wow. Jose experienced the love of God as God did. Just the way God experienced love for his people, he allowed Jose to experience. Let's read the story. Jose chapter 1, let's read. Yes. Hosea chapter 1, verse 1, starting at verse 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beery, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of Hornos. A what now? A, light, a wife of Hornos. All right. And children she hang out with a bunch of hoes. Isn't that amazing? For the land hath committed great boredom, departed from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Bithyam, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu and will cause to seize the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bound of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Loruh Hamath, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. So keep in mind, he's naming these kids, okay, after experiencing the fact of what was taking place at that particular time. In the known world was like, why would you name your child that? You should name him Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or something like that. But he named the kid, and they were very upset. Even his wife was upset that he would name the kids, but it was God's plan orchestrated yeah. to reveal what God was up to and the difference that God was out to make. Let's read. Amen. For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God. And will not save them by bow, or by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Now when she had weaned Meruhamah, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name Loani, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Now no matter what, God loves them. He was so upset with them because they had turned they're back, but regardless of that, he stayed committed to them, but he just wanted to teach them a lesson. He wanted them to learn from their mistake. And so often we never learn from our mistake. And we can learn not only from our mistake, but from the mistakes of others. When others make a mistake, that's a time to learn from their mistake. And our, peop our people, or we perish for the lack of knowledge. And the, really the reality of it is, and the lack of knowledge is the lack of revelation. The lack of what's revealed to us. Yes. So often we can get sidetracked, and so often we can begin to, to listen and go in the wrong direction. And God has his way through revelation to bring us back. But so often we turn a deaf ear to revelation, and we don't hear the voice of God, and we get so far in left field that it's almost impossible to get back and it takes an intervention of God to get us back where God wants us so I'm here to encourage you today as we continue our story that people perish for a lack of knowledge yes. knowledge is there to reveal to you to empower your life to push you up into your greatness to become extraordinary and be an awesome powerful human being but when we turn a deaf ear to knowledge 
and don't allow the revelation truth to speak to our spirit because revelation comes from you reaching out and allowing your spirit to catch it it's not Caught. It's caught. You catch it and it becomes a part of you. Just like this young man today in the service on last week. That revelation was caught. He caught that because he could regurgitate it just like that because it became part of him. Amen. He didn't have to say, I don't I can't remember, Pastor, what you said. Because it was embedded in him. Yeah. And revelation and knowledge should be embedded in us so that we can make the right choices, make the right decisions when we're faced with impossible situations. Yeah. Let's read. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head. And they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Say ye unto your brethren, Annie, and to your sister, Umaha, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother hath played the harlot, she hath conceived them, hath done shame me. For she said, I will go after my mothers, that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, and make a wall that she shall not find her path. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Okay, so understand that God is allowing this to happen. And God gives us free reign in our life. We are free moral agents. And we have the right to choose. And God wants to give everyone the right to make a well-informed decision. But in order to make a well-informed decision, you have to have knowledge. I'm closing with this. When I went with Erica Murdoch to, to, uh, to purchase a car, we sought all the knowledge on that vehicle. We did our research. Why? So we could make a well-informed decision. I'm here to tell you today, knowledge is powerful. It will help you to make a well-informed decision. But knowledge comes through revelation. And things have to be revealed to you. If I had got to the dealership and said, I forgot what all this was all about, then I wouldn't have been able to make a well-informed decision. My people, the word of God says, perish for a lack of knowledge because they don't count the cost. They don't count the cost before they make decisions. If you're making a decision, make sure you evaluate the decision because it's a blessing blocker when you make a decision and don't have all the facts. If you have half truth and you make a decision, it can cost you a lifetime of misery. Get the facts because God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I'm closing with this, that this story is so incredible that when he got her back, they lived happily ever after because she was so appreciative of the fact that she had failed, that she had messed up. And when she got back with her husband, they got the kids back and they lived a successful life. Because they learned from their mistakes. I'm here to tell you today, Learn from your mistake and learn from others' mistakes. And a lack of knowledge will be a blessing blocker in your life. It will hinder you from being blessed. This awesome prophet did not lack knowledge. He knew exactly what he was getting into because he obeyed the voice of God and married this prostitute. And as a result, a success story was created. I'm here to tell you, you can have a success story in your life if you don't lack the knowledge and you do your homework and get the resources and make a well-informed decision. 
Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air? Go to fwccharlotte.com and click on Give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you. I want to continue my series on blessing blockers in our lives because in this season I believe it's important that we get rid of the things that are hindering us, that stop us, that work against us. And our adversary, the devil, goes, of course, as a roaring lion, seeking whom he can destroy, seeing how he can hinder you, stop you. But you got to be more than a conqueror. Amen. Amen. You got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and have on the whole armor of God to stand against demons and devils. And we know that we are, have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, but that's in heaven. We got to get heaven down on earth because right where we're blessed in the heavenlies, so is demonic activity taking place, hindering us from receiving what God has already blessed us. As um, Ephesians chapter 6 says that our battle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against demons and devils. That's who we wrestle. That's who we fight against. And so today I want to uh, continue my series on blessing blocker, blockers in our life. And the one I want to deal with today is the lack of brokenness. I believe a lack of brokenness can hinder us because we can get arrogant, we can get cocky, we can be dogmatic, we can be so uh, in a way that, that it hinders God from moving in our life because we, we haven't surrendered totally to him and somehow we're not depending upon God we're depending upon our ability and so brokenness gets us to a place where we're dependent upon God so I believe today this will help uh, excel you into your greatness I believe this word will empower you so that you can humble yourself and in the presence of God can come into your heart and you can say yes to the Lord today Amen. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I want to read quickly Isaiah. I'm going to read Isaiah chapter. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. And just one scripture I'm going to read. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke off of thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Father, I thank you for your word and I ask in the name of Jesus for you to anoint me afresh and anew as I minister on the lack of brokenness. And Lord, I ask for an anointing to touch every heart that their soul will say yes that within them they'll say yes to your will and yes to your way in Jesus' name. And everybody said, We're going to look at a story today about Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet, a spokesman for God. That's what a prophet was. And I was blessed by Talk Back Sunday as I heard you all talking about the different gifts that's in the body of Christ. Well, one of the gifts in the Old Testament was to be a prophet. And a prophet was a spokesman for God. He was one that said, thus said the Lord. Yes. Now, I want you to understand something that he could not afford to say what thus said himself. 
If he said what thus said himself, and it didn't come to pass, that he was actually killed by the leadership because he was known as a false prophet. And so being a false prophet, then you would lose your life. So, you know, it's not like Isaiah was one that was ready to say, thus said the Lord. He didn't run around, always, thus said the Lord, thus said the Lord, thus said the Lord, unless he knew that God had spoken to him. But now I want you to understand how he came to a place of understanding who God is and what he does. One day he decides that he's going to go into the temple to worship. And while he's out seeking the Lord, because he realized that Israel and Judah had rejected living for God. They had turned their back on God. They wanted nothing to do with God anymore. They had served other gods. They had served Baal and they had served Molech and they had served different gods and they had turned their back on the true God, Jehovah. And Jehovah was very upset with them. That's why I'm, I'm amazed that God hasn't judged America like America uh, will be judged, I believe, because we have turned our back on God. God is not that important to us anymore. It's all about me, myself, and I. And as I've studied this this week, I was so amazed at how angry God was with at them because they had turned uh, their back on him. They had started worshiping other gods. And, and it wasn't important to serve God anymore. And so Isaiah goes to the temple to seek God. And while Isaiah is there seeking the Lord, he falls into a deep trance. He falls in a sleep or, or he began to relax. And while he was relaxing, to his amazement, the Lord of glory showed up. Amen. God showed up in that place, in that temple. And he got so convicted because of the presence of God. When the presence of God shows up, it is to x-ray us, to show us who we are. And that's a time to look within. And as Dr. Lightsey was saying earlier, that you can allow yourself to, to look inside of yourself and, and see what's inside and say, search me, Lord, and see if there's anything that's not like you. And at that moment when God x-rays our heart and when God begins to show us who he is, uh, that's a time to be broken before the Lord. That's a time to yield our Ourselves to his presence and to his anointing. That's the time to let every yoke and every shackle be broken off our life. When God x-rays us, uh, when the Shekinah glory falls like it did in Isaiah's life, uh, as the Shekinah glory shows up, it begins to reveal who we are before the Lord. Uh, we are standing naked before Almighty God, and God is showing us uh, ourselves. And as Isaiah went into the temple and God began to show us, Isaiah, who he was uh, and what he was all about. Uh, the conviction of the power of God fell on him uh, and he was changed and transformed because he had a hunger for God because God's got his attention. I'm here to tell you today, uh, when we're in our worship service, God's trying to get our attention. When we're in the presence of God, God is trying to get our attention. When we're in the presence of the anointed one, God is trying to get our attention. When we are standing before God, God is trying to teach us and show us and reveal to us uh, where his plan is, where he wants to take us, and where we need to go for the glory of God. So Isaiah is standing there before God, and in this vision, he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And the scripture says his train filled the temple, which now he had found favor with God. I'm here to tell you, when God shows up, that's your opportunity to find favor with him. Amen. He found favor with God uh, and God began to reveal to him who he was. And the conviction of God fell upon him. He said it like this. He said, I hang out with people that, that has unclean lips. They curse. They do this. Uh, they're not speaking those things that be not as though they were. They're not proclaiming the gospel. They're not praising you. They're not magnifying. I'm hanging out with a bunch of losers. I'm hanging out with a bunch of failures. And furthermore, I am one of them too. But he's 
knew right then when he confessed before God that he was a man of unclean lips. Uh, in the presence of God, uh, when you're broken before God and you confess before God, uh, God supernaturally uh, touches you and empowers your life and take your brokenness, uh, take that humility, uh, and he empowers your life. Uh, and he then moves in a special and an awesome anointing upon your life. And every yoke and every shackle and every chain that's holding you down, uh, anything that's working against you, anything that's causing you to live in defeat, uh, at that moment, the Spirit of God comes in in a supernatural way and moves mightily and breaks every stronghold in your life. So he says that I am a man of unclean lips and I hang out with people with unclean lips. And I'm hanging out with a bunch of people that don't love God. They turn their back on God. And so not immediately because of the presence of God showing up in his life, he immediately says, I'll volunteer. The Lord says, who shall go for us? Who shall I send? Who will proclaim this good news? Who will speak out on my behalf? Who would be my spokesman? Who would be my voice? And at that moment, because of the presence of God, because of the anointing that had touched his life, uh, he said, here I am, Lord. Uh, my soul says yes. Uh, my soul says yes. Uh, I say yes to your will. I say yes to your way. I say yes to your Lord. Uh, at that moment, Isaiah says, yes, Lord. And because he was honest before the Lord in his sinful state, because he was transparent, because he was real in who he was. Immediately, the angel recognized that we need now to honor this man. So the scripture says, and we're going to read it in just a moment, but the scripture says that the angel went over to the altar and got a coal and put it on Isaiah's lips and purified his lips. And now... He's clean before the Lord. Why? Because he was broken before God. Amen. Because he recognized his need to be broken. And now he's willing to receive his assignment. Now he's ready to go forth for God for the glory of God. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6 and let's read. Isaiah let's start at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Let's read. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain or two he covered his feet, and with twain or two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. All right. Did, did you hear that? Immediately, his sins were purged. Why? Because he went before God broken. Yes. It's something about going before God, yielded with humility, being broken before God, yielding yourself to the Lord, and God showed up. Let's read. Amen. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see indeed, 
but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Okay, now understand something now on his assignment. His assignment was to carry the good news that, Je that Jesus was coming as a deliverer. His assignment was to preach to them and tell them that God was going to send a deliverer to them. But he was also sent to tell them if they don't turn from their wicked ways, that God was going to punish them that God was going to deal with them. And so as he took the message to the people, the people begin to scorn him. They begin to laugh at him. They begin to ridicule him. They didn't want to repent. They didn't want to serve God. And the king was so wicked at the time that the king was a facing a battle and he listened to false prophets and he listened to prophets that told him false things. And one of the prophets had the nerve to tell him to sacrifice his son. He told him, said, listen, the Assyrian army is going to, they're going to capture you. The Syrian army is going to take, going to come over and, and just dominate and take control. And here the false prophet tells him, said, listen, you need to, king, here's what you do, king. You sacrifice your son if you really want the God of Molech to deliver you. And he had the nerve to sacrifice his own son, believing in the God of Molech. They had totally turned from Jehovah. They totally turned from serving the almighty God and begin to serve idols. And so when he's leaving there, Isaiah is leaving from the prayer time that he had. And he runs into the king and the Lord had revealed to Isaiah that he had sacrificed his son. And Isaiah rebuked him for doing that. And Isaiah told him just as plain, he says, God's going to remove you as king. Well, you know, he didn't want to hear that at all. But as a real prophet, he was a spokesman for God. And so he says, God is going to remove you. Soon you won't reign any longer because you have turned your back upon God. And I'm here to tell you today when well, God is not happy when we turn our back on him. God is not pleased with us when we're not worshiping him. Then we begin to worship other things. We begin to worship our cars, our homes and all of the material things. And we don't put God first. So needless to say that he made alliance with the enemy. Because the king of Syria promised him, said, listen, if you serve us, we'll bag you, man. If you serve us and pay tribute to us, what we'll do is we got your back. And sure enough, the Assyrian army was so strong and so, so dynamic that they helped him out. But the problem is it came with a cost. <laughs> King said, now nah, you're going to pay. We helped you out. Now nah, you're going to pay. We want our idol worshipers in every corner. We want you to set up Baal. We want Molech. We want all. You get rid of Jehovah. Don't even worship him. You're going to worship the God of Baal now. And plus, you're going to pay us mega bucks every year. We're counting on you. We bailed you out. Now yo, it cost them their freedom. Yeah. I'm here to tell you today, so often we will cause ourselves to lose our freedom just for making the wrong decisions. They made the wrong choice. The king made the wrong decision to come in alliance with this king. But the prophet came to him and told him, says, you're making a bad choice. God is not pleased with you. You don't sacrifice your son to the God of Molech. And now you're allowing them to come in and they're stealing our, our, our freedom. We got to pay this and we got to pay that. And God had enough of it and God had him wiped out. So then his son began to reign, Hezekiah, glory to God. Just because you grow up in an ungodly home doesn't mean you will be an ungodly person. <laughs> come on, somebody. He grew up, listen. King Hezekiah grew up in an ungodly home. He watched his dad, his dad sacrifice his family members to the God of Molech. 
He watched his dad worship idols. He watched his dad turn from God. He watched his dad backslide from God. He watched his whole, he watched the family decay because of, of his dad. But all of a sudden, because he was connected to Isaiah, the good prophet, he says, when he became king, he said, I need you to find that prophet, that man of God. Tell him what's going on uh, tell, so he can tell me what's going on. So his leadership went out to find, to find Isaiah, and they found him under a tree naked. <laughs> and before they had gone to look for him, they told the king, said, listen, I know you believe in that man, but the rumor is he running around town naked. <laughs> <laughs> the rumor is he running around there embarrassing and not and, and things. That's the rumor. So King Hezekiah says, well, it's got to be for a good reason. Because <laughs> we have confidence in this man of God. We have confidence in the anointing us upon his life. And so when they go to find him, they find him naked. <laughs> and they ask him, what's going on? He said, listen, this is a sign. Because I want, you, I want Egypt to know, and, and I want Egypt and... and um, Ethiopian, the Ethiopians to know that God is going to put them in bondage and cause them to run around naked. They're going to be in chains. They're going to be in ropes. And this is a sign to them. So he did have a good motive for what he was doing. So, so I'm sure he went and got dressed, I'm surmising, and went in to see the king. And the king says to Isaiah, says, uh, hey, listen, I need you to help me out. Tell me what's going on. He said, this is what you do, king. He said, you stop paying that money, that tribute to, the, uh, to, to um, Syria. Stop paying them a dime. Don't give them another quarter. Don't let them. And furthermore, here's what you do, king. I, you need to take every idol worship of Baal, Moloch, uh, all the different idols, you need to have them removed. King Hezekiah immediately put an order out as king, wanting to be a godly man, wanted to be, have a godly relationship. He immediately put out a decree and, and said, go now, leaders, go down and break every idol statue in the country. I want it removed. And he had it removed. Well, you think the Syrian king was upset. He ain't getting his mega bucks now. He ain't getting his money, no. Hey, it's like, where is my money? And he said, I'm, I'm surmising, I ain't giving you a dime. Get it in blood. <laughs> so that didn't go over well. So they launch an attack and say, we're going to destroy uh, Judah. We're going to wipe them out because they, they done quit paying us now. And uh, we were... We're paying for protection. We're their henchmen. Hey, we're their bodyguards, and we're we getting paid to protect them. And if they don't pay us, we'll just go ahead and take it all. So now, now they're going to take it all. So they head that way. And while they're, while they're on their way there, they run to King Hezekiah and tell uh, King Hezekiah, said, they're on their way to come get you. They're on their way to, to, to take our land that God has given to us. He said, why don't we just surrender? Everybody's saying surrender. He said, oh, no, we ain't surrendering to them. Oh, no, we're going to trust in our God. Amen. Where other kings trusted in, in their resources, he trusted in his God. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, you can't trust in your jobs. You can't trust in money. You can't trust in people. You got to trust in your God. Amen. So he was totally committed to trust in God. And so the story is that as he was trusting God, that they came to him and told him that the enemy is on their way. They're just right around the corner. And so because he was a praying man and because he believed the prophet, the prophet told him that you don't have to worry about anything. God's got you. 
And I'm here to tell you today, saints, when you hear a word from the Lord, from the man or the woman of God, you hold steadfast to that word. You become steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the work of God. When it is a man or a woman of God, you trust him. Now, you got to be cautious of the false prophets. You got to be cautious of those who come to you in their name. I'm coming in my name. <laughs> <laughs> they got to be coming and they got to be coming in the name of the Lord. And when they give you a word from God, you hold fast no matter what it looks like. And you let what you say be not what you see. Amen. Amen. You might be seeing he saw the enemy, but that's not what he said. No matter what you what you see, don't say what you see. Say what you saying. And you say the, the man of God said that I am going to come out of this thing a winner. And Hezekiah told him that he was going to come out a winner, that he was not going to lose in the battle, that God was for him. And he recognized if God before me, everybody else might as well be. Uh, he didn't waver. He was unshakable. He was unstoppable because he trusted in God. Do you trust in God today? Uh, do you believe that God is going to see you through? Do you believe that God's going to meet your need? Do you believe that God is going to strengthen you? Do you believe that God's going to cause you to rise? rise in power as an overcomer, as you're broken before him, as you yield to him, as you're broken before the Lord, uh, as you say, God, uh, for God, uh, I live and for God, I die. Uh, as you say before God, uh, I'm broken and I'm yielded to you. Uh, you are my source of strength. Uh, I'm relying and I'm depending upon you uh, and adversities and difficulties and trials and situations. I'm going to look to you from which my help come, uh, my help coming from the Lord, uh, no matter what what's happening in our life. Uh, hell or high water, I'm looking to God. Hell or high water, I'm depending upon God. Hell or high water, my eyes is fixed on God. Uh, I'm looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. For the joy that was set before him, he was able to endure. And he showed me, uh, my elder brother showed me uh, how to endure, uh, and I'm going to endure to the end. Uh, I might take a licking, uh, but glory to God, I'm going to keep ticking. Can some Somebody put those hands together and praise God. That's when you know who you are and whose you are. And you're totally sold out and you're broken before God. And you're not depending upon your ability and you're not arrogant. And you're not cocky and haughty. And thinking you all that and then some and some chips and then dip and all that and no lip. <laughs> <laughs> so the story is as the Assyrian army is launching an attack against Judah and the prophet the man of God told him don't worry be happy do, 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 do. <laughs> as the man of God shared with him that God was going to fight for you while they are on their way to wipe Hezekiah as king and the nation of Judah out because they had turned to God, because they're not serving idols, because they're not serving all of the demonic activity and statues. They're not serving that. They are serving the true God, Jehovah. And the prophet spoke on their behalf. Because of that, right while they were almost to the camp to wipe them out, one of the soldiers ran up to the leaders and said, hey, you got to return. You got to return to Syria. Why? The Babylonians has come and wiped, almost wiped all of our men out. We're losing the battle. You got to retreat. Come on, let's go. And they had to leave. They never attacked them at all. Why? Because God was for them. Because they honored God. Because they were faithful to God. I'm here to declare to you today, as you're faithful to God, as you're committed to God, as you're dedicated to God, as you're broken before God, God honors that. And God will see you through. And you listen to the man of God and the woman of God as they encourage you 
as they build you up. Uh, go forth in God. Go forth mighty. Go forth courageous. And know that God will go before you and fight your battle. Uh, and don't look at the circumstances. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the God who sits high and look low. Can you give God praise? Let's finish reading. Verse 11. Verse 11. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord hath removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and it shall be eaten, as a teal tree, as an oak, whose substance is in them. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Stop right there. So now we see where the, the man of God spoke destruction upon them, and destruction happened. But the flip side of that is this. Let's read chapter 7, verse 14. Let's read. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. All right. So now in the midst of all of hell breaking loose, he, the encouraging words was, uh, you just hold on to God's unchanging hand. Uh, you just hold on to God. Uh, God is going to see you through. He's going to send you a deliverer, and his name is going to be Emmanuel, uh, which means God with us. Uh, if you don't give up and quit, uh, if you hold steadfast and be strong, uh, the deliverer of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to deliver you and set you free. Uh, God is coming to empower your life. Uh, God is coming to deliver you. God is coming to set you free and write you your name you're in the Lamb's book of life. Just don't give up and don't quit because the God who delivers Jesus Christ is coming through the Virgin Mary, coming to this earth to die for your sins, that your sins will be forgiven and there'll be a clean slate and God will give you a new beginning and set you on a path of righteousness, set you on a path have a, a journey to your greatness, uh, pushing you all the way, uh, encouraging you all the way, uh, taking you all the way, uh, standing with you all the way. Uh, Jesus is coming. Uh, hell might be breaking loose now. Uh, there may be some difficult times, uh, but if you hold on uh, and don't quit, uh, don't throw in the towel, uh, don't give up, uh, don't be wavering, uh, but be strong in the Lord uh, and the power of his might. Uh, God is going to see you through. What an encouraging words that there will be a man that will come and encourage you. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Let's read. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Oh, come on, thanks of God. Listen. Isaiah prophesied more about the coming of Christ than any prophet in the Old Testament. He prophesied that God was going to come as a deliverer to his people. And I want you to know years later uh, that Jesus Christ uh, came to this earth through the Virgin Mary. Uh, I want you to know that Jesus Christ was born. Uh, and I want you to know he came for the sins of the people. I want you to know he gave up his life uh, just like Isaiah was willing to die uh, Oh, Isaiah was willing to declare uh, and uh, Isaiah was willing uh, to go forth and volunteer himself. Uh, Jesus Christ volunteered himself as well. He said, I'll be the perfect sacrifice. I'll deliver them uh, so your sins will be forgiven. Uh, that God will give you a clean slate. Uh, that you'll have a new beginning. And those who have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, your sins, uh, your past, your present, and your future sins are already forgiven. Uh, God now uh, 
You are brand new creation in Christ. Uh, the old is done away with and the new has come. Because why? One day uh, you were broken before God. One day uh, you were yielded before God. One day you submitted to God. And you said, God, uh, I submit to you. My soul says yes. Uh, my soul says yes. Uh, my soul says yes unto you. Uh, now come into my heart. Uh, forgive me of my sins. Uh, wash me clean. Uh, deliver me and set me free. And you remember that day uh, when you came to know Christ. Uh, you remember that day uh, when God forgave you. You remember that day that your sins were forgiven. You remember that new birth, that new experience. And you said, uh, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll do what you want me to do. I'm yours, God. I'm committed to you, God. I'm dedicated to you, God. And you are broken before God. You remember that? You remember that? Well, Isaiah was the forerunner in the sense of speaking and declaring the coming of Christ. He was a true prophet that spoke about the things of God. He stood up in the midst of difficult times when everybody had forsaken God, when everybody had turned their back on God. He got to a place where he was broken. He got to a place to experience the experience of the experience. And he experienced the experience. And he went out doing the work of God. In order to do that, we must be broken before God. I'm going to close with this. I'm reminded of a nursery rhyme as I grew up. Humpty Dumpty, fella, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horsemen and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. But I want to tell you today that Jesus Christ can put Humpty Dumpty back together. And when you're broken before him, he can put you back together. And when God puts you back together, you are glued with super glue. You are unstoppable, unmovable, and you can abound in the work of God. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and all the king's horsemen and all the king's men couldn't do nothing for Humpty Dumpty. But Jesus Christ can do something for us all. Jesus Christ, as he suffered, bled, and died and went down to hell and stripped the devil of all of his power and all of his authority, came up out of that grave uh, saying, all power, all power, all power, all power, all power, all power, all power. All power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And he gave you the keys. He gave you authority. He gave you power. And all you have to do is be yielded to him and be broken. Die to self. Crucify the flesh. The Apostle Paul said it like this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. He said, I am crucified with Christ. He identified with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Today in closing, I want to encourage us all to be broken before him. I want us all to allow God to break us, fall off the wall like Humpty Dumpty, and have a great fall. But let Jesus Christ put you back together. And when God puts you back together, you're put back together for your assignment for him. Isaiah had his assignment before God. As he went before the Lord, God gave him assignment. But he said to God, here I am, send me. Would you say, God, here I am, send me? Will you be broken before God today? Will you take that opportunity to say yes to the Lord? Will you take that uh, moment to identify with being broken before God? So often we're broken, but we never get put back together. Some of us live in fragmented lives today because we're broken. 
Oh my God, we're broken. And I can imagine as Isaiah was preaching to a nation who had turned their back on God, as I preach to so many today, that I understand that your life has become broken, fragmented. It's in, it comes out in your language. It comes out in your attitude. It comes out in your disposition because you are broken. You're hurt. People have wronged you. People have hurt you. People have disappointed you. But today, as you be broken before God, let God put you back together. As you yield yourself to him and say, God, I'm the potter. You're the clay. Hope, shape me, mold me, and make me. Today is your day to be broken before God and let God put you back together. Stand to your feet. Father, I... Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air, go to fwccharlotte.com and click on Give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you. Well, it's a real joy to continue my series on blessing blockers. Uh, some of you who are new today and our guests, we've been doing a series on blessing blockers because the word of God says in Ephesians chapter three, verse one, it says that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And then also in Ephesians chapter six, it says our battle, our struggle is against demons and devils and demonic activity in the heavenly places. So right where we've been blessed, there's demonic activity that's hindering us from receiving what God has already blessed us with. And the scripture says that it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So our job as saints is to get heaven down on earth. Amen. So our life looks like heaven. And so we have these blessing blockers that I minister each week to help you to remove the blockers off your life so that you can enter in and make a touchdown for the glory of God. You got that? So turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter uh, 12. Let's look at verse, I'll read chapter, uh, I'll read chapter 12, verse 14 and uh, 15. And then Dr. R.J. Lightsey, I'm going to ask him to read Genesis chapter 31, excuse me, Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. Hebrews chapter uh, 12 verse 14 says and 15 follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord verse 15 says looking diligent lest any man fall of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Father, I thank you for your word. And I ask in Jesus name for an anointing upon my life and also the congregation anoint the hearers to hear what the spirit will say, knowing that it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. Spirit of God, come in in a special way and anoint every ear to hear what the spirit will say. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. The blessing blocker I want to deal with today is jealousy. Jealousy is a blessing blocker and will hinder you from receiving what God has already blessed you with. 
And I want to look at an incredible story of an awesome young man by the name of Joseph. And it's amazing that Joseph, in the Word of God, that I find was so incredible, there was nothing ever recorded negative about him. I don't know if he did some negative things and they just, his good superseded and they never said anything bad. But the fact is, Joseph is squeaky clean. <laughs> Amen. I mean, we can look at all the others, David and Paul and, and um, Dalton Thomas and the rest of them, we can go on. But when it comes to Joseph, Joseph is a man who went down in history as squeaky clean. And so we want to look at the story. And the story is his dad was named Jacob. And they lived in Canaan. And living in Canaan, he had 12 sons. And 10 of them was by his first wife. And he married again Rachel. And Rachel gave him two lovely kids, which was Benjamin and, uh, and, and um, Joseph at his old age. Now he's old now. So he's excited about these two kids at his old age. So he favored them. And he favored Joseph so much that his brothers hated him. I mean, they were very jealous of him. They was envious of him. They were upset with him because the father favored him. And so the father, he's young and everything, and he wants to go out and be with the brothers. He want to go and and deal with the on the workforce and he didn't want to stay at home he was an energetic educated young man studied and was just a sharp individual so his brothers didn't like him they were jealous of him because you know he had it a little bit better than they did but dad was always looking out for him and as a matter of fact dad bought him a coat <laughs> dad bought him a coat of many colors that coat was sharp you hear me i mean it had all these uh, uh, many colors on it and i mean it glittered and i'm sure it shined and uh he was proud to do this for his son well his brothers wasn't too happy about it his brothers as a matter of fact they got so angry towards him they begin to conspire what what we gonna do with this rascal because dad favored him he got all this good stuff. Look at us. We out working and he back at the house chilling, taking it easy, you know, enjoying mom and dad while we out here working. So they, they envied the young man. They envied their own brother. And so Joseph wanted to get out in the workplace. So he says, Dad, you know, I want to get out there with the brother and I want to be with the family. And so he says, oh, well, when you get old enough, we'll get you out there. So as time went on, he felt like he was, it was old enough to go out with his brothers. So he said, in the morning, I'm going to let you go out. And so I'm sure he went to sleep, Joseph dreaming. Oh, man, this is going to be nice. I'm going to be with my brother. And he was dreaming so long, he overslept. <laughs> and so he wakes up and realizes they're gone. Of course, they left him on purpose. You know, they didn't want him to go nowhere. So, so he runs in, and to his amazement, he was such a sharp young man that he was able to find them. And when they saw him coming, they said, there's that dreamer. Because he had dreamed and told them about a story. And he told them, that, hey, one day I was working with you guys. And, um, or rather, I was working uh, in the field and I saw... Uh, as I was working, I saw this wheat and uh, you had bundles and I had bundles, but my bundle in the dream just stood up and and they said, well, what are you trying to say is that we're going to bow down to you. So not only did they did not like him for his coat, but now he's talking about the dream that he had and the dream is referring to the fact that he sees them sub subordinate to him. He sees them less than, and they don't like that at all. I mean, they hot to trot. They said, now, wait a minute. Now, the coat deal was one thing, but now you're going to dream a dream, and, and then you're going to get to me. I'm sure they would say, you're arrogant about it. You think you better than, so we're going to do something. So as, they, as he's approaching, they said, what are we going to do? We got to get rid of him. So what they decided to do was throw him in a pit, in a well. So they threw him in the well, and so they, they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. Because one of the brothers said, no, we can't kill him. That's our own brother. Well, I said, let's do it, man. No. <laughs> they said, no, we, we, we can't kill him. 
So one of the sons said, I'm going to help him escape. I, when I get an opportunity, I'm going to get him out of that well. I'm not going to let this go down. But to his amazement, he couldn't get the chance, the opportunity to release him from the well. And so all of a sudden, here these merchants coming down the road who are slave traders, and they come up with an idea. Let's sell the rascal. <laughs> and so they get with the, the merchants, and they sell him. They sell him for 20 pieces of silver. They sell it their own brother because of jealousy. I'm here to tell you, jealousy will have you to do some things that's unbelievable. There are those who have committed murder. There's those who have stolen, those who have taken advantage of others, being jealous of somebody else and envy of what, envious of what they have. Because they forget about what God has blessed them with and they're looking up at what they don't have rather than what they do have. And if we would be a people that would be appreciative of God, what God has blessed us with and be grateful in our hearts for what God has prospered us with. If we would be appreciative to say, thank you, Lord, for your blessings, what you have done. And what's for me is for me. Somebody ought to praise the Lord. What's for me is for me. And, and we know that God has your favor or God has favored you just like he did anyone else. The favor of God is on your life and you have to believe that. You have to believe that you favor God. You are in his image and you are in his likeness. That you favor God. And you got to know that God has your best interest at heart. You got to know that God is for you. You got to know if God be for you, everybody else might as well be. You got to know if God is for you, who in the world can be against you? You got to be confident in yourself. You got to be have the self-esteem, the self-worth, the self-confidence that you're God is for you and you can't look at others and begin to envy them and be jealous of them it's a blessing blocker it will hinder you it will stop you from prospering it'll stop you from from moving into the blessings of God it will hinder you and work against you so we're going to look at the story in just a moment but as the story is continues that he sold to Egypt and he goes travels to Egypt and um, somehow he gets in prison there and he's in prison now he went from the pit to prison now he's in the prison he's in the prison now but because of the favor that was on his life because of who he was as he rose to the top in anything he did you should be just like that. We should be like that. We should rise to the top in anything we do. He is now in prison, but he found favor even in prison. And there were a couple guys. One was a butler and the other one was a baker. And they had a dream as well. And so nobody could interpret their dream. They, could, they was wanting somebody to interpret it and nobody could interpret it. And so uh, he volunteered. He said, hey, I can interpret the dream. He says, Tell me the dream. And the um, butler shared his dream. And then also the baker shared his. And the butler shares his and well, his interpretation of, of it was, hey, you're going to get out of prison in three days. My man was like, whoa, yes, that's awesome. I'm getting out of this joint. Uh, uh, freedom, freedom. So he's excited and ignited, enthused and infused, because now the dream is interpreted that he's going to get out of prison. Man, that was good news. That he's pardoning and he's going to be released. So he was excited. So he says to him, he says, listen, when you get out, don't forget me. Hey, when you get to Pharaoh and you release, remember me. Don't forget me. Help me get out of here. I helped you. Now you help me. But unfortunately, he forgot him. And so often we can forget individuals who have blessed us and who have helped us, who have supported us. And we, for some reason, forget that. And as a matter of fact, a brief story, I know a young lady that helped a, another young lady in just a phenomenal way. Helped her move, helped her with her children, helped her just financially, just loved on her for a period of time. 
And instead of that individual being appreciative and saying that no matter what, I'm going to remember what you did for me, they became upset and angry. And as a result of that, caused a big problem. And we can easily cause a problem when we forget what people have done for us. When we forget about the blessings of God, how God used that person in our life and in our ministry. And so often we can become envious and angry towards them and hurt that individual who meant us good. But then the other one says, interpret my dream. He says, great, not a problem. He said, now I'm not the one that interprets the dream. But God is the one that interpreted. Now keep in mind, he's a man of God full of faith and power. He's a man committed to, to the Lord. He's dedicated. He had the favor of God on his life. He had the blessings of God on his life. He had the prosperity of God on his life. That's who he was. And so he tells the other guy, he says, man, I got some good news for you. You are getting out of prison as well. <laughs> yes! He said, but it's a, no, a flip side to it. You're going to be hanged and lose everything. And so that wasn't too good of a news for, for him to learn that he is now not only going to get out, but he's going to lose everything and um, he's going to be hung. And so now the king of Pharaoh, or Pharaoh, I should say, is trying to get his dream interpreted and he called all listen to me he called all the wisest people around he calls them in reminds me of the smartest man in the world reminded of the smallest smartest man in the world the smartest man in the world was on a plane traveling going to uh, Hawaii and uh, on the plane, it was the priest, the pilot, the co-pilot, the wisest man in the world, and the priest. And so they're traveling, going on this journey, and all of a sudden, the plane de developed engine trouble. And so the plane began to go down, and the, the pilot says, listen, the plane's going down. And the problem is we only have four parachutes and it's five of us. He said, and I'm the pilot, so I got to take one. <laughs> so he grabs his and goes to safety. Uh. And so the co-pilot said, well, listen, I'm the co-pilot. I need, hey, hey, I'm going to. So he grabs one and goes. And, and, and so the wisest man in the world says, I need one. I'm the wisest man in the world. The world needs me. So he grabs his and takes off. And the priest and the boy is sitting there, the little boy scout. And he says to the little boy, he says, you know, I lived a good life. I'm a man of God, full of faith and power. God's been good to me. And I'm just going to give you the back test takeoff. I'm going to give you the parachute. You just take off. You take on off. And so the young man grabs the, uh, the um, parachute and gets ready to take off. And he says, well, there's, a, there's another one here, uh, Reverend. There's another one here. He said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, there's another one here. He said, what do you mean? He said, the wisest man in the world took my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you get it a little later. <laughs> but, but he sought for the wisest people in that region to come and interpret his dream. And to his amazement, they couldn't do it. So, so now the butler remembers Joseph and says, hey, I know a guy I was in prison with. I did time with him. I mean, he was locked up together. And uh, he had the ability to interpret dreams. He said, well, fetch him. Go get him. So they go to the prison and, and, and they escort uh, Joseph to the, to the Pharaoh. And Pharaoh tells him about the dream that there were so many cows and, and uh, it was some fat cows and some little, some skinny cows. And, and he tells him, say, look, 
the skinny cows ate the big cows. <laughs> he said, now what did this mean? He said, I got it. He said, what it means is that there's going to be seven years of blessings. Woo! Seven years of blessings. But he said, listen, it also means after the seven years, there are going to be seven years of famine. And he asked, he said, what should I do? And Joseph said, listen, you save up during the plentiful years. You put some aside and be prepared for when you don't have. Be prepared for a rainy day. And I'll say to you today, save your money. And your money will save you. Save your money and your money will save you. Reminds me of a story. Went to Chicago real quickly. Went to Chicago. I had a group of young people with me, and we were doing a fundraiser in Chicago. And uh, I had the van, and make a long story short, I had the van, and I parked at, um, at uh, you know how Chicago is, some of you might not know, but it's rough in there. And uh, I parked the van at, at Walgreens. And so I was, the kids wanted to go to Red Lobster, so we go to Red Lobster, and I said, well, I'll come back and get the van. Well, I am enjoying my meal at Red Lobster, and uh, all of a sudden one of the kids run in and said, Pastor! They tore in the van. And I said, whoa, let's go. So now, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm going, I'm running. Y'all know, I, and I, then I was bigger than I am now, but I was getting it. Man. I was getting I got there and it was gone. So uh, I asked the police officer, I said, well, you know, where, what happened? He said, well, they done told it here, there, and everything. And make a long story short, I jumped in a cab, called a cab over to where the van was, paid the man the $250 for it, got in the van, came back and sat on and sat on the red lobster and finished my meal. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying we had money. And when you have money, your money will save you. Now if I didn't have that money and we in Chicago and Van told, we're done. I got a call first lady. Hey, first lady, can you borrow some money from uh, Dr. Lightsey if you can't call him up? We didn't know him there, but call somebody <laughs> and borrow some money. No, we didn't have to do that because we had money. What are you saying? I'm saying save your money for a rainy day. Save your money and your money will save you. Well, this is what, what Joseph was able to do. And it caused, he created a job, he created a position, and he became the number two man in the whole, whole Egypt. He was calling the shots, and he worked hard and put grain up for a rainy day. And sure enough, sure enough, the rainy day came, and it was a famine in the, all of Egypt area, and also Canaan. It was all over. The whole known world was in famine, but not for them, because they stored. And so Joseph and Joseph's brothers had to come and buy grain. And to the amazement, when they show up, and I'm just reading, the, I'm just telling the story. Let's read. Dr. Lightsey, let's read Genesis chapter uh, 39, verse 1. I'll tell the whole story. Chapter 37? Uh, yes, chapter 37, verse 1. Thank you. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Mm. Or shalt thou 
indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Okay, so now, now because he said, I, hey, I dreamed that there were 12 stars, or there were 12, uh, there were 10 stars actually, 10 stars, I dreamed, and I was one of the stars. And he says, the moon and the stars, and the, and the moon and the sun was in the dream, which was the mom and the dad. So not only is the sons bowing down, but his mom and dad is bowing down. So that didn't go over well with Pops. <laughs> Pops was not too happy. All right, let's read. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he sent him to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Okay, stop right there. So they conspired to, to kill him. So what they did was they grabbed the coat. They said, give us that coat, young man. Give it to us now. And, and they grabbed the coat from him and threw him in the pit and then killed a goat and put the blood of the goat. I mean, this is premeditated murder. <laughs> put the blood on the goat and took the coat to the dad to show the dad that he was eaten alive and there's nothing left. The, the wild beast done ate him up. And here's his coat. We managed to get the coat. See that blood, Pop? See that blood? That's his, that's his blood. He dead, he dead, he dead. All right, let's read. Verse 19. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beasts have devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands, to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was coming to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianite merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. Mm. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I whither, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat 
and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave until my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Stop right there. So we see this story unfold of jealousy towards their own brother. And we see how they conspired and how jealousy motivated them. But here I'm going to close with this. And we're just about out of time. Go with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 20. Uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter uh, 50. And we're going to close with this. Genesis chapter 50. When you have it, say amen. Let's look at verse 17 through 20. And we'll close right there. Genesis chapter 50. Verse 17. So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I in the place of God, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Come on, saints. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Wow. Incredible. What you meant for evil, God turned around for good. It's amazing. It's amazing how God was in control of the whole situation. Joseph had to go through those trials and difficulties and Potter's wife mishandle him and mistreat him for him to experience the presence of God and be used mightily to save a nation in the midst of famine. God used him, even though his brothers came against him, even though his brothers was envious, even though they were jealous of him, even though they went out to kill him, and we, even though they did all of that evil against him, he stood and, and loved them in spite of. When they showed up uh, at the city and needed grain and needed food, he loved on his brothers. He wept for them. He loved his father. He loved his family. In spite of what had happened to him, I'm here to declare to you today, uh, you may have been mistreated by family. You may have been mistreated by a boss. You may have been mistreated by loved ones. You may have been treated, mistreated by individual. But I'm here to tell you, everything will work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. God is working his divine plan. No matter what's happening, no matter the trial, no matter the difficulty, no matter what you face, know that God is going to be there for you. God's working his divine plan. It may not look good. Uh, it didn't look good for Joseph when he was in the pit. It didn't look good for him when he was struggling, going through difficulty, when all hell was breaking loose in his life. Uh, it didn't look good when, when his brothers came against him and tied him up and sold him into slavery. That didn't look good. Uh, but in the end result, uh, God showed up and showed out. I'm here to tell you, keep your head up high. Uh, trust in the Lord. Uh, lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge God and all your ways and God will direct your path. He'll make your enemies your footstool. Uh, God will intervene in the midst of all hell breaking loose in your life. Uh, there may be trials. Uh, there may be problems. Uh, there may be difficult. But don't give up. Uh, don't quit. Uh, don't be envious. Uh, don't be angry. Uh, don't be upset. Uh, put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and worship the Lord in spirit and in reality and give God praise in the midst of your test, uh, in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your trials, in the midst of adversity, you praise
praise God. Uh, no matter what it looks like, uh, no matter who comes against you, no matter what the enemy says, uh, no matter what he does, uh, you praise God regardless and watch heaven open up for you and watch God step in and intervene on your behalf uh, as you gave him praise, uh, as you gave him glory, as you gave him honor, as you magnified him. God will show up and show out for you just like he did Joseph. Hey, listen, adversities will come, trials will come. How you handle them and how you interpret them makes the difference. Joseph was able to interpret it for his good because the favor of God was on his life, just like the favor of God's on your life. Some of us don't know that. Let me encourage you today. Know that the favor of God is on your life. The prosperity of God is on your life. Some of us don't know that. But the prosperity of God is on your life. The grace of God is on your life. You have to know that. And know that God is working his divine plan. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. When you're going through the valleys of the shadow of death. Fear no evil, because God is with you. Amen. Joseph didn't fear. He trusted God and went down in history as God's best. Squeaky clean. Adversities came. Woman tried to rape him. He ran and said, how can I do this thing against my God? Some of you, if a woman was to pull on you, you go, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Ooh. But Joseph said this. How can I do this thing against my God? As First Lady alluded to, that the word of God in you, that you might not sin against God. Have the word of God in you. So when troubles come and temptations come and trials come and problems face you and you're in a test, let the Holy Spirit and the power of God get you to a place you say, I can't do this against my God. I can't be jealous towards anyone. I must love everyone. I must care for everyone. I must have everyone's best interests at heart. Pray for those who despitefully use you and say all manner evil against you falsely. For Jesus' sake, stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air? Go to FWC Charlotte. Dot com and click on give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you. continue my series my blessing blocker series how many show of hands are getting blessed with the blessing blocker series let me see your hands amen okay great most of you well I'm going to continue my series to the Lord tells me to do different because I believe that 
we're already blessed. I believe that you're blessed already because the scripture says that you have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. But the problem is most of us don't know how to get our blessing from heaven. We don't understand how to tap into the heavenlies, into the unseen realm, and begin to see what's possible, what we can create, and what we can declare, and then what we can make happen. Most of us are not there. And so as your pastor, my goal and purpose is to elevate you in your spirituality so that you move into what's possible and be a, a, a creator for what you can make happen for the glory of God and get thy will on thy will be done on earth as it is as heaven to get heaven down on earth because heaven looks good for you and some of us have never really looked into the spirit realm to see what the spirit realm looks like because we're afraid of the unknown you know it's, it's spooky to some of us you know I mean, it's scary. We're afraid, you know, of the unknown that we might tap into something that may be overwhelming or too strong for us. So we're afraid of the unknown. But the spirit realm, that's where the true spirituality is. It's in the heavenlies. And you have to bring that to your spirit. You have to bring it to, to who you are. You got to get heaven into your spirit. So, so your life looks like heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven's a done deal. He's, his word is settled. Everything is done in the heavenlies. But see, you got to break through demonic and demons and devils and demonic activity that hinders you. They work against you. Demons have been assigned by Satan to hinder you, to handicap you, to keep you from living life powerfully. And they're assigned to your life. And unless you understand who you are and whose you are and understand God's word that you are more than a conqueror and that you are a king, a king, you are, believe it or not, you are a king. God created everyone to be kings because kings are to rule and to reign. But because people feel less than and people don't have the resources and the finances, they settle for being a peon. They just settle. But God designed you to be a leader, a king. He designed you. That's who you are in the spirit realm. But see, what happens is because of those who dominate through intimidation, manipulation, and, and rule and reign over your life, then you take a back seat. So as your pastor, I'm, my job is to empower you to rise up and take your rightful place as a king. See, the, God's plan was never for Israel to have a king. That was never his plan. His plan was that the hearts of people would be convicted by their conscience, to just to serve God. But because they wanted to be like every other nation, they wanted to be like every other uh, region, they wanted a king, and God permitted them to have a king. But the fact is, we were all created to be kings. <laughs> and, what, and a king is one who has authority, one who has power, one who can make decisions. That's who a king is. And a king rules. And you are to rule your, your life. You were created in the image and the likeness of God. You look like God. You favor God. He created you in his image and gave you dominion. That means he gave you charge and told you to subdue it, to control. You are to take charge over the things that try to take charge over you. You are to take authority over the things that try to take authority over you. Nothing should rule you. Nothing should control you. Nicotine, drugs, sex, any of that shouldn't control you. You should control it. But you can recognize your weakness when it's out of control and you don't have control over things. It has control over you. So today, I want to build your faith and I want to get you to a spiritual level that's high in God.
I want to get you to a place that you just know that you know that you know who you are and your confidence, your confidence level to rise in the name of the Lord. Because the scripture says that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm, but also it says that our battle, the struggle that we have is not against each other, but it's against demons and devils and demonic activity that hinder us from receiving what God has already released in the heavens. So today I want you to get some spiritual binoculars. I want you to clean your glasses. I want you to begin to look into the eyes of the supernatural. And I want you to begin to see what's possible, what you can create, and, and see what your life's supposed to look like. Okay, so that's my goal today. All right, now you got to help me with it, okay? Because I'm going to boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> Revelations, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. And Dr. Lysis, we're going to go to the uh, Hebrews 11. We're going to go to the, um, the Hall of Faith and look at some of the generals and the heroes in the Word of God. Okay, Revelations, when you have it, Revelations chapter 21, when you have it, say amen. Revelations 21 verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. He that overcometh. In other words, he that come over. He that come over shall inherit all things. What you got to do? You got to overcome. Go with me if you would to Mark 11. Very familiar passage of scripture. Mark 11. Let's look at verse 23. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and to be cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. You doubt you out. Say if you doubt you out. Yeah. But shall believe that these things which he says shall come to pass, or shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Father, I thank you for your word, and I ask in the name of Jesus as I step out in faith. And Lord God, empower this awesome congregation to move into their greatness and to get rid of the blessing blocker of no faith or lack of faith or little faith, but to increase their faith today, to move into the realm of of creativity, to move into the realm of what's possible, to break through all the demonic forces and the demons and the devils and rise up and conquer over the things that want to conquer them and take control over them. I bind the hand of the enemy right now and I loose an anointing. I loose the anointed one's anointing in this house. Jesus Christ, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Saints, if we're going to increase our faith, we're going to have to take action. Faith is a action word. Faith honors God and God honors faith. The scripture says without faith it is impossible to please God. They that come unto God must believe that he is and that God's a rewarder to them that just go after him. Those that seek him. Those that go after who he is and develop an intimate relationship with him and walk and talk with him. And I want you to understand something this morning. Your faith is only as strong as the faith you create. You have to create faith. I mean faith. You are a creator. You got to know that you have co-creative power with God. You got to know that. Well, Pastor, I ain't know that I can't do that. Uh -uh. No, no, no. Don't get tricked. You have co-creative power. You can have the faith of God. The scripture said, when it said have faith in God, that means actually in the Greek to have the faith of God, to have faith like God. What did God have faith? There was nothing and God created everything. There is a place in your life where you might have nothing. You might lose everything. Nothing is not a bad place to be because that's a place that you can create everything. But it's in the faith that you can begin to create. It's in the faith that you can begin to declare and decree what's possible. It is in the faith that you say that uh, this is where I'm at, but this is not where I'm going to stay. This might be the beginning, but this is not the end. It might bring me to a place of end in the season, but God's going to start a brand new season for my life. 
But so often we get stuck like Chuck, no disrespect to Chuck, but we get stuck in a situation and we, and we can't, it's like a rut and we just spinning our wheels, not going anywhere because somehow we got hoodwinked and bamboozled and tricked to believe that we can't move forward. But see, you have to learn how to create faith because you are a creator. God was able to create by speaking nothing into existence. There was nothing. The world was void. It was empty. And in the emptiness in the void, he spoke through the, his spoken word. And I'm here to tell you that your destiny is in your mouth. But see, the battle is in the mind. And what happens is so often because of the struggle in our minds, our minds will trick us, deceive us, and make us feel like we can't do it. Our minds will tell us, what makes you think you can do that? Have you lost your mind? How are you going to start that business? You ain't got no money. You ain't got no honey. <laughs> you ain't got nothing. How in the world you think you're going to do something? And the enemy will trick you and make you think. That's why you have to understand that you have to create faith. You are a creator. You have to create. And what is faith? Listen to me. Faith is certain of things you cannot see. You're certain of them. You're confident that you can do it because you have seen it. See, faith sees what's possible. Faith doesn't say it can't be done. Faith says that it can be done. And we have to become visionaries, visionaries in faith. A person of faith is a visionary. They see what it could be, what it should be, what it will be, what it's going to be, what it is going to make happen in spite of the way it is. That's what a visionary, no matter what it looks like, they know it's not going to stay the same. And you got to know your situation may not look good. Your situation may look dim. You might be having some difficulty. You might be having some struggles. You might be having some trials. But it's subject to change at any given moment because you're going to create faith because your faith is only as strong as the faith that you create. God already created faith. Now he wants you to, with co-created power with him, operate in, in the supernatural and your ability. Because God will do what you can't do, but you, you was what you can do. You do what you can do, and God will do what you can't do. Not only, well, let's, wait a minute, I'm going to get in the head of my house. Dr. Lightsey, would you be so kind to read? Let's go to Hebrew chapter 11. When you have it, say amen. Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Listen here. It says, listen, now you can't see, you can't see it. It's tangible. It's in the supernatural, but you're only going to see it by faith. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's tangible. Faith is tangible. It actually can be a reality to you. But it's only in the spirit realm. And it says that the elders was able to use the technique of faith. And the elders brought about a good report. In other words, they'd done some great things because they believed God. Because they knew that it had been done before or it could be done. You know, some of the things that we do in life, we're told that it can't, it's impossible. And when we're told that it's impossible, we believe that it's impossible because we've been told it's impossible. Uh, it's impossible to do things that were records that were set uh, in the Guinness Bird, Bird, Bird record. The, those, those things that were set, those records that were, were already established, it's been said they can't be broken. That's the, that's the highest that it can go. The Guinness Bird Book of, of, of Records says that this is, this is it. And for that reason, many people think it's impossible. Well, that's, I may be able to do what they did because it was done. It's been done before. So I can at least believe that I can do what they did. But to go beyond them because they set the record. I can't do that. And we limit ourselves. 
And that's where, where, where a lack of faith and a blessing blocker in our life is when we limit ourselves and what we can't do. And so you have to surround yourself with people who are going to encourage you, who are going to speak into your life and tell you can. Because you'll, be you'll be around so many people that will tell you you can't do it. They'll tell you right up, right up front. Now, you know what? <laughs> you know, I, you was all right until you started talking crazy. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, with God, things are possible. And you got to know that. With God, all things are possible. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, with God, all things are possible. Okay, let's read, Dr. Lightsey. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. By it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith. Without what? But without faith. Come on. It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. All right, stop right there, Dr. Lightsey. Okay, so without faith, it's impossible to please God. You want to please God? You have to develop faith, but you have to be a creator of your faith. You have to create the faith that's, that's in your life because if you don't create the faith that's needed to, to move forward, then, then you won't have the ability to launch off into the deep because of the limitations and the restraints and the boundaries that society put on your life. Because folks will tell you you can't do it, the world will tell you you can't do it, and sometimes you will tell yourself you can't do it. But the fact is you can do, you can do all things through Christ who will strengthen you. Faith sees the outcome in spite of what happens. Faith sees the outcome. In other words, faith doesn't see it the way it is. Faith sees the outcome of a bad situation. All hell can be breaking loose. Trials and storms can be taking place, but they see beyond the trials, the storms, and the tests of life. They see beyond that. I mean, going through a problem, going through some difficulty, but faith says, I'm going through. I'm not going to stop and park and just, you know, put it in neutral and stay there. And sometimes we do that. Sometimes when we're going through, we get tired and say, well, I'm just going to put it in neutral. And we stay in that situation, and then we wonder why our life doesn't have workability. We wonder why things are not happening for us. Happening for us. We wonder why things are such a, a wreck for us and not, not, not prosperous for us. Because we done stopped, and we got stuck right there because we got tired of pushing and trying to get through that trial. But I'm here to tell you today that you push your way through every situation, every storm, every trial, every difficulty. You get a vision for what's possible. You know where you're going to be in the next five years. You got to have a goal in life. You got to know where you're headed. Because uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. If you don't know what you're going to conquer, accomplish in life, then you will just spin your wheels doing nothing. I'm here to tell you today, open your spiritual eyes and get a vision for what possible and begin to create and begin to soar high for kingdom living and say that I'm more than a conqueror and no demon and no devil is going to stop me from hindering. I'm going somewhere in life. Uh, I'm going to be somewhere, somebody in life. Uh, I'm going to accomplish some things in life. I'm not going to be a loser. I'm not going to be a failure. Folk ain't going to put me in the grave saying I didn't do nothing now, and I didn't leave my legacy on this earth uh, that I was just a lazy, good for nothing, sorry individual. 
Samuel. All I did was be a powder and a doubter and a do without her. No, I'm going to be one uh, that knows God and spends time. I'm going to be one who is excited and ignited and enthused with the things of the kingdom of God. I'm going to be one that is energized with the anointed one and his anointing. When people look at me, they're going to see Christ uh, living inside of me, the hope of glory. Uh, they're going to see a man uh, who is committed, uh, who is dedicated, who is faithful. I don't know about you today, uh, but when I leave this world, uh, I want people to know uh, that I was a man of God full of faith and power and God's anointing. Well, Pastor, that's good for you, but I'm just not called to do that. I'm just chilling. I'm just taking it easy, taking life as it comes one day at a time. What kind of life is that? You are a creator. Life lives inside of you. Once you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, not a different spirit, but the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. And if it can cause a dead man to come alive, uh, it certainly should be able to touch you. Uh, you can't tell me you know Christ and you're dead. If you know Christ, you're alive. Uh, if you know Christ, you are excited. You can't tell me you know Christ uh, and you're walking around in defeat. Uh, you're walking around complaining. You're walking around backbiting and talking about folks and ridiculing and talking about how jacked up life is and how messed up life is and how my life is jacked up, toe up from the floor. I'm here to tell you, sir, honey, you got to meet Christ, uh, the anointed one and his anointing so he can put some life inside of you uh, so you can live life powerfully, uh, live life intentional and live life on purpose. Can somebody get excited? I'm coming. I'm coming. All right. <laughs> I'm kind of caught in my zone right here. I'll get you. I'll get you right after service for sure. I'm in my zone now. All right. So not only faith sees the outcome in spite of what happens, okay, but faith discovers a world where the lines are already drawn. In other words, there's limitations on it. In other words, it says you can't go so, f but only so far. You can only go this far to the to the cliff, and if you if you go any further, you may fall over. If you go any further, you 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 may go down. If you go any well, no faith d removes the line. And faith says, I can go across the barriers and the limitations that's put on your life. Those things that tell you what you can't do, what's impossible, what I can't accomplish, what I can't create, what is, what is impossible. Faith moves across that line that's drawn in your life. You got lines drawn in your life that tell you you can't go to cross those lines, but I'm here to tell you today, rise up in the name of the authority of the anointed one and his anointing, and you cross that line. Go beyond, soar high for kingdom living. Well, I'm a little afraid I fall off the cliff. I can't fly, Pastor. I can't do it. And so we stop at that line. But faith makes that line disappear. And you're ready to cross that line. You may be seated. Faith crosses that line of those limitations and those boundaries. And those things that, that hinder you, faith moves across that line in spite of. Yes. Reminds me when I was in school. Guys come up to me and say, we're going to fight after school. Okay. We're going to fight then. <laughs> we'll give you space and opportunity. So 
We get outside, right? I draw the line. Cross that line. Let me see how much faith you got. <laughs> and I was smart enough not to wait till they get across the line. Soon as they tried to do like this, pop, I cold cock them. Bam! <laughs> they don't know what hit them. Okay, and then I rush them. And then I say to them, I told you not to cross that line. Okay, and that's what the enemy tells us. Don't cross that line. And we listen to the enemy and we don't cross that line. I'm here to tell you today, if you are going to move into your greatness, if you're going to soar high for kingdom living, those lines that's been drawn in your life, you got to cross them. You got to jump over the line and make it happen. So not only is your faith is only strong as the faith you create, and faith sees the outcome in spite of what happens, and faith discovers a world where the lines are not already drawn, but your faith is only as strong as the test you endure. The faith is only as strong as what you are able to endure. If you can't stand up against adversity, if you can't stand up against tests, if you can't stand up against the powers of darkness and look them into the eyes and recognize that you are a anointed vessel and demons and devils cannot touch you. Demons and devils have to stay away from you. They need to be a, so afraid of you. They recognize that you are the anointed one and his anointing. There is fire on your life. And then when there's fire on your life, demons and devils stay away from fire. Because they know that that's where they're going to spend eternity, so they ain't rushing to get there. <laughs> so they stay away, so you stay on fire. You stay anointed. You stay full of the Holy Ghost and watch demons and devils run from you. Watch demons and devils stay away from you, and they're going to mess with Brother Bobo and Sister Sookie. Yeah, and Sister Strawberry. They go messing with them. And Sister picking off. <laughs> but they'll leave you alone when you're on fire. Yeah. You got to stay on fire. You can't sit around, you know, having these pity parties, feeling sorry for yourself, yeah. opening up the door for the enemy, allowing the enemy to come in. You can't sit, you can't go around complaining and talking about that. Ba you open up to demons and devils. Your spirituality will never rise to conquer over demons if you always complaining, murmuring, backbiting, talking about this, talking negativity. You got to be a person that talk faith talk. You got to be talking about what is possible. You got to be talking about what you're to create. Uh, you got to be talking about what you're going to accomplish. You got to be talking about what you're going to do for the kingdom. You got to be talking about how it's possible. You got to talk about what is going to happen next. Uh, you got to know that I'm next in line uh, and my God is going to bless me uh, and he's going to take me places that I've never been before. And you got to talk about them places like you've been there before. You got to begin to see them uh, in the spirit realm. Uh, you got to begin to see yourself uh, traveling and going places for God. You got to see yourself accomplishing great Thing. You got to see yourself uh, sitting high. Uh, you got to see yourself with a confidence level. You got to see yourself uh, having conquered over every blocker, every demon blocker, every 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 blessing blocker in your life. Uh, you got to see yourself uh, whole and complete. Uh, you got to see yourself confident. Uh, you got to see yourself dedicated to God. You got to see yourself in covenant relationship with God. You got to see yourself uh, in a positive light. Uh, you got to see yourself uh, as somebody who is strong. Uh, you got to see yourself as somebody who is uh, courageous. Uh, you got to see yourself as somebody who is bold. You got to see yourself someone who is complete. Uh, you got to see yourself as someone who is mighty. Uh, you got to see yourself with confidence. Uh, you got to see yourself in uh, most of all in the image and in the likeness of God. That's where you got to see yourself. Because how you see yourself is vitally important. When you look in the mirror, 
And for God's sake, have the ability to look people in the eye. You can be seated. You know, I'm leery of people who can't look me in the eye. Because their confidence level, or they got shifty eyes. One thing I do is examine when you come to Freedom Worship Center, Charlie, I go. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But on a serious note, it's important that, that you can look a person in the eye with confidence. Because when you're shifting yourself, you don't have a good self-image of you. You don't have a good sense of, of value. And Satan, his, his tactic and scheme is to devalue you, to make you feel less than. So that's why this message today is to empower your life to move and soar high with an expectation and fall in love with Jesus all over again with an excitement to praise him and to worship with him and to get excited, ignited, enthused, and infused. Amen. All right, let me wrap this thing up. Your faith is only as strong as the test that you endure. So you're going to have to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Listen to me, and I'm almost done. You are going to have to take tests in life. Ask Reverend Sharon Lightsey, she'll tell you. And Dr. R.J. Lightsey, he'll tell you. And Dr. Bradella Hall Walker, uh, they'll tell you. You got to take tests in life. In the university, they take tests. But in life, you're going to take tests. And if you don't pass it, you got to take the exam again. I remember taking the insurance test twice in Orlando, Florida. I got a job and as an insurance agent, they told me, said, hey, you don't need no exam, uh, take no, uh, you don't need no license right now. Just go on, make some money and sell a lot of insurance and don't worry about it. What do they want to tell me that for? I sold, I was agent of the year, sold insurance like crazy. But what happened was, I went to take the exam twice, and I failed it both times. And the manager called me in the office, he says, hey Randall, look, got some bad news. This is the last time you can take that exam. You failed it this time, you out of a job. Let me tell you something. I went home and studied. I knew the material. I knew the t material in and out because I applied myself. What are you saying, preacher? You got to apply yourself. And I applied myself, went and took the exam, and I passed it. What I'm saying to you today, you're going to take exams in life. If you don't pass them, you're going to end up taking them again. Just go ahead, be smart enough to go ahead, build your faith, build your character, build who you are, take the exam and pass it. Then you don't have to take it again. And then you graduate. And then in life, you graduate to graduate. Graduate to the next level of your spiritual life. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air? Go to fwccharlotte.com and click on Give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you. And so often we're not even aware that there's unforgiveness in our spirit and in our heart and in our life. Sometimes we're just not aware of it. And others can see it uh, quicker than we can. I was having a conversation with my lovely wife and Dr. Valentine on yesterday, and we were talking about the fact that we can't see ourselves, that we just see a reflection of us. And what happens is people can see things uh, quicker in our life than we can. Reminds me of a young man who was in love with this pretty girl. I mean, he was in love with her, and she was cheating on him, and she was running around on him, and he couldn't see it. And everybody else could see it. He was the last one 
to be able to see it because love is blind. And maybe he didn't want to see it. Maybe he didn't care to see it. But we oftentimes can't see ourselves because when we look in the mirror, we see a reflection. Because most of us don't know, or some of us, I should say, don't know that we've never seen ourselves. You've never seen yourself. All you see is a reflection of you. But people see the real you. We see you for who you are. And so, so often we think we're fooling folk. You know, the old saying that you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Yeah, that's a true saying because so often we think we're coming across one way. In reality, we're coming across another. And there's an old saying, I peeped their whole car. <laughs> so, so I want to continue my series on blessing blockers, which we know the scripture declares to us that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. That's a done deal. The, the heavens have already blessed us. The scripture says that we have already been blessed. So you don't have to get blessed, try to muster up blessings. You are already blessed. You got to know that you are the blessed of the Lord. But the problem is, is that there's demons and devils and demonic activity because the scripture says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. So right where we're blessed in the heavenly places, so is demonic activities and, and demonic activity. And they're hindering us from receiving what God has already blessed us with. So we have to fight. The, the, the battle is in the spirit that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the, the key is to get heaven down on earth and it to show up, your life to show up the way heaven designed it to be. Your life has been designed. As Dr. Lightsey understood and said today, and it was so powerful, how God knows our need before the foundation of the world. He has already made provision for you. And we got to get a hold of that revelation that God has already made provision for you. He's already designed your life. And he knows the thoughts. Uh, uh, the, the thoughts that he has towards you, thoughts of, of peace to give you a bright future, an expected end, the scripture says. God has your best interest at heart, but so often we can't see that because of circumstances and the trials. And trials are, are there to strengthen us. That is God's plan to strengthen you. Trials are not designed to to cause you to live a life of defeat. Trials are a test to build character in your life, to build you up. It's, it's in adversity. It's in trials. It's in difficulties that God is working his divine plan. But again, you can't see that. Everybody else can see it on the outside, but you can't see it. Why? Because you in it. OK, and it's hard when you're in trying to look out than out looking in. I remember when we were pastoring in uh, Sanford, Florida, a low income area. And immediately I pastored there six months and knew that it would be better to be out of that area reaching in than being in trying to reach out. Because so often when you're in something, it, it, it consumes you and it, and it dominates you and it control and you can't see clearly. You know, I can't see clearly now. The rain is gone. Going to be a bride. bride. <laughs> so you can see clearly when the rain is gone. So you got to get the rain and you got to get those things. So you're put on your spiritual binoculars. Get you some bifocals so you can see into the spirit realm. You know, get you some spiritual glasses so you can see clearly where God wants to take you. Because God will show you the end, but you got to start at the beginning. God shows, shows us Cornerstone Christian University. He shows us an awesome, extraordinary, and amazing university. But we got to start at the beginning to get to the end. But see, the devil's just the opposite. He'll show you the beginning, but he won't show you the end. In other words, he'll show you the fast money, the slick life, the, 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 um, the partying, and the uh, joy of sex. But he don't show you AIDS. 
He don't show you prison. He don't show you getting robbed. He don't show you getting killed. He don't show you that. He show you the fast life and the fast bucks and the gold chains and the flashy diamonds. But he don't show you the end of what that will cost you if you're doing things contrary and things that's violating the law and, and, and committing crimes. He don't show that. He shows you the opposite. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you want to be on point with God, do the opposite of Satan and you'll be right on with God. Can somebody say amen? amen. So I want to deal with an awesome story of forgiveness this morning. But I want you to understand and clearly that so often we cannot see ourselves. And I want you to understand today that it's going to take the spirit of God. To x-ray your heart, to see if there's anything that's hindering you, that's working against you, that's stopping you from moving into your greatness. Perhaps something happened when you were a little kid. Perhaps something happened when you were a child. Perhaps something happened in your school days. Perhaps something happened just yesterday. And it is irritating you and you don't even know it you go about life and you just think everything's okay but in reality it's hindering you and a blessing blocker because you have not got present to the pain and the hurt that that caused you and you have not brought resolution to it you have not brought it to its it's a completion. You haven't settled it. And you think you have, but in reality you have not. Because so often you're walking around like a time bomb when say somebody say something to you and you go zip off on them and you got an attitude and you, 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 you're upset and you don't even know why. You have no clue why you just went zip off on that person. You have no idea why you told that person off. But it's something that happened in your past a lot of times that we've never dealt with. And it's unforgiveness for people who have hurt us. But as Dr. Lightsey said, God made provision for that. Before the foundations of the world, he sent his son Jesus to come through this earth and walk through the Virgin Mary and die on Calvary's cross and, and be and cause his blood to make an atonement or to make things right for you. God has made everything right for you. So the blessing blocker that's hindering you with unforgiveness, today is the day we're serving it notice. We're serving it notice today that this blessing blocker of unforgiveness for those who have hurt you, those who have mistreated you, those who mishandled you, we're going to deal with it today once and forever and once and for all so that you can soar high for kingdom living, so you can launch yourself into your greatness, so you can move and become an extraordinary person and an awesome, powerful person for the glory of God. So you're not hoodwinking bamboozle and tricked by demons and devils and demonic activity that come to steal and to kill and to destroy and work against your life. God has a plan for you and he has a purpose for you and he has an assignment for you and he has a journey for you and he has a goal for you and God has a future that is bright for you and today we're going to take and lift off the covers off of that. There's anything that's hindering us and we're going to soar high and see the vision of far off where God wants to take us. Can somebody say amen? amen. Go with me if you would to Hebrews and then I'm going to read an incredible story about a awesome man by the name of Philemon who had a slave whose name was Onesimus. And we're going to see an incredible, incredible story of forgiveness. And I want us to relate to this and I want us to get present to forgiveness today. But turn your Bibles first, if you would. I'm going to read Hebrews, uh, Hebrew uh, chapter 12. I'm going to start at verse 14, and I'm going to read 15 as well. And then we're going to turn to Philemon. And we're going to look at this story of Philemon, how Philemon was a very wealthy man who had a church in his home and he had slaves because it was legal to have slaves back then and he had slaves and what was so amazing was one of the slaves says hey I'm tired of being a slave you know I, I'm ready to book I'm ready to get out of Dodge I'm tired of working for the master and so he decides that he's going to steal 
and takes something from his master. So he steals from Philemon, Onesimus, the slave, steals, and he heads off. And he heads towards the journey to get away and start a new life. But in the course of trying to start his new life, he ran into a person that was full of faith and power and full of forgiveness and full of God's anointing and God's purpose, named the Apostle Paul. And so he shares with him, he said, look, man, I'm so tired of living with, with in a, being a slave with, there with Philemon. I'm sick and tired of, of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm tired of sick. <laughs> and so he says, I booked and I took and I stole. But Paul tells him about Christ. Paul tells him about God's forgiveness, what he had done. Now, here he's convicted. Apparently, he wandered into one of Paul's meetings, and Paul just happened to be preaching on unforgiveness as well. <laughs> and so, so, as he was preaching, I'm sure, surmising the story, I'm sure that after he heard the, the story about forgiveness, he came to Paul to confess. He came to Paul to tell him what he had done and the wrong that he had committed. And he was there with Paul the apostle and so now they built a relationship and so the story is we're going to share I'm going to share with you and Dr. Lights is going to read so you can get a clear picture of how powerful forgiveness is because this is the greatest story that I find in the word of God about forgiveness and I wanted to apply to your life and I want you to get present today to how powerful it is to forgive those who have hurt us, those who have wronged us, those who have mistreated us, those who have done us wrong. And some have said, I'm not going to forgive them. I don't care. I'm going to die. You know, bless God for my father, uh, the Reverend McKinley Walker. Reverend McKinley Walker had a trial with his boss. And he's made this statement in his later years. He said, I can make it to heaven. If I could only forgive my boss. And thank God he forgave him. But he held on to it, my dad, for years. Because he was hurt by what had happened. And so often we don't see God working his divine plan. We don't see that God is in control. And that's a real issue with most people. They don't see that God is in control. But if you really love God, if you're really in relationship with him, if you're really walking with him, if you're really fellowshipping with him, if you're really getting to know God, you got to trust him. And you've got to know that he is in charge. And you've got to know that all things are working together for good to those who love the Lord, that are the called of the Lord, that God's working his divine plan in your life. You might not like it. You might be upset about it. You may be frustrated, but you got to see God in it. The key is to be able to see God in everything. That's our problem a lot of times. We can't see God in everything. We see the devil in this, and we see Satan in this, and we see demonic activity in it. But you got to see God in everything. Everything that takes place, you got to see God in it. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12. You have it, say amen. Let's look at verse 14. It says, Follow peace with all men and holiness. Without which no man can see God. The problem is, unless we're walking holy, and that means that we don't have those issues and things working against us, you can't see afar off. You can't see when, when, there, when there's a cloud in your life. You can't see when, when there's rain in your life. You can't see when there's fog in your life. And that comes from having issues in your heart and in your spirit that is not resolved, that's not dealt with, that you have swept it under the rug and you have not dealt and got present to your issues of your previous hurts. That's why we see so often that people are married 5, 10, 15. <laughs> we see them married a lot of times. It's because they haven't dealt with the first issue in the first relationship and they jump into another relationship and they carry that baggage into that second relationship and they think it's going to get better. No, it's not. 
You're going to have the same problems that you had in the first unless you deal with it. And that's the way life is. Unless you deal with the issues and the problems that face you, you're just going to carry them into your next assignment. And then your next assignment, you're going to get hoodwinked, bamboozled, and tricked. And you want to, what happened? Why it didn't work? Because you didn't deal with the issue at hand. Verse 15 says, Looking diligently, uh, not just looking, but looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God. And that's what Dr. Lysi was referring to earlier, the grace of God. God made provision before the foundation of the world for you to have his grace. To have his grace. And that's getting what you don't deserve. And then his mercy is not getting what you do deserve. <laughs> Lest any man, lest any, excuse me, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you. Do you get it? That's the revelation right there. I can almost close the book and go home. And lest, lest, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. That's what we're dealing with today. Is a root of unforgiveness that springs up and troubles you and thereby many be defiled. So a lot of times that at times of being unexpected, it pops up that root of resentment, that that root of anger, that that root of unforgiveness for that person who has wronged you, who has hurt you. Or a lot of times it could even be what you did to yourself. You could be mad at you. You could be mad at what you have done and you're angry with you. You haven't forgiven you. You haven't brought resolution to you. You haven't brought peace with you. And it springs up. You spring up a lot of times. <laughs> but you don't know that because you can't see yourself. You don't know. You don't know what you. I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> I have no clue. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't get it. it I, it's surprisingly just hit me by surprise. I wake up in the morning and I feel some kind of way. <laughs> it springs up. Issues spring up. And today we want to bring resolution to those so that you can walk whole and complete. So that you can walk with your head up high with confidence that you're a king's kid. That I'm made in the image of, in the likeness of God. I favor God. I'm somebody. And your confidence level rises to its full potential. So your assignment that God has given you, you have that bold faith to accomplish and fulfill your God-given purpose and your God-given assignment. Can somebody put those hands together and give God praise? So today, as we look at this incredible story, turn your Bibles to Philemon. It's right after uh, Hebrews is right before Hebrews. New Testament. Got it? Got to say amen. Okay, Dr. Lysi, would you be so kind to read the entire book? I may stop you along the way, but we're going to look at the entire chapter of this incredible story. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphipia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus 
and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Stop right there. He's setting him up. I love this letter because he's setting him up because he's setting him up for the for the, the kill, so to speak. <laughs> he says, listen, I could take this whole thing and, and because of convenience sake and I can keep him here with me. I could keep him here. You can't do nothing about it. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> he says, I can keep the slave here for convenience sakes. He's, he's serving well. He's doing well. Hey, he's part of now my my like my assistant pastor or, or my associate pastor. He's in the kingdom of God now. And hey, I could keep him for convenience sake. I could keep him for my own selfish gain. But I want to do the right thing. And how many know it's very important that we do the right thing? Let's let's read. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have for, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. He says, "Listen, the, the guy was unprofitable to you because he stole from you, he hurt you, he ripped you off, he grabbed a bunch of goods, sold it, and hustled and 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 did wrong by you." But but he says, "Listen now." He's now profitable to me, and now he's profitable to you because he's not the same guy anymore. He's not the same because, number one, he shared with me about his need for forgiveness. And I shared with him the scripture how Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died for his sin and for his forgiveness. And that God says, if you don't forgive, then he won't forgive you. He gives him the whole spiel, I'm sure. But the, but the bottom line is, he gets saved. And now he's profitable. Now he's, he's not the same person. He's a brand new creation that we must understand. If any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. The old is done away with and the new has come. So he's presenting his case to him that, hey, this guy was once, yes, he was a thief. Yes, he stole. Yes, he was a robber. But now he is a born again, spirit filled, tongue talking, Holy Ghost packing person full of grace and power full of God's anointing and wisdom and I'm, I'm telling you he's now a brand new creation he ain't the same no more how many know what it is to experience Christ uh, how many know what it is when God came into your heart and forgave you and washed your sins away and all that you had done and all that you had uh, committed against God God wiped your slate clean you remember that day uh, when you came to the saving knowledge of Christ uh, and you said God uh, come into my heart Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Make me new. I'm sorry for what I've done. I repent of my sins. I want God into my life. I want Jesus to come into my heart. And I refuse to live for Satan any longer. I serve that rascal notice to get out of my life right now. And I want Jesus to come and live and take residence in my heart. And then something happened on the inside. You felt the anointing. You felt the presence of God. You were changed from the inside out. No longer did you think like you used to think. No longer did you want to go to places you used to go. No longer did you talk the same. You were born from above. You were born from the Spirit of God. You were born again to live again. Hey! What a great day it was for me. October 15, 1982. When I said, God... Come into my heart. Forgive me. I'll never forget it. 
I'll never forget that day as I shared with the counselor of uh, my anger, my resentment, my bitterness. Oh, how upset I was, how mad I was at the world, how mad I was at society. And I told him all, oh, yes, how things were. And he looked at me and said, your problem is not the white man. Your problem is not drugs. Your problem is not alcohol. It's not your problem is not because you were incarcerated. Your problem is a separation from God. And if you accept God as your personal savior, God would cleanse you and deliver you and set you free. And I want you to know today, uh, October 15, 1982, uh, Jesus Christ came in my heart and changed me and set me on a new course, gave me an assignment and said, hey, in the future, I got you a set because I want you to be the president of Cornerstone University. God had a plan for my life. He has a plan for your life. He has a destiny for your life. But the enemy wants to hoodwink you and bamboozle you from the hurt and the pain with inside of you. But I'm declaring to you today uh, that today you're going to get free and whom the sun sets free is free indeed. <laughs> Glory be to God. Oh, would you read, Dr. Lighty? Verse 12. Whom I have sinned again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should be as it were of necessity, but willingly. See, he says, hey, I can keep him, like I said, but I want it to be up to you. You make the decision. You want to send him back to me or whatever the case may be. But I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to send him back to you. But I'm not sending him back to you as a thief. I'm sending him back to you as a born again believer. Let's read. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now, this is incredible. The man done stole. The man is a thief. The man is a robber. Ran off and took the man's goods. Goes and gets saved. And now, because of salvation, he's being promoted. He's going back. He said, don't take him back as a slave. <laughs> Wipe his slate clean. Don't send him back as a slave to be a slave. But now because he has met me and I shared the gospel and he's a born again believer. Now, don't mishandle him. Don't mistreat him because I want you to know something. He was worthy of death in that day. He was worthy of being crucified for being a thief. But he says, I'm going to send him back to you. But I don't want you to make him a slave anymore. I want you to promote him. <laughs> I want you to take him higher because I want Christ glorified of what he's done because he's changed his heart. He is not who he used to be. And that's the key in salvation. Is that once you accept Christ, you have a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of direction. Let's read. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. Stop right there. I like the fact that he says, listen. If he owes you anything, if he owes you any money, I'll take care of that. If it's all about the money, if it's all about the Benjamins, don't worry about it. I got this. I will take care of his debt if that's an issue. He says, but I want you to treat him as if he was me. And you know how I treated you because you got saved because of me in the first place. You'd be lost on your way to hell if it wasn't for me. You would die in your sins if it wasn't for me. So I want you to treat him just like you would treat me. When he comes back, see him as me walking through there. Don't see him as that thief 
Wipe his slate clean. If you, you caught up on the money, you're angry about it, you're upset about it, the root of bitterness is going to spring up in you and you're going to want to have him killed. I want, but I want you to know something, he says. I wrote this with my own hand. So when he get back, don't accuse him of forgery. Don't accuse him that he wrote this and forged my name and wrote the letter, and now he's running his second scam on you. <laughs> you know, when your credibility is shot, people don't try. <laughs> Integrity is, is awesome. And integrity is honoring your word. That's why I encourage you all to honor your word in everything. Because it, it's in the little things that you can honor your word in. Being on time. Doing what you say you're going to do. When you say you're going to do it. Where you say you're going to do it. And how you say you're going to do it. Because your life will have workability. Your life will never have workability like you want it if you don't honor your word. Because when your life is jacked up, tore up from the flow up, when you don't honor your word, where you say things and don't honor it, then you want to know why things fall apart. You want to know why you, you don't, things don't work for you. Why everything is, is, is falling apart for you. Why nothing works for you. It won't work for you until you learn the power of honoring your word. Because it's in the words of your mouth that gives you the power over circumstances and situations. Your destiny is in your mouth. It's what you say. What you say. And if you can't honor your word, you think God will? You got to honor God's word. He says, if my word abide in you and you abide in my word, you can ask what you will. <laughs> wow. If my word abide in you and you abide in my word, you can ask what you will. But there's so often we say things out of our mouth that we don't honor. And you ha we have broken promises Broken agreements, broken arrangements, we never cleaned them up, and you got now a whole big heavy load on your shoulder that everybody else see that you don't see. <laughs> and you don't know why things not working. You don't know why things uh, just falling apart. You don't get it. Why, why this not happening? Why that's not happening for me? It's because of the broken promises and broken agree agreements. I remember... Quick story. Young lady was planning to get married, and uh, the day of the marriage, she left that man on the altar. He was devastated, hurt. He was so, his life was just messed up because he invested, loved the woman. She didn't show up, ran off with another guy. And so he was hurt, messed up. Her life. Never had workability. But she came to herself. The Holy Spirit 20 years later. Dealt with her. And told her to find him. And clean that mess up. And the story is. She found him. And apologized. And sat down with him. And he said. I have been waiting. For 20 years. To hear those words. And it freed him up, freed her. The story is she went off to marry and had a successful marriage, raised two children, and had a beautiful life. But for 20 years, her life was messed up because of a broken promise and a broken arrangement and a broken agreement. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying ask God today to show you those broken promises, broken arrangements, broken agreements that you've made and you haven't cleaned them up. And it's simple as I'll be there today at six o'clock and you know you didn't have no intentions on going. You just told that person that just to shut them up or just to just tell them something. Well, I'll pay you this weekend. You know you're not going to have the money this weekend. You know, instead of saying I'm going to pay you, listen, just bear with me. I'll pay you just as soon as I get the money. See, that's why the bill collector is up on you. You make them a promise, boy, and you don't keep it. They do everything they can to destroy you. They mess your credit up. And if you owe them anything, you make a promise to pay and don't pay it. Now we want all our money. We want the whole $2,000. 
Oh, you pay whole, you pay for the whole car. $30,000 we want tomorrow. <laughs> or we come in to get it. Cause you made a commitment. Because you made a promise and you didn't honor your word. And if you make a promise, and you don't honor your word. Just clean it up. Just call them back. Say, listen, I, 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 listen, I told you I'd be there at 6, but you know what? It's going to be 6.30. But just to come in is arrogance to just come in uh, when you want to. It's arrogant. <laughs> I'll get there when I get there. See me when you see me. It's arrogance. And you think God's going to bless arrogance? Then you wonder why things, huh, what's wrong? Why my life doesn't, why everything, nothing opens up for me? Why I don't get blessed like Sister Suki? And why don't I get blessed like Sister Strawberry? They always getting blessed. And I'm always needing and wanting and, and, and hurting. And they just prospering. And Brother Bobo, he just got it going on and, and everything. And, and, and it ain't working for me. I don't know why Brother Bobo got got a Benz and I, I'm riding this old raggedy car. It's, you ought to find out what, what Brother Bobo was doing about honoring his word. Might be something we can learn. All right, let me wrap this up. All right, Dr. Lightsey. Verse 19. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Mm. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy, in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Oh, my God. He was so confident in the gentleman. He told him, said, listen, I know you'll do more than what I ask because I know you know, understand that you are indebted to me because, hey, it's through me that God used that you got that abundant life. It's through me that God uh, saved you and prospered you. And now your wealth and you are a successful businessman. You're a successful slave owner. You, you got success. You got mega bucks. You got what you got because of your relationship with God. God has blessed you in an abundance. Now you're going to get caught up in this old penny ante stuff about this. Look, five, ten dollars he stole and ripped you off, and you're going to have a problem with that. No, forgive him because God has forgiven him. And if God can forgive him, who you think you are? But he didn't say it like that. He was nice about it. He could have just got out and said, Who you? Hey, look, I want you to forgive him because that's the right thing to do, and you better do it because the word of God said you better do it, and you, and you do it. Do you understand what I'm telling you? I'm telling you, I'm Paul the Apostle. Don't you know who I I'm somebody, and you're going to do what I tell you to do, and I expect you to treat him nice, and you better not mishandle him, because God's going to get you. No, 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 he didn't, he, uh-uh, he, he didn't do that at all. He didn't pull rank He in weakness. He told him, look, you're a blessed man. You're a prosperous man because of me. God blessed you through me. Because I was the one that shared with you how Christ suffered him, and he gave you his riches of his glory. Gave you the riches of his glory. And today, we don't know how rich we are. The scripture says, Jesus Christ, though he was rich, became poor. That through his poverty, we might be rich. The prosperity and the blessings of Abraham belongs to us. But because we don't honor our word and we never uh, do what is what God requires of us, to, to respect and honor him because it's disrespectful for God not to honor your word because he says that you are made in the image and the likeness of him. You represent God. Well, not me. <laughs> yes. Once you are born again, you are an ambassador for Christ. You go and speak on God's behalf. So your language needs to be as an ambassador. And sent forth, speaking the encouraging words to bless and to strengthen and to encourage individuals, not tear them down. You know what? With that dress you got on, boy, that raggedy thing, boy, you need to throw that thing in the garbage. Girl, where you get them bobo shoes from? (laughs) That hairdo, don't you know that's a 1940 hairdo? You better come on up here to the... 
uh, the, 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 the new year, 2019, girl, have it like this here. Bro, man, where you get that suit? My God. That looked like what the Temptations wore back when they was doing the Temptation Walk. But we build up. We encourage. That's the key. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that our language, to change our language, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. What's in your heart is going to come out. It's in the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. What's in your heart? Are those issues in your heart of unforgiveness and resentment springing up from time to time? And taking precedence over your life and dominating your life and controlling your life. And you're a puppet by what's happening in the inside of you. That's why we have to take inventory and cleanse ourselves. That's why the worship service is so powerful as we lift our hands and our heart. And some of us are just uh, out of touch with, with but the presence of God. It's time that, to lift your hands and surrender to the Lord and let the power and the anointed one and his anointing come on you. And then God will then Erase and make null and void the things that cripple us. And then we walk in power. On last week, I believe it was, Sister Erica experienced, experienced the presence of God in such an extraordinary way. She wanted to live in that space. I loved it. So powerful. I mean, just so blessed. You know, because most of the time, powerful service, anointing flow. I mean, presence of God in the place. People just so hungry for God, crying, weeping, falling out because of the presence of God. And then we had a benediction. Child, what's up? What you been up to, girl? Girl, let me tell you something. Boy, you know that that guy, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, girl. And then this, the latest gossip started coming. And we forget all about God. Oh, hey, bro, man, what about that football game, man? Do you see what's the name? One, they lost, man. I couldn't believe they lost, bro. Yeah. But Erica says, I am going to home and enjoy the presence of God. I'm not going out to no park. I'm not going here, there. I don't even want to be around a bunch of what's not happening with God. She went home to be in the presence and enjoy God. That's why you see such a tremendous change in her life. Because she's hungry for God. And I want to admonish all of us to continue to be hungry for his presence. To be hungry for his anointing. So that we can continue to strengthen one another. She strengthened me. I was almost convicted to go to the park. I don't think I wanted to go, but I had to go as a leader in the community. I had to show up. And then I just did a (laughs) drive-by. (laughs) <laughs> okay, right, let me wrap this up. But so awesome, and I applaud, I applaud those who are hungry for God. But don't deal with those issues of your past. That's what is messing you up. And listen, and I'm done. Listen to me. Here, listen to me. You don't see them. You are blinded to seeing them. Okay? Just get that. You don't see him. That's why you have a spiritual father, a spiritual mother to help you. That's why we're here. We are here to be your spiritual covering. But if you rebel against the spiritual covering and think your life going to have workability, no, it won't. Listen to me. Trust me. I'm trying to wrap this up, y'all, but I'm telling y'all. My heart now, preaching out of my heart. Most of you know I was a bad boy growing up, so it was kind of hard for me to submit. So I had a pastor, and uh, it was hard for me to submit, just be honest. Hey, no man tell me what to do. Spiritual father, I ain't listening to him. My wife used to always encourage me. That's why we've been married 34 years. Honey, 
that's your covering. Now, I'm my own man. I call these shots. Yeah. I couldn't see it. But because I had a good wife that didn't let me get away with that, to rebel against the pastor, to rebel against authority. And ultimately, we're rebelling against authority. But when you have a spiritual covering, a spiritual parents, spiritual father, and spiritual mother, we see things that you can't see. You have to learn to trust us. And sometimes that can be hard, especially when you want to do your own thing. Because we're human. I know. Hey, take it from someone who knows, who did it. But because of my faithfulness to another man's ministry, because I learned obedience to the things that I suffered, <laughs> because I had a wife and a pastor that loved me through it, that I learned obedience. Then I start honoring the man of God, submitting to his authority. Didn't like half of what he said. Didn't want to do what he said to do. But it took everything in me to submit and do it. And I am who I am today. Because of my commitment and the change of heart that I had towards another man's ministry. And then God gave me my own. It's being faithful to that which belongs to another man who will give you the true riches. Okay, got to wrap this up. Dr. Lightsey, read it, and then I'm going to say amen. <laughs> Verse 22, but with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet. Get your Bibles and turn them, if you would, to Psalms 41. Let's look at verse 9. And I want to minister this morning, be careful of the Judas spirit. Be careful of the Judas spirit. Psalms 41, when you have it, say amen. The writer of Psalms says, Yea, my familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which I did eat of my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Father, I thank you for your word. And I ask for an anointing upon my life this morning as I break the bread of life to give life uh, to, to the world, to give life to Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte, to empower us to move into our greatness and soar high for kingdom living. Lord, there's so many that have died in defeat, never fulfilling their God-given purpose, their God-given assignment. They were hoodwinked and bamboozled and tricked by demons and devils, and they never rose to their prominence in this life. And they never gave to us the gifts that you had given them to release to our lives because of people working against them and the Judas spirit and the betrayal and all that they encountered. They quit and they gave up. They dropped out of the race because of adversity. But I pray that this message will strengthen the body of Christ. 
that that pastor who is discouraged that want to quit and throw in the towel because of the accusations and uh, the backbiting and the ridicule and the tearing down and all that is impacting his life. Lord, we understand that 1,400 ministers drop out every month of the ministry because of discouragement, because of hurt, because of pain, because of betrayal, because of what they face from the congregation and from people. But today as I reveal and expose the Judas spirit, I pray, Lord God, that it will empower lives, that lives will be touched and transformed and changed and rearranged, that there will be an anointing that will break every foul spirit and every demonic force that will come against their life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, the writer of Psalms says that this was my buddy. This was my ace boon coon. This was my road dog. This was who I depended on. We were tight. We were so close together. We were so familiar with one another. We understood one another. But yet he turned on me. He turned and raised his heel against me to crush me. My friend, my confidant, my constituent, my Conrad, just came against me to destroy me. Devastated. And I'm sure a lot of us have been devastated by people who have hurt us. People who we thought were our confidants. People who we thought were for us and what we were for. But then all of a sudden, they rose up against us and came against us and hurt us and devastated us. And it's a hurt feeling when individuals come against you whom you trusted, whom you relied on, whom you depend, who walk with you. Judas was a disciple called of God, believed in Jesus, saw the miracles, saw the signs, saw the wonders, saw all of the great things that Jesus did. But he had his own agenda. He had his own selfish motivation that caused him to be a part of the movement. He was not in it for Jesus. He was in it for political gain. He wanted Jesus to overthrow the powers that be. He wanted him to overthrow the structure and redesign and redefine the, the powers and the economical social system. He thought Jesus was going to come in and revolutionize and change the known world. And when he became disappointed, when he became hurt, when he began not to see his vision fall into fruition, when he began to see things not operating and functioning like he wanted them to function, when Jesus didn't do as he thought he should do. And all of a sudden now he see Jesus going in a different direction. Because the question was asked, when will you restore the children of Israel? When will we rise to power and overthrow the Roman government? When will we take charge? When will we rise up and become mighty and become a nation of power and authority? And because he didn't see that happen as he anticipated, he betrayed him. And betrayal is bad because you come against someone that is your friend. Betrayal doesn't come from your enemy. Betrayal doesn't come from people who are against you. Betrayal doesn't come from people who talk about you and are not your friend and don't like you, period. It comes, betrayal comes from people who you love, whom you care for, whom you give your all. You'll give them your shirt off your back. You'll give them your last money. But then that person that you love, that you care for, that you are willing to do anything for, they turn on you and, because, and become against you rather than for you. And we're going to look at the story of Judas. 
We're going to look at the, what motivated him and some of the things that we can identify to prepare ourselves for the Judas spirit that we may face in life. To prepare you for that person that will hurt you and, 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 and will come against you. And betrayal is horrible, especially when it's in a spouse or a loved one or a family member that turn on you, that, that deceive you and set you up for failure. Go with me, if you would, to John's Gospel. Let's look at, as we expose this Judas spirit. John's Gospel, chapter 12, when you have it, say amen. Let's look at verse 1 through 8. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, where Lazarus was which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha, Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with odor of an, an ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas, Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pieces and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, the word of God says, but because he was a thief and had the bag, and the bag what was put therein. And Jesus, then said Jesus, let him alone against this day of my burial has she kept this. For the poor always will be with you, but me ye have not always. So we see the story that here Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead, shows up so it's kind of a family affair with the brother and the sisters. And Jesus is their guest. And so Judas shows up on the scene, and Judas' spirit was totally against what they were doing. And a Judas' spirit will be against what you're doing. Yeah. Whatever you're doing, a Judas' spirit is not for you, but they're against what you're for. And what they were for is loving on Jesus. And they were for taking, taking good care of Jesus. And because of his selfishness, because of his desire for, as he was the treasurer, Jesus trusted him. Judas was the treasurer. He, had, he handled the money. He, he was the man that handled the bankroll. And all he was concerned about was money. And so because of the political realm of what he was expecting didn't manifest political power. Because that's what he was seeking, power. And a Judas spirit is always seeking power. Always seeking authority. Always trying to lord over. And so now he's going to lord over Mary and say, Mary, what do you think you're doing? I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> what do you think you're doing? We need that money. Here it is. You are using this very expensive, costly ointment to put on Jesus' feet. He didn't look at the fact that it was Jesus was tired from his long trip. 
And his sanders, I'm sure, was, was all with sand and, and his feet was sore. So she wanted to massage his feet because she loved him. Because that was the same individual who raised her brother from the dead. She never forgot how her, her, her brother had been dead. And Jesus showed up four days later and raised him from the dead. She was very appreciative. What you won't find in a Judas spirit is a person who is appreciative. You will not find them appreciating you. You'll find them condescending. You'll find them coming against. You'll find them negative. You'll find them trying to, to backbite you. They, you'll find them as backstabbers. They smile in your face all the time. They want to take your place. The backstabbers. That's who you'll find. You'll find them coming against you. You'll find them totally against you, but yet smiling in your face. They smile in your face all the time. They want to take your place. That's who they are. But you got to guard yourself and have a spirit of discernment. And that's the problem in the body of Christ. We don't seek the Lord enough to know his voice and his spirit to be sensitive to the anointed one and his anointing to have a discernment to discern that Judas spirit. Jesus had an anointing. He knew automatically that Judas would betray him. He knew automatically that he would kiss him and in, in public and then turn around and, and, and sell him out in private. Yes. He knew that. Yes. He knew what he was up to. But so often we never understand what that Judas spirit is up to. And so today as we look at this story, as we see where it says, and he took Mary a pound of ointment. It was costly. And we see in verse Let's look at verse 5. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pencils, pence and given to the poor? He wasn't concerned about the poor, but he had a resentful spirit. He resented the fact that the money wasn't coming to him or coming to his control and a Judas spirit always has a resentful spirit and is always complaining he began to complain and and when we complain it disempowers our life he began to complain to Jesus about Mary because a Judas spirit will always have a spirit of complaining they always complaining about everything. Everything they see, they complain about it. That's how, you can, that's how you can know a Judas spirit. When they're around you, they're complaining about others, complaining about the job, complaining about their work, complaining about the church, complaining about the pastor, complaining about the choir, complaining about the praise team, complaining about the music. They complain about everything. That's the Judas spirit. And we have to guard ourselves against the Judas spirit and put the Judas spirit in his place. All too often, we allow the Judas spirit to rise and we never say anything. You hear him come against pastors and you don't say anything. You see him, hear him coming against your boss and you don't say anything. And I'm not saying that you need to cause an argument. I'm just saying you should simply say pray for them. Or say something positive when you hear them complaining and being negative and being resentful towards a person. But we let them tear them down. And ultimately, we're tearing down the body of Christ. When we tear down each other, we have to build each other up. We have to encourage one another. We have to begin to love on one another. I mean, just love the hell out of everyone. I mean, no matter what they're doing, no matter their actions, you love the hell out of them regardless. Don't fight fire with fire. 
When people come against you, when people come to hurt you, have a love and a compassion for them and a sensitivity and find out what is motivating them. And all too often what is motivating them is selfishness and pride. And they may just not like you. And that's all, in, that's all good, good if they don't like you. Everybody is not going to like you. I had to learn that the hard way. I thought everybody liked me. I'm not kidding. I mean, I thought I'm just the most likable person. To me, if you don't like me, something wrong with you. <laughs> I mean, I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I don't have no issues. I don't have those things that hinder me. I don't have restraints and boundaries. I, you know, I'm a carefree spirit. I, I love the Lord. I love people. Amen. And so, if you don't love me, to me, something wrong with you. You need, you need to get a check up from the neck up. Amen. Stop that stinking thinking. Somebody ought to say amen. 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 I'm telling you. Amen. But I found that everybody is not going to love me. And everybody's not going to like me. And everybody does not have my best interest at heart. Amen. That's what I love so much about being married is having a wife who's a confidant, that she is for me, and she is what I'm for, and she's against what I'm against. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's, that's, a good, yeah, that's a good... Amen. That's a good thing. Amen. You, you know, so when all hell break loose, I know for one person that will stand by my side. Amen. No matter what. But we have to expose that spirit. We have to expose that spirit, that Judas spirit, that will kiss on you and then lie on you and, and backbite you, backbite you and mishandle you and mistreat, but, but kiss you as if they love you. Judas kissed Jesus as if he loved him. He kissed him as if he cared for him. He kissed him as if he had his best interest at heart. But in reality, behind the scene, he cared nothing for Jesus. He didn't care what happened to him. After he had seen the miracles and after he'd seen the manifestation of the power of God, seen the dead raised, seen blind eyes open, seen the lame walk, and all of the miracles that took place, but because it didn't overthrow the powers that be, he was upset. And people who have a Judas spirit, when they don't see you doing what, you, what they want you to do, they're going to turn on you. When you don't operate like they want you to operate, they're going to turn on you. That's why you have to give people what is called a, a scheduled test. That's why sometimes you wonder why we don't have a lot of members because Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte will give you a scheduled test. And very few people pass it. <laughs> Amen. See, the moment you can't handle no, you don't pass <laughs> So, <laughs> the moment you can't handle no, you fail your scheduled test. The moment we don't do what you want us to do, and we say no, or wait, or whatever, and you can't wait because you got your own agenda, and you get mad and you get upset, all oh, to stand alongside. And to be anchored and rooted and grounded that can stand firm when they're tested and tried. When they're going through the storms of life and the trials. When they're going through the tests of difficulties. 
and they can stand. Comer. They can stand mighty in the hand of God. They understand the anointed one and his anointing. They understand the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, they understand who they are in God. Uh, they understand that they're there to be a support. Uh, they know that they're there to stand alongside that church and help that church to rise as the call of God is on that church to rise in the community to make an impact and to empower the life and to deliver those who are bound and tied up and have changed. They understand the purpose of the church and the call of God and they stand along with the church. They're not concerned about that foolishness. They're not concerned about that foolishness. I'm coming. They're not concerned about that. They're not concerned about that. They're concerned about the kingdom of God. And they have a spirit of love and forgiveness. And just because you make them mad, they ain't leaving and going down to the first Baptist of the Pentecostal <laughs> persuasion. <laughs> because you make them upset. Or a message is preached and you feel like the pastor's picking on you. The devil done set you up. He ain't thinking about you. He up there preaching the word. <laughs> and the devil done fed you because we're already always listening to the voice in our head. You know, that voice is talking to you. You're either listening to me, you listen to yourself, you're listening to God, you're listening to the devil, but you always listen to something. Your mind is a meaning-making machine, and it will create thoughts. And it'll speak to you. The enemy will speak to you. You know, you know he's up there talking about you. <laughs> you know, you know, you, you that Judas spirit he was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he talking to you. You'd be foolish not to know that. And you buy into it. Oh, you'd be surprised the phone calls I get on Monday morning and times past. Pastor, I don't appreciate you talking about me. I, well, and you know, being the type of guy I am, I want to say, you ain't that important to be, for me to be up there talking about. But you know, I'm, you know, I try to be a diplomat and work it out and say, you know, I just want you to know I was preaching the word and it was never to attack you. And I, and I, and I do apologize. Well, I want you to know I ain't never coming back to the church no more. <laughs> yeah. Because of the already, always listening. We got to learn how to turn our station, our mind on station 100 J-E-S-U-S and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go to Luke's Gospel, and I'm almost done. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. Glory be to God. When you have to say amen. amen. Now during the most critical moment in Jesus' life where he needed the disciples to stand with him. He needed them to support him. He needed confidants. He needed people to be there when he's in the garden and he realizes what he's getting ready to face. He understands he's getting ready to go to the cross. Judas had betrayed him and, and he understands that my life is just about over. But before that happens, first, loose gospel chapter 22, you have it say amen? amen? Let's look at verse 45. And when he arose up from prayer, and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping in sorrow. In other words, they knew that, hey, he's on his way to the cross. He's, you know, because this is the last supper, it's, it's evident. And he said unto them, why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So during the most difficult time in his life, when he needed his disciples to pray for him, to strengthen him, to encourage him, they were not there for him. They were not there. They fell asleep instead of praying for him. And he was devastated because he was wondering why they could not stand with him. 
And a Judas spirit will be one that will not stand with you in difficult times. When all hell break loose in your life, they're going to break loose from your life. Verse 47 says, And while he had yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he was, and, and a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew nigh unto Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayeth thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Betray the Son of Man with a kiss? But if you notice in Scripture, Judas never called him the Son of God. He always called him rabbi. He always called him teacher. He never acknowledged him as Lord or Master. And a Judas spirit will never give you your title. A Judas spirit will always call you less than. You are not first lady. I'll call you second lady or third lady. You ain't no doctor. You ain't no real doctor. I'll call you brother, but I'm not going to call you Dr. Randall Hall Walker. They're not going to give you your title. They're, they're going to try to pull you down. The Judas spirit is going to make you less than. They're not going to acknowledge you as who you are and your achievements. They're, they're just not going to do that. That's the Judas spirit. The Judas spirit is an opportunist. When they see an opportunity to come against you for their own selfish gain, to gain something quickly, they're going to jump on board. When they're given an opportunity to to uh, gain and give an opportunity for something that they desire, they're going to sell you out. And that's what Judas did. He sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Because he saw an opportunity. And the Judas spirit, I'm exposing it, is an opportunist. They're looking and lurking for opportunities to step on you, to, to rise up. They come into the church as an associate pastor only to put you down to become the pastor. They come in and backbite you and talk about you and, and say, if I was the pastor, I would do it this way. And lure the congregation into being on their side. Well, you know, pastor preaches a little too long. I only preach about 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> Furthermore, uh, I, I took Greek and I took Hebrew. Uh, you know, Pastor, you know, he's not as eloquent as I am. <laughs> and he's, he's setting up an opportunity, just like Judas set up an opportunity to portray Jesus. And that's what they do. They're opportunists. But they're not for you. And not, they're not for what you're for. But they're out to step on you. To use you as a stepping stone. That's why the opening scripture said, this was my friend. And he stepped on me with his heel to push himself up. Because people will push you down to push themselves up. And for the most part, they're drowning themselves. And that's why they're pushing you down. They're afraid of failure themselves. They're afraid of not succeeding. So they look for opportunities to step on you to push themselves up. A person is drowning. They can love you. you in the water with them. They can care for you. You could be their ace, boom, coon. You can be anything you want to be to them. But they're going to push you down in that water to push themselves up to save themselves. And most people are trying to save themselves. So when they're trying to save themselves, they're going to push you down. The Judas spirit is one will push, that will push you down to push themselves up. I want to encourage you today to be cautious 
of the Judas spirit. I want to caution you against the spirit of betrayal. But I want you to guard your heart and guard your spirit. So when the enemy comes in like a flood to destroy you, God promises to lift a standard against it. And when that Judas spirit come and it hits you and it hurts you, you take a licking, but you keep on ticking. You may, be get, you may be knocked down, but you're not out. You get yourself back up and you brush yourself off and you get back in the race and you learn and you forgive them, but don't forget it. Because so often we say forgive and forget. Oh, no, don't be foolish. You forgive and remember. Let me explain like this. I'm going to share this with you and I'm closing. If someone was to, to molest my grandbaby that I let babysit her while I was gone. I was gone. The betrayal came and molested my grandbaby. I can forgive him. But I can't forget it because I'd be a fool to forget it and say, come on back and babysit my daughter next week. <laughs> I got to remember or I'm in a tight bind. So I'm going to trust Uncle to come back over. I'm going to trust Auntie to come back over or my best friend to come back over because I'm in a bind. Now, don't you molest my daughter anymore. <laughs> or my granddaughter. No. You forgive and remember because you have to protect them and protect yourself and protect everybody involved. You have to protect them. It will be ludicrous for me to, to forget and just erase it as if it never happened. So in the Judas spirit, forgive them. But remember, so it never will happen again. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website, FWC Charlotte, and consider giving a generous gift so we can continue the ministry. We're touching lives around the world, and you can partner with us and help us make a difference. Thank you so very much for your support and wish God's very best to you. speaking to the lives of people because the word of God changes lives and uh, it's great to know that we can impact and empower individuals lives by the word of God and what I want to deal with this morning is to believe the unbelievable because so often we just I don't believe it <laughs> so often it's too good to be true Amen. So we have a difficult time believing certain things. And so today I want to expand your horizon. I want to move you into a new realm of what's possible. I want you to get a vision for what you can create and what you can make happen and who you can become. Because so often we're, we're looking at things that are negative and our perception of them causes us to live in defeat. The way we view things, the way we look at things, the way we interpret things can mishandle us and ultimately cause us to live in defeat. 
our minds are a meaning-making machine, and they're const it's constantly running, 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 and thoughts are constantly coming to our head, but they're not activated until you speak them out. You can think whatever you want to think, but as long as you keep it inside of that wormy little brain of ours and keep it in its place, then it, it has no power against you. But we become what we say. We become what we speak. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And so I want to expand your horizon today to move into a realm of what's possible to believe the unbelievable. Go with me, if you would, to Numbers. Numbers chapter 13, when you have it, say amen. Numbers chapter 13. I want to deal with a story of an, an incredible story of how the children of Israel was, was delivered from the, from the taskmaster Pharaoh and was moving into the land of milk and honey, the, the land of promise, the land that God told them. They, they were moving in that, in that area or they were moving to that place of destiny. But along the way, along the journey, things happen. And so often we can, if we're not careful, we can get hoodwinked, bamboozled, and tricked and deceived and never fulfill our God-given assignment and our God-given purpose. And there's a group of individuals that never made it into the promised land. They never made it, and there were some things that happened that caused them to live in unbelief. And so they, they, they are a warning to us. So today we want to look at those warnings in the word of God to keep us from making the same mistake that they made, that we never fulfill our God-given assignment, our God-given purpose, so that we make sure that we enter into the promised land, a place flowing with milk and honey. How many want to go to the promised land? Amen. Because God has a space and a promise for all of us, a destiny that he wants us to fulfill. And the graveyard is full of folk who never reach their full potential. They never fulfilled their goal. They never moved into that, that space of what was possible. They never, they went through life messed up, toe up, jacked up from the flow up, and just their life was just miserable because they did not move into faith. So today we want to look at how we can be cautious and careful so that we can make sure that we fulfill our God-given assignment, our God-given purpose, that we can move into the promised land, a place flowing with milk and honey. Numbers chapter 13, when you have it, say amen. amen. Let's look at verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that were went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land though we, which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so were we in their sight. Now, here we see where Caleb and Joshua said, hey, two individuals who were so positive. Because behind their eyes were faith. Behind their eyes were faith. But behind the other ten was doom and gloom. They were powders and doubters and do withouters. They were negative in what their interpretation. See, so often we see things and then there's an interpretation of what we see. And sometimes we can interpret that 
as to work against us. And instead of seeing it working for us, we see it working against them. So we see that Caleb and Joshua was people of faith. Behind their eyes were possibilities. Behind their eyes were, were it was where they could see what was what it could become. Because visionaries are those who see what it could be, what it should be, what it will be, in spite of the way it looks. That's who visionaries are. They're people who don't look at it and see for what it is. They see what it can become. So they could see that God was for them, that God was on their side. They could see that they were more than conquerors. They understood that they could possess the land no matter how big them rascals was. <laughs> they didn't care. But the other said, we see ourselves as grasshoppers. And, we, and they see us as grasshoppers. But people's perception of you doesn't dictate who you are. Just because people see you a certain way, that doesn't give them the right to, to uh, impose that upon your life and for you to accept what people say about you. You can't believe what people say about you. You can't even believe what you say about you. You got to believe what God says about you. And God says you were fearfully and wonderfully made, that you were created in his image and his likeness. You favor God. Amen. So you can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. You can be an encourager and you can be encouraged. Don't let situations and circumstances get the best of you. You take charge over the things that want to take charge over you. You take authority over things that want to take authority. You take authority over things that want to dominate you and control you and manipulate you. You take charge and master you for the glory of God. Amen. And Caleb and I'm coming. And Caleb and, and Joseph, or Caleb and Joshua, rather, they were people of faith. Behind their eyes, they could see what was possible. You got to get behind a vision that's behind your eyes. Behind your eyes, you got to begin to see into the supernatural. You got to begin to see what is possible. You got to see what you can create, what you can design, what you can make for the kingdom of God. And in spite of what the devil shows you, no spite of what your, your mind is trying to tell you, what you cannot do and trying to be negative, you got to override the negativity in your mind. Amen. You got to override it. You got to tell your mind what it's going to think. And you can't let your mind just think what it want to think. You just go on and think what you want to think. No, you tell your mind what you're going to think. You're going to think positive. You're going to be a possibility thinker. You're going to be one who is creative. You are one that's going to speak those things that be not as though they were. You are one who is an overcomer because you have come over. You're more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ. Who Christ will strengthen you in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your trial. You got to be confident that God will show up and show out in the midst of your difficulty. You got to know that God is for you. You got to be convinced of that. And these ten were not convinced that God was for them. Ten of them were not convinced. And they saw themselves as little bitty grasshoppers. We're less than. And the way you perceive yourself is very, very, very important to your destiny. If you see yourself as a loser, as a failure, as one who is inadequate, inferior, less than, if you feel, you feel like that you can't accomplish anything, you're defeated already. You got to know that you can do all things through Christ who will strengthen you. You got to feel good about yourself. You got to know that you're the head and not the tail. You got to know that. You got to believe that. Amen. You got to know that you are somebody. That God, when he created you, he didn't create no junk. Amen. Amen. That he had your best interest at heart. The scripture says that I know the thoughts that I have towards Vicky. Thoughts of peace and, 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 and thoughts of peace and love to give you an expected end, a bright future. God promises to give you a bright future. Every one of you, God promises to give you a bright future. No matter what the devil tells you, no matter what people say, no matter what uh, is being said, God has promised you a bright future. Amen. Amen. 
But you have to move in faith. And you have to design that by the design of the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And you got to be able to see it behind the eyes. You got to see it behind the eyes because if you, what you see is always negative, you know. If you see a glass and it's half full instead of half empty, amen, or half empty instead of half full, or the door is half open or half closed, perception of how you see things amen. will determine your destiny. Go with me, if you would, to Hebrews. I'm going to deal with four very important dangers that I want us to avoid. Very important that we avoid these dangers. Hebrews chapter 3. Let's, let's look at verse 4. I mean, excuse me. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's look at verse 1. Let's look at four dangers real quickly that I want us to avoid to keep from falling into a pit or, or falling short of and not fulfilling our destiny and our goal and reaching the promised land on this journey to greatness, okay? Hebrews chapter 4, let's look at verse 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being, le being left us of entering into rest, any of you should seem to come short. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. What the writer of Hebrew is saying is that whole generation died in defeat. They never entered into the promised land. They were doubters and powders and do withouters. They were complainers. They complained about this. When God blessed them constantly with things uh, to provide for them, they didn't look at what they had. They looked at what they didn't have. They didn't look at the fact that their, their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. Forty years they were in the wilderness. Forty years they were going around in circles, going around, and the promised land was only 11 miles away. 11 miles. And they, could, and they kept going around in circles. You got me going in circles. Okay. They were going around in circles. Instead of moving in the direction, they were so mentally tormented or dismayed in their mind. This mentally tormented in their mind that they couldn't get direction in which way to go. It was only 11 miles to enter, and they died in defeat after being delivered from Pharaoh's army, after being delivered from the, the, the possibility of being drowned, the waters opened for, uh, for them. They went through on dry, loud, dry ground. God made provision for them, but they died in defeat anyway, regardless of what God had done for them because they didn't move in faith. They were complaining about this. God provided for them food, and they complained about it. They complained we don't have this and we don't have that. Instead of worshiping God and thanking God for the blessings that he had given them and, and being appreciative of what he had blessed them with, they were complaining. And complaining always disempowers your life. Don't ever complain about anything. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'm going to encourage you to rejoice. Amen. Amen. Regardless of what it looks like, you give God praise regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the situation. So the writer of Hebrews is warning us of the danger of a lack of faith. He's warning us, the writer of Hebrews says, be cautious. You have to mix faith with the promise. The promises that God has given to you, whatever that promise God has spoken to your life and said that you were going to accomplish or you were going, what well, he was going to make happen for you, you got to mix faith with it. 
If God says you're going to be married in a year, man, you got to mix faith with that. If God tells you you're going to prosper and be blessed with, with an abundance, you got to put faith with that. If God tells you that next year you're going to have a brand new car, you got to have faith with that. If God tells you next year you're going to have a, a new home, you won't be living where you're at, that you're going to have a new home, you got to mix faith with that. They didn't mix faith with it. God told them that they had a promised land. He said, flowing with milk and honey. You got a land that you, that you inherited, that, man, you can rest, a place of rest. You can chill, take a big, cool pill and chill and enjoy life. You're going to have it made in the shade. Amen. And in spite of them mixing faith with it, they looked at the circumstances and they faced opposition. And the moment they faced opposition, they gave up and quit. You can't quit in the midst of opposition. Opposition will come, but opposition is there to prove the hand of God. Amen. When the opposition came of the Red Sea, it was proof that God existed. Because God parted the Red Sea so they can walk on dry ground. And I'm here to tell you today, when you face opposition, watch the hand of God move in your life. Uh, watch God show up and show out uh, in the midst of your opposition. You keep your faith and you stay strong and you stay courageous regardless of what it looks like regardless of the circumstance regardless of the situation you rise up as an overcomer and you overcome and you stand strong in the Lord and the power of his might you fight demons and devils and demonic activity you rise as an overcomer you be strong in God for the glory of him and watch God show up and show out on your behalf when you move in faith You got to believe God. Amen. Amen. You can't believe what you see. Amen. I'm talking this morning about unbelievable. Having the ability to believe the unbelievable. Amen. Because in the natural, it looks dim. In the natural, your circumstances look like you're not going to be able to make it. But that's in the natural. We walk by faith and not by sight. We don't focus on what we see. Faith is certain of things you cannot see. Amen. But you're confident in your God. This is the confidence that we have if we ask anything according to his will. The word of God says he hears us. Glory be to God. So we have to caution against the danger of a lack of faith. Be cautious. Be careful. Because it will trick you. Demons and devils and demonic activity will work against you. If you don't mix faith with the promise. Amen. The promises that God gives you. And he gives all of us promises. Precious promises in his word. Amen. Precious promises. And we have to believe. And take him at his word. Because he's a God. Amen. That cannot and Amen. will not lie. Come on somebody. Amen. Not only the danger. Of. Of a lack of faith but the danger of unbelief. You gotta be cautious of the danger of unbelief. The writer in Hebrews lets us know not only of the danger of, of a lack of faith, but a lack of unbelief. Go with me if you would to Hebrews chapter three, verse 12. You have it, say amen. amen. Look what he says, the writer. He says, take heed. In other words, take note. Check this out. In other words, check this out, brethren. Lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, which is, the, which is, which is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Oh, my God. It says, be cautious of your unbelief, because if you're not careful, unbelief will push you and deceive you and trick you and hoodwink you and bamboozle you and cause you to lose out on, on what's possible. Yeah. It says, be careful of your 
unbelief, not believing that you can do it. Oh, I just don't know if I can do that. Oh, I just, that's just too hard, Pastor. I don't know, Pastor. I don't know if I should or not. I can't, I ain't never done that before. Boldly go where no man has gone before. Be, be willing to move in faith. But unbelief will cripple you. And let me just give you a side note. Your belief is the strongest power that you have over demons and devils Amen. and demonic activity. To know that you're more than a conqueror, that Jesus Christ defeated demons and devils and demonic. He came to destroy the works of the devil, the scripture says. But you got to believe that. You got to believe demons and devils are under your feet. You got to believe that you're, you are somebody, that you're more than a conqueror, that you can do all things through Christ is going to strengthen you. You got to believe you're the head and not the tail. You got to believe that. Amen. You can't doubt because if you doubt, you out. <laughs> you cannot be a doubter. Amen. You got to believe. But unbelief is a, a way of sabotaging you because when you have the spirit of unbelief, then that gives the demons and devils a license to deceive you. <laughs> The scripture says, lest any of you be hardened through deceitfulness of sin. Unbelief will trick you. Unbelief will trap you. You cannot fall into unbelief. You got to know what you believe and why you believe it. <laughs> Amen. You just can't believe, well, I just believe. You got to know why you believe it. If I ask you, uh, if you, you're a Christian, why, why, how do you know you're a Christian? Well, I don't know. My mama said I was. My daddy said I was. I grew up in a Christian home. No, you got to know that you gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and that you believe that he suffered, bled, and died on Calvary's cross and the grave couldn't hold him down after he was crucified and killed and buried. He got up out of that grave with all power, all authority, and gave us the keys to the kingdom and said, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And better known and better said is already released in heaven. Glory be to God. What you lose is already loosed in heaven. What you bind is already bound in heaven. Glory be to God. That's where you have to have the belief system operating in your life. So the writer of Hebrews warns us of the danger of unbelief. That, hey, here is what happened to some folk that had unbelief. They died in the wilderness. They died in defeat. So you don't want to fall into unbelief. The writer of Hebrews encourages us, hey, be a believer. Amen. Believe in what's possible. Believe in the supernatural. Believe in the power and the authority of the anointed one and his anointing. Believe it. Don't fall away. I don't know if God can do it or not. I don't know. My mama said he could. My daddy said he could, but I don't believe. I don't believe. He's going to have to show me. No, you got to believe it for yourself. Amen. Glory be to God. Not only did the writer of uh, Hebrews encourage us of the danger and not to fall into the danger of uh, lack of faith and also the unbelief, but he also en encourages us to be careful of being dull in hearing. Look with me, if you would, to he Hebrews chapter 3. No, go with me, Hebrews chapter 5. He warns us of the danger of being dull in hearing. In other words, got wax in your ears <laughs> and can't hear very good. <laughs> look, look, look what he says in verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to utter it, seeing that you are dull of hearing. I want to tell you a lot of things about the word of God, but you ain't listening to what I'm trying to tell you. 
I'm trying to empower your lives for your greatness. I'm trying to move you to become extraordinary. I'm trying to move you to a realm of what's possible. I'm trying to get you a vision that you can create, but you're dull in hearing. For some reason, for some reason, you got a lot of wax in your ears and you're not being able to hear me. Or something is going on in your head that's a motor is running, a meaning making machine, and you're not listening. You're dull in hearing. The writer of Hebrew encourages us and he speaks to us of the danger of not having the ability to hear good, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. To hear God speaking in the inner man. To hear the word of God being preached to you. And not just hear, but do. That's why I love the word in the Old Testament, hearken. When you ever hear the scripture say, hearken unto the voice of God. <laughs> it's saying hear and do. The word hearken means to hear and do. And James said it like this. You talk about you got faith, but I'll show you my faith by my works, by my actions. He says, faith without works is dead. You got to put your faith in action. You can't just be one who talk about things, or, or you can't be one of those who wonder what happened, or, or, or wish the things that happened, or looking for things to happen. You got to be one who make things happen. That's who you are, by faith. But you got so many people that wonder what happened. Okay, they don't make things happen. But they wonder, oh, I'm clueless. Because they, they have the inability to hear because of what's going on in their head and in their life. They're not hearing good. So he warns of the danger that, hey, that group died in defeat. They died in the wilderness because they didn't listen. They, they wasn't paying no attention to the pastor Moses. They didn't listen to their pastor. The pastor was trying to tell them, but they wasn't listening at all. And they were dull in hearing. Yeah. No matter, no matter what the pastor said, Pastor Moses said, they, they argued with him. And turned around and, and, and wanted to actually kill Pastor Moses. And they were so hard-headed, they created a golden calf and started worshiping oh, idols. Instead of worshiping Jehovah, the true God who had delivered them from the, fa from the taskmaster of Pharaoh and had brought them out of bondage and was taking them to a glorious place flowing with milk and honey, just like taking us to, to uh, an island of paradise. That's where he, they was taking them to paradise, to an, an island of prosperity and blessings that they wouldn't necessarily have to work. They could take it easy and rest. But they couldn't hear. They could not hear. So the writer encourages us to learn how to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Learn how to listen to the man and the woman of God when they're speaking and preaching and empowering your life. Amen. Because a rhema word can change your life forever. Amen. One rhema word from heaven can revolutionize your life from where you were to where you need to be for the Amen. glory of God. Amen. Last one and I'm done. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, he warns us of the danger of not maturing, not growing up. <laughs> he, 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 he warns us of the danger of staying a baby, <laughs> sucking on milk, and a pacifier. Want somebody to pacify you, want somebody to stroke you all the time. He warns of the danger of not maturing. Look, look what it says. Hebrews chapter 5, you have it? Let's look at verse 12. For, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, you need that one teach you again. I mean, you're dull of hearing, number one. You didn't get it the first time, so they got to teach you again. 
I mean, over and over and over, they're telling you the same thing over and over, but you're dull of hearing it. You're not listening. You're stubborn. Want to do it your way. Want to have it your way. This is not a Burger King religion. <laughs> you can't have it your way. Look what it says. Ye need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the articles of God, the basics. You need somebody to just take you back. You know how folk, you know you offer salvation and they come to the altar just all the time for salvation. You know, all the time. You know, every time they've been walking with God 50 years. And you say, if you want to give your heart to the Lord, they walk, they walk to the altar to give their heart to the Lord. And you say, man, I thought they were saved 10 years ago. <laughs> but, they, but it's because they are not maturing and they're not growing in the things of God. And so the writer of Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrews are trying to encourage us as believers to grow and develop. To not, to not just uh, hear the word, but be a doer of the word. Look what he said. Verse 12. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the articles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, like a baby. You got to be fed milk. <laughs> you a babe in Christ. You know, you're one of those that, that, that run around the church always needing, always causing problems. You know, a kid is into everything. I mean, running around, you know, pulling stuff and, and, and creating this and making, and making this happen and just a mess. You got to keep your eyes on them. Well, that's what it, the scripture says. You got to keep your eyes on these individuals. Because they're babes in Christ. They'll do something that's, that, you know, like a kid will drink some turpentine or some paint thinner or something. They'll do crazy stuff. A kid will do that. Because they're not mature. They haven't grown. Yeah. They'll, they, they'll think it's, you know, they'll grab it. They don't know what it is. And drink it. And that's what a babe in Christ, they'll just soak up anything. They'll go to some occult, and, and next thing you know, they come back with some crazy stuff that they heard. That we die and we come back a lot to life or something. You know, just some kind of weird stuff that they done soaked in because they babes and they're not they're not growing in the things of God. All right, let me wrap this thing up. And become such as have need of milk and not of uh, not strong meat. In other words, they cannot digest the, the, the things of the supernatural. They cannot. Milk is something that you got to be, you got to pacify and give them something to just help them to get by until they can grow and develop. And once they grow and develop, you can feed them the strong word of God. You can, you can feed them the revelations that God gives and speaks and declares. You can give them that. But you can't give them that if they're immature. They haven't grown because they'll spit it back up. They'll throw it back up. And that's what a lot of saints who have not grown in the things of God, they still own milk. And God warns us through, through the writer of Hebrew to say, grow up and be mature in the things of God. Don't be one who always needs milk of the word. You need the strong revelations of the word that will change and revolutionize your life and learn how to digest God's word. What do you mean, pastor? I'm talking about getting it from here down into your spirit where you can eat it, where you can swallow it, where you can digest it. Because then your life will change and then you're not going around always negative and complaining because folk is, is measuring you whether you know it or not. You say you're a Christian, they go, hmm. Hmm. Well, they may be born again, but they sure on milk of the word because they're always complaining. 
They doubters and powders and do withouters. They're negative about this. They talk about this person. They gossip all the time. They're very immature of the things of God because they cannot digest the strong meat. And that's what the writer is telling us. Be cautious because if you cannot digest the things that will cause you to grow, you will never enter into the promised land. You will never enter into that place and that space of success in the journey to greatness. You will die in defeat just like the children of Israel, the first generation, died in defeat. But we don't have to go there. Because we have this, the warning sign that, hey, this is what will happen. This is what will happen if you don't take heed to the word. This is the danger that you got to be careful. This is the danger. Look what it says. For everyone, I'm almost done, verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word. <laughs> Of righteousness, for he is a babe. He's a little baby. <laughs> Verse 14 said, But strong milk belong to them which are full age, even those who by reason of the use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Ha <laughs> ha! In other words, you can't get tricked. Demons and devils can't trick you when you are a mature individual because you have the spirit of discernment because you have grown and you have gotten strengthened and you exercise yourself in the word and you are a mighty woman and man of God. You're strong in the Lord and you're courageous and bold. You're more than a conqueror. You're able to overcome situations and problems and difficulties because you have a spirit of discernment and you know right from wrong. Nobody have to tell you the spirit of God is inside of you because the word has digested in your spirit and you have become strong and you have grew mighty and courageous and you have become a spiritual giant for the glory of God. You're not a little midget walking around. You're not one who cannot move forward in the things. You're no longer on milk. There was a time when you were on milk. There was a time when you had to suck that bottle. It was a time when you needed a pacifier, but no longer do you need to suck a bottle. No longer do you need a pacifier. No longer do you need somebody to rock you. Now today, oh, you standing in the power of God's might. You got on the whole armor of God, and you're fighting demons and devils and demonic activities, and you know who you are and whose you are for the glory of God. And you don't take no mess. You don't take no foolishness. Uh, you are mighty and courageous in the things of God. Uh, you know who you are. Uh, and you know who, that you are a conqueror in the things of the kingdom of God. Why? Because you can eat meat and not no longer on milk. In closing, Ripley's, believe it or not, I remember going there and seeing some things that were hard to believe. But in that, Ripley proved that it was real. They had the evidence and the proof. I'm here to tell you today, do you have the evidence and the proof in your life that people can believe that you're a Christian? That people can actually know that you're a Christian? If you were arrested, for being a Christian. Would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or would they say, oh, this is that powder and that doubter, that complainer, that one, that one who's going to die in the wilderness just like that first generation. That's who they are. But can they say, we got enough evidence and this person can be found guilty as charged of being a Christian? As you see the evidence in your life, as you examine them, let the jury bring the verdict. Will they find you guilty or will they find you not guilty of being a Christian? Have you grown in the things of God? 
or are you still on milk? Do you understand the dangers of, of not growing? But I'm here to tell you, if you're growing, you should be moving to that land flowing with milk and honey. You should be moving in that land of prosperity and blessings. You should be what? Blessed and highly favored. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website, FWC Charlotte, and consider giving a generous gift so we can continue the ministry. We're touching lives around the world, and you can partner with us and help us make a difference. Thank you so very much for your support and wish God's very best to you. series on blessing blockers because I believe I believe with all my heart that our enemy the adversary goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he can destroy making you feel less than making you feel inadequate making you feel like that life is jacked up toe up from the flow up and you just can't accomplish anything everything you touch just seems to fail and you can't do nothing right he has a tendency to beat us up he has a tendency to make us feel inferior and the word of god has much to say about these blessing blockers that work against us that hinder us from living life powerfully living life extraordinary living life on purpose having the ability to move forward for kingdom building being more than a conqueror, being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, having on the whole arm of God that you can stand against demons and devils and demonic activity. And anything you face, you know that you and God can master it because you know you two are the majority. You know that. And so these blessing blockers come to hinder us and they hoodwink us and bamboozle, bamboozle us and trick us and deceive us. So I want to help you today and as we continue my series on blessing blockers I want to hinder you I want to not hinder you in your growth and development and spiritual uh, growth in your life so today I want to minister to you a blessing blocker that I believe will work against you it's a refusal to grow spiritually uh, that's a blessing blocker a refusal to grow spiritually it's very important that your life takes on this ongoing growth and development where you can look back at your life and see where you've come from, to see the growth. You can't see yourself grow, uh, but you can look back and, and see that it's different. Uh, your life is different because you respond to things differently. Let me show you like, what I mean. Like when I, I weighed, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I weighed 140 pounds. They called me String Bean. That was my nickname. I was skinny as I could be, tall and lanky, skinny. I never seen myself grow this big. I never did. I just looked up one day and tried to put some pants on, and they just wouldn't fit. <laughs> and I said, what's up with this? I never seen myself. So you can't see yourself grow, growing, but by faith, you must put in motion a development in your spirituality so that you can move and soar high for kingdom building. 
But you've got to put that thing on autopilot for your growth and development. And sometimes that's not important. And so a blessing blocker is that I just refuse. I'm just good, just like this here. I'm fine. Hey, everything going just great. Um, it's hunkadory. I mean, I'm just living life. And what it, it is what it is, you know. And taking, taking that kind of attitude. But we have to be intentional in our growth. We have to be intentional in developing our spirituality. And the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, that we have already been blessed. The scripture is clear that you are the blessed of the Lord. So often we're trying to get blessed, we're hoping to get blessed, desire to get blessed, trying to get blessed focusing on getting blessed. Well, I got news for you. You are already blessed, but it's in the heavenly places. And so we have to get heaven down on earth. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because where, where the blessings in heavenly places are, so is demonic activity, because it says that we fight high ranking demons and devils. We fight, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, in high places. So right where the blessing is, there is also demons and devils that's stopping you and hindering you from receiving what God has already blessed to you. It's the story of Daniel. All of us know the story of Daniel. When Daniel spoke to God and said, uh, uh, God bless me, God immediately blessed him. But he never, it didn't manifest. And so after 21 days, he said, wait a minute, where's my blessing? I asked God, normally when I ask God for a blessing, he's right there. But 21 days later, I guess he kind of got, you know, a little impatient. And I said, this blessing is late. So he gets on the phone and called 1-800-HEAVEN. <laughs> And he says to God, most of you know the story, he says to God, he says, hey, God, what's going on? Uh, uh, I haven't gotten my blessing. God said, what? I blessed you the moment you spoke. He said, but the prince of Persia has held up your blessing. And so the prince of Persia and demons and devils will hinder and hold up your blessing that's already released to you. So you have to fight demons and devils to get what rightfully belongs to you. So God sent the chief warring angel, Michael. Michael came, dun, da, 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 charge. <laughs> and Michael went and took care of it, and Daniel was able to get his blessing, but it was held up for 21 days. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying your blessings are being held up. And I'm saying that you have to go before God, go before the throne room of Almighty God and break through those demons and devils and demonic activity that's hindering you. And then just do the right thing and grow in your spiritual life and conquer over everything that's trying to conquer over you. Take charge over any and everything that try to take charge over you. Don't let nothing dominate you, intimidate you and manipulate you. That's what demons do. They manipulate you. They intimidate you. And so we all too often let them have charge. You have to take charge of your life. Nobody's going to do it for you. I'm telling you what, your pastor in a heartbeat would love to take charge over demons and devils in your life. But if I take charge over them, you don't do anything about it is uh, about them and you let them back in your life, then they're going to, it's going to be worse than it was before. So you have to take charge of your spiritual life. So the, the message today, the blessing blocker is a refusal to do that. And, and, and how you, we can refuse to do that is simply not to get in the word of God, not to pray, not to bring ourselves to the house of the Lord and be, have that sloppy agape. You know, you ever heard of sloppy agape? Sloppy agape is when you half-heartedly come to church, you know. It's when you just, you know, like, uh, here I come. When I get ready, I come when I want to. This is my life. I want to do what I want to do. It's my prerogative, you know. And, you, and, and do what you want to do and not honor God and honor time. You know, 
And, and your life is not going to have workability until you master those things. You're losing out on so many things that you can't even see that would happen for you in the spirit realm if you would be at the right place at the right time at the right moment to get the right blessing. But we miss it, and we don't see it, and we don't halfway care. Don't make any difference. I don't really care that much. So the refusal to grow spiritually is what I'm targeting today to get us to a place of growth and development in our spiritual life. Listen, I want all of us here to become a spiritual giant. You know, we don't need spiritual midgets. You know, we don't need little people walking around with little, uh, little spirituality. You know, a bunch of little, you know, running around, you know, very immature in the things of God. We need strong kingdom building people. If we're going to build the king, listen, saints, I'm about the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, I'm not about Freedom Worship Center in Charlotte. It's all good and great. And I love this church. You guys are great people. But I'm looking at the kingdom. I'm looking at God's kingdom, building his kingdom. And I want to be a team player. Amen. Do you want to be a team player or are you just happy with four and no more, you know, and uh, you're going through the motion? Well, no. When we are growing spiritually, everything should manifest in the natural. It's done in the spirit first. Things are done in the spirit first. And then they're manifested in the natural. So if it doesn't manifest in the natural, it hasn't been done in the spirit. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying today, I'm challenging us all to get some things done in the spirit realm. Get something done in the heavenlies. That's where it's done in the heavenlies. Getting it done in the spirit realm. And then it'll manifest itself in the natural. Okay. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter one. When you have it, say amen. Second Peter chapter one says Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's you. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Verse 4 says, whereby are given to us exceedingly and great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to your knowledge temperance, and to your temperance patience, and to your patience, godliness, and to your godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity or love. Listen to this. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lack these things are blind and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he's been purged from his old sin. Wherefore, if the rather brethren, give diligence to make the calling and elect sure. For if you do these things, ye will never fall or never fail. Saints, I don't know if you caught a hold of this, but this is a prerequisite of success for your life. This is designed to say that if you add to your faith, faith is just a foundational part of the ability 
to inherit all of the blessings that go along with the package. Once you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, once you for repent of your sin and believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Once you repent and accept Christ, that positions you as a kingdom citizen, that positions you for a life of prosperity and blessings, that position you for all the benefits that is available, that is at your disposal. Now you are candidate for all the blessings of Abraham. You are candidate for all the blessings to flow down from heaven. You are candidate to, to walk in prosperity. You are candidate to, to walk in healing. You are candidate to, to walk in deliverance. Uh, you're a candidate uh, to succeed uh, and live the abundant life uh, because now you have accepted the Lord as your personal Savior and the blessings flow from heaven down unto your life. But the blessing blockers, the blessing blockers are the one that jack you up. The blessing blockers are the one that hinder you. The blessing blockers are the one that work against you and cause you to live in defeat. It's those blessing blockers that work against us, that stop us and hinder us and work against us. So we have to tear down all of the blessing blockers and we have to get rid of them so that we can, can get them out of the way so we can score a touchdown. <laughs> We got to be able to break through all of the defense that's, that's coming against us. We got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We got to have on the whole armor of God that we can stand against demons and devils. We cannot be intimidated by them. We can't let them control us. We can't let them dominate us. We got to know that with God, all things are possible. We got to know that nothing can stop us, that I'm the head and not the tail, uh, that I can do all things through Christ who will strengthen me. Uh, my God says, uh, I'll supply all of your need uh, according to my riches and glory. God's promise is to you, uh, if you walk worthy of the vocation where he's called you, he promises to pour out the blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. But get rid of the blessing blocker and grow spiritually and grow and develop in your life. But in order to do that, you got to do some adding. <laughs> you got to add to what is already there. But so often we're subtracting in our spiritual life. <laughs> we got to add. The scripture clear here that it says, and let's go ahead and build, make us a cake today. And we're going to make a cake with some ingredients. And how many know that if you... Uh, decide, you know, one of the things before I, I did not know that a pound cake was a pound of all of the ingredients. <laughs> I've been eating a pound cake for ever since I was a little boy. Mama fix me a pound cake. I had no, it's a pound of sugar, pound of butter, pound of this. That's what a pound cake is. Had no clue. But listen, we're going to build a cake today. We're going to make a cake. Now, in order to make this cake, we got to have all the ingredients. Because, you, you know, I've had some cake where I remember one time Mama sent me to the store to get some vanilla ap extract or something, right? And I don't know what I brought back, but um, <laughs> I didn't bring that back. <laughs> so Mom going to make the cake without it. I want you to know that was the most pathetic cake I ever tasted because it didn't have one ingredient and that's what she sent me to get. And that's what happens in our spiritual life when we don't have all the ingredients that is needed for our spiritual life. If one is missing, you're out of whack. And so we have to get our spiritual life in order. So we're going to do that today because it says in verse five, it says, and beside this, give all diligence Add to your faith, virtue. Now, virtue is excellence. Uh, it's, it's a form of being who you are. See, so often we, 
we, uh, as I alluded to earlier, that sloppy agape, we don't do things with excellence. You know, we do things half-hearted. You know, we, we don't put our best into what we do. We just have a tendency to just do things without even ins inspecting behind ourselves. Some of us, if you look at your Facebook page or your text, uh, some of you just put something on there, you text something, and then somebody's trying to read it and they say, what in the world are they saying? Because the, the lettering, you, you leave out letters, you don't put any commas, you don't put any exclamation marks, or, or, or you don't, it, it's not we're done with excellence. See, spiritual maturity is a way of life. It's a way of being. See, it's a way of being. So we add to our faith virtue, with his, which is excellence. Whatsoever things you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. So often we're trying to please man. I remember I had a, a, little young, a young man that was working with me. Uh, in, in Florida, and uh, uh, he came to the ministry. He had a twin brother, and uh, I had to make a run, and I told him to sweep the parking lot. And when I came back, to me, the parking lot looked worse than before I left. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, I said, young man, I said, I asked you to, to sweep the uh, parking lot. He said, I did. I said, you call it sweeping? Look at all this here. And, and I said to him, listen, young man, the word of God says, whatsoever things you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. And I left. I came back. That parking lot was squeaky clean. I could have dropped some food on it and picked it up and ate it. It was so clean. Because the word of God impacts and changes our life. That word, rhema word, hit his spirit. Yes. And now he's doing this as unto the Lord. And when we do things, everything we do, we must do it as unto the Lord. So we're adding to our faith excellence. If we're going to grow and develop in our spiritual life, but some of you feel like, well, I'm excellent enough. I got, and now, uh, you know, I did, hey, this is just a, well, Hey, this is what, what you see. What you see is what you get. I got a real, you know, you, what you see. You know, and that's our attitude. What you see is what you get. But if we're going to develop and grow in our spiritual life, we're going to have to add excellence to it. And then it says, not only are we going to make this perfect cake, you know, we, we got faith in the cake. Now we're going to put, now we're putting virtue in the excellence. And it says, and to your virtue, knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge is key. The scripture says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Truth alone won't make you free. It's the truth that you know. Come on now. It is through revelation that things are revealed to your spirit that cause you to grow and mature in the things of God. Revelation gives you this overwhelming sensation of a rhema word, life comes to your spirit, and when life comes to you, it gives you joy, it gives you peace, and it causes you to develop in your spiritual uh, life. And so often, we, we, we don't add, we don't spend time in God's word reading for revelation, to get something from God. We just, a lot of times, read just to be reading for obligation. God, I told you I'd read a scripture every day. <laughs> In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. Okay, thank you, God. I'm... <laughs> what did that mean? It did not apply to your life a revelation. Every time you read, you must expect for a revelation to come through the Holy Spirit to impact and empower your life. And it will give you life, I'm telling you. It will give you revelation and it will give you life and you'll be excited and you got to tell somebody. Yeah. Bishop always calling me, telling me about a revelation <laughs> he, he got. Always calling me about something that has taken place that he got a hold to through his study of the word. And all of us, just because we're preachers, but we're just leaders. 
you have a responsibility before God to grow in your spiritual life as well. But that refusal, that rebellion in you will ultimately hinder you and stop you from moving into your greatness. And then you'll wonder why your life doesn't have workability. You wonder why you're not successful. You want to know why things are not happening for you. You have to put things, priorities in order. Can somebody say amen? amen. So we have to add knowledge. And knowledge produces revelation to our spirit. So not only will we need knowledge, but look, it says add to our knowledge. If we're going to grow and put this cake together, and then it tastes like something, we're going to have to put temperance in there which is self-control, being able to shut your mouth when you need to, have the ability to not talk so much and, and run your mouth and say this and say that out of, out of being disrespectful to others and ready to, to just say anything to come to you. I, I'm speaking my mind. <laughs> if you're going to grow spiritually, you can't say everything you think okay and what you see should not anyway be what you say what you see should not never be what you say what you see can be one thing but you speak another because you speak those things that be not as though they were you don't speak what you see man that oh man that, my bank account ain't ain't nothing in here oh this is all I got. Look like I'm a, oh, Jesus. Look, that, is that overdraft right there? <laughs> you don't say it. You know, you see it, but you don't say it. Because the devil can only use what he hear you say. He can't read your mind. Are, are you all in here? He cannot read your mind. So you, you be careful what you say, because the moment you open your mouth, that's when the attack of the enemy launches against you to hinder you. He, don't let him know what you're thinking. Don't by telling him. You already have a strategy and a plan of how you're going to sabotage him, how you're going to win over him, how you're going to stay under the radar and move strategically with guerrilla warfare to wipe them demons and devils out. You got to be strong when it comes to spiritual warfare. Reminds me of the story over in the third world, third world country. Uh, we had a missionary over there, and that missionary was being tormented by demons and devils and demonic activity. Warlocks and, and witches was praying against him. But he was determined to carry the gospel. He was determined to grow in his spiritual life. And those demons and devils at night would attack him, them, them warlocks, and those witches would pray against him and pray against him. It was so bad that at night the bed would shake. And not only did the bed shake, the lights would flicker. They would flicker um, on and off at night. And he would continue to pray regardless. He didn't let them intimidate him and dominate him and manipulate him. He refused to. And it got so bad one night, the lights were flashing and, and the bed was shaking. And then the dresser moved across the side. And then it got so bad that the picture on the wall uh, uh, kind of was slightly tilted. And he said, enough is enough. He tapped into his spirituality because he had grew in his life spiritually. He tapped into the anointed one and his anointing. And then he said, in the name of Jesus, every foul demon and devil, I declare you today powerless in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against you. And I come against you now in Jesus name. And everything stopped. And he said, oh, that's not good enough. He said, in the name of Jesus, you foul demons and devils and demonic activity, come back here 
and put all this stuff back together. And the dresser slid back in his spot, the picture straightened up, the bed stopped shaking, and the lights quit, quit, quit flickering. What are you saying? I'm telling you, when you tap into your spirituality, when you get a hold to the anointed one in his anointing, and you get full of faith and power, when you get full of God's anointing, and you begin to declare and decree, uh, and you begin to speak those things that be not as though they were, when you understand your position in God, uh, when you understand that you've been called and equipped and anointed by God, uh, you begin to tell demons and devils, those blessing blockers. You command over them. You take charge over them. You rise in the authority of the anointed one and his anointing and tear his kingdom down. Yeah. Yeah, but that's when you're growing spiritually. Not coming to church. And I'm not saying don't come to church. Because some of you use that. Pastor said, we, if you don't want to grow spiritually, you don't, even, you don't have to come to church. No, that's not what I said. I said, if you want to grow spiritually, you have to develop your spiritual life. You have to add to your life. You got to put some substance there. You got to add. You know, you got to have something working for you. So, building this making this cake rather. So we then now understand that we must have control. We must have temperance, which is the ability to take control, and to, to be disciplined, you know? Discipline. And, and discipline is a form of seeing your actions and what you do. You know, when you're disciplined, you're able to, to know when to talk, when not to talk, know when to go, and know when not to go, know what to do and how to do it. You're disciplined because you thought it out. You're a rational person. You got the ability to reason. You know, people with mental problems lose that ability to reason. That's what a lot of the problem is. They lose the ability to reason. And you can't sit down and reason. You ever try to sit down and reason with somebody and you say, man, they got a mental problem. Because <laughs> <laughs> they can't reason with. That's what causes people to be mentally insane. You lose that. Well, that comes from exercising your rights as a person in discipline. That's why meditation, I hope all of us get alone for a few moments to meditate. You know, it, it's, it's powerful to get alone and get in touch with your feelings and your emotions. Because some of us don't know a lot of times w why we act like we do. We just fly off the handle, you know, get upset, throw dishes, throw pots and pans, temper tantrums, throw phones. I seen them throw phones right in the church. You know, yeah, mad, you know, or frustrated. No discipline in their life. And, and all of us have faced that where we are out of control at times in our emotions. But meditation will help you to get in touch with you and your feelings and what you think and what you shouldn't think and what you don't need to think and what you ain't got no business thinking. Because <laughs> with us already always listening, because your mind, you can't shed it off. 1,400 negative words come to your mind a minute that you're fighting. That's why you're having, some of you having difficulties this morning because the negative data that comes to your mind based on your past, based on circumstances, based on situations, and based on things that happen. And, and they, that computer, unless you learn how to delete from your brain and cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, 
unless we learn how to delete that, it'll keep popping up. And we don't know why. It, because we never really squashed it. You know, we got to cast down. The scripture says casting down imaginations. Imaginations is images. You know, that's why pornography is a, a tool against men. Because you see that thing, that thing will pop back in your head. You go, oh, Jesus, what is it? <laughs> yeah, because it's the images, the image that, but we have to cast down imaginations. And every high thing that's purposing to exalt itself against the knowledge of Christ. And we have to bring it into captivity. We have to bring it into control. We got to control. Listen, don't let your mind just think what it want to think. Amen. Yeah, pastor, you know, I don't, you know, I don't like his preaching this morning. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he, he picking on me today. We had a situation in the church. I was preaching a message. A young man thought I was picking on him. No, I don't pick on anybody. I preach the word. Amen. 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 Right out of the book. <laughs> I didn't create this. Amen. It's right here in black and white. All right. Oh, I got five minutes. I'm going to have to speed up. Though. Okay, here we go. So we add temperance, patience, 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 patience. You got to add that to your spiritual life. Oh, be anxious for nothing, but in all prayer and supplication, make your request known unto God. Give it to him and trust him, knowing that cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Amen. Live by faith and not by sight. Amen. Believe that if God loves you enough, he got your best interest at heart. Amen. You know, the children of Israel, that's why they never entered, that first generation never entered into the promised land. Because they were not convinced that God was, had their best interest at heart. And if we don't believe that God has our best interest at heart, we are not going to succeed. I told Bishop today when he came through the door, I said, I, you just showed me that God loves me. He brought you in here just to encourage me. Amen. God thinking of me. And you have to have those times in your life where you know that God's thinking of you. God was thinking of me this weekend to take me away, all expense paid trip to to. Myrtle Beach. I don't know if y'all, but it was fun to me. Yeah. God was thinking of me. God has my best interest at heart. So why not have his? <laughs> Amen. So I got to have his best interest at heart. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying we got to know that God is for us. And if God be for us, everybody else might as well be. If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us. But we got to be convinced that God is for us. Okay, I'm wrapping this up. Here. So add patience, the ability to relax. Okay, add that to your spirituality. To relax. Just take it easy. So not only must we have the ability to relax if we're going to build or create or make this awesome cake and putting all of these ingredients in it. We have to add patience into the patience. Godliness. Godliness. What is godliness? It's the ability to reverence the Lord Jesus Christ and live life powerfully, whole and complete. It's the ability to reverence the presence of the anointed one and his anointing and to not do those things that are ungodly that displeases God. You want to make God happy. <laughs> you want God to be happy with you. You want to know you are pleasing God. You want to know that God is smiling, looking down from heaven, smiling on you, Erica. He looking, he's smiling. He said, I'm so proud of you. You, you were here early for Talk Back Sunday. I'm so proud of you. That's growth and development in your life. Yeah. yeah Amen. Amen. But so often we can decline and we're not careful. And we go backwards. No. You want to press. 
You want to press. That's why the scripture says press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. So to your godliness, brotherly kindness, to be kind to one another, loving to one another, not backbiting, talking about tearing each other down, ridiculing one another, thinking we're better than, haughty, arrogant, cocky. Uh, uh, when people come through the door, who they think they are and think we're better than. No, the only thing that separates you from the man in the gutter is the blood of Jesus. <laughs> so you should be praising God that you're not that person that's in the gutter, that's on the streets of, 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 of Chicago or, or Charlotte or Detroit or anywhere. Thank God that you're not there because it's only by the grace of God that you're where you are at. Last, no, brotherly kindness, last but not least, love, charity. Love has to be spread abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Listen, if we make this cake and we have all the previous ingredients and love is left out, then we got a pitiful cake. Even though we have all the above, if one of these ingredients is left out of our spiritual life, our life is not complete. What are you saying? I'm saying for your spiritual maturity, add all of these this week to your life. Take the time this week and make sure all of these ingredients, all of these attributes or all of these, I should say, all of these components are in your life and they're working. Because they can be in your life, but they can be dormant. Stir them up. Stir these up in your life. And you will see. And as we're making this cake, we're stirring all of it up. We don't put all the ingredients. Come on now, stir with me, y'all. We're stirring it up. We're mixing it up. Okay. Now we're going to take it to the oven which is the throne room of Almighty God. We're going to take ourselves and put ourselves in the oven of God and let God make us. Let him mold us. Let him shape us. And when we come out of that oven, we come out smelling good, looking good, and tasting good for the glory of God. As I close, I'm encouraging today, don't refuse to grow spiritual. Don't let yourself get sidetracked with attitudes that hinder you. Don't let attitudes and disposition and anger and all the negative emotions attach themselves to your life. Listen, I'm closing with this. Know this that all of the negative emotions that you feel or that you go through, the moment you put joy, that emotion in that space, that negative emotion has to disappear. It can, they cannot live in the same space. Fear, frustration cannot live in the same emotion of joy and peace. They can't live in that space. So you have to evict them because they will cause your cake to crumble. You don't want your cake to crumble. You want your cake to taste good because you got all the fruit of the spirit on your life and people can look at your life and they can pick some of the fruit off and they can pick all of the nine fruit of the spirit off of your tree, off of you. Some love, some patience, some long suffering, some faith off your tree. Don't let your tree be barren. I got to re read this scripture, the last part of that again, and I'm done. For, for if these things be in you and abound, 
they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. But he that lacked these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he's been purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather in the brother, listen to me and I'm closing, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fail or never fall. Wow. Guaranteed success if you would just let God cook you and let him make you. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website, FWC Charlotte, and consider giving a generous gift so we can continue the ministry. We're touching lives around the world, and you can partner with us and help us make a difference. Thank you so very much for your support, and wish God's very best to you. Well, I'm excited uh, this morning uh, after Thanksgiving. We had an awesome, wonderful celebration of Thanksgiving. How many enjoyed their Thanksgiving holiday? Yes, wonderful. Just great. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to continue my series on blessing blockers because all of us understand here at Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte that our job is to get heaven down on earth. Amen. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes. But we realize that we have demonic activity, satanic spirits, and demonic demons and devils that come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. They come to hoodwink us and bamboozle us and jack hijack us and mess our life up so our life doesn't have workability. But Paul says, I am not ignorant of Satan's devices, and neither are your pastor. He's not ignorant of Satan's devices. As a matter of fact, I ran around with him for 10 years. He was my ace boon coon. We were partners in crime. We were partners together in, in uh, doing things that were contrary to the word of God. But he... he lost me when he tried to kill me. And when he tried to kill me, that was it. We departed and I separated from him and I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and it's been ongoing uh, all, all the way with Jesus all the way. October 15, 1982, we decided to go separate ways because I realized that he didn't mean me any good. And so I'm fully aware of his devices and his tricks and his schemes and his strategy. That's why the word of God says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so that's our battle in the heavenly realm that we have to get heaven down on earth and those demonic activities in the heaven are purposing to hinder us and work against us. Because the word of God says that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We've already been blessed. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you already blessed. You are already blessed, but the job is to get heaven down on earth so we can live life powerfully, live life intentional, and live life on purpose. So I want to deal with a blessing blocker that the enemy uses to trick us, to hinder us from, from moving into our greatness and becoming extraordinary and becoming powerful for kingdom living, and that's comparing ourselves to others. 
that is a blessing blocker if I ever seen one. The enemy will cause us to try to keep up with the Joneses. You know, one, if the Joneses get a new car, well, my goodness, if the Joneses can get a new car, I'm going to get a new car. And uh, then all of a sudden, your new car gets repossessed. And uh, you wonder why? Because the blessings of the Lord are rich and add if no sorrow. If God didn't give it to you, it may, the enemy may take it. But if God give it to you, my God, no demon and no devil will be able to take it from you. The blessings of the Lord are rich and add if no sorrow. So turn your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 when you have it, say amen. And I want us to get present to the fact that we have to not compare ourselves to others because you are unique. You are the only you in the world. You were created in the image and the likeness of God. You favor God. You look like God. And I mean, you have co-created power with God. And you are another speaking force in the world to declare and decree, to be a commander of the morning. When you rise in the morning, you command your day, amen. You don't let the day dictate to you what your day is gonna be like. You are a commander, amen. And as my wife alluded to, we have a command tower or a command mindset that our brain is the commanding uh, force that we can use against the demons and devils. That's the control tower is our mind. And our mind's a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> Amen. So we have to, when we rise in the morning, we have to command our morning. We have to declare and decree what's possible. But see, uh, during this journey to our greatness, the enemy as we're journeying, journeying, as we're taking this journey together and going through life, our adversary, the enemy, tries his very best to lure us into his traps, into his schemes and his tactics. And one of them is to compare ourselves to others. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, do you have it? Say amen. amen. Let's look at verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number of compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves and comparing themselves amongst themselves are not wise. The apostle Paul makes it very clear to the church that one of the most deadly things that you can do to hinder your life is to compare yourself to others. You, if you're going to compare yourself to anyone, you compare yourself to our mentor, the greatest mentor in the world, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you want to compare who you are and whose you are with God, you have to then look, see yourself in the mirror, but as you look in the mirror, you see Christ. You see yourself in the image of Christ. The apostle Paul said it like this. Uh, I am crucified with Christ in the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The apostle Paul knew how important it was to have the image and the mind of Christ. The word of God declares to us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be with equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant and came in the likeness of us and being found in fashion as us, he humbled himself and came obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So we're to have the mind of Christ. We're to think like Christ. And so if we're going to compare ourselves to anyone or anybody, we compare ourselves to Christ. And when we're stuck in a situation and we don't know what to do, we must ask ourselves the question, what would Christ do? In the midst of a situation where we don't know how to handle a certain situation, we don't know how to handle a certain individual who has wronged us, who has mistreated us, who is backbiting us, who is coming against us, who is trying to hinder us, who's trying to stop us, who's trying to work against us. You go to your Christ and you say, God, how would you handle this situation? And you respond to that person the way that Christ will. And it's like a blessing in disguise for you because the word of God says that, that uh, if you begin to 
to, to come against them and you begin to handle them, then it works against you. It will boomerang at you. But if you let Christ handle it, if you let him take care of it, God will fight your battle for you. All you have to do is stand still and know that he's God. Know that he'll fight your battle. You don't have to fight in the battle. So often we think we have to fight. Jehoshaphat, he learned a secret. When he didn't know what to do, he sought the Lord. And when he sought the Lord, the Lord says, stand still and watch me move on your behalf. I'm here to declare to you, when people come against you, when people backbite you, when people tear you down, uh, don't retaliate to them. Uh, you give them to the Lord. Uh, you give them to God. And when God takes them, he can handle them much better than you can. Uh, they would prefer that you handle them than God. Uh, they would rather you get them than God. Because uh, when God gets them, they're God for, for the glory of God. <laughs> Amen. So Paul encourages us not to compare ourselves to others because when we compare ourselves to others, then we minimize who we are. When we compare ourselves to others, we put limitations on ourselves and we lose the fact of who we are, our uniqueness in who we are. You were created in the image and the likeness of God and you have an assignment. There's an assignment that only you can fulfill on this earth. You were created for a purpose. You were created for a destiny. You were created to accomplish. You have an assignment that only you can bring to the earth. And so often people died in defeat, never fulfilling their God-given purpose never fulfilling their assignment. They were hoodwinking, bamboozled, and tricked uh, by looking at circumstances and comparing themselves to people. And then they took on others' ideas and they took on others' identity and they began to be a copycat of others to lose themselves uh, only to get lost and never be able to find themselves. And they died in defeat, never finding themselves. They got so lost uh, in trying to be somebody else. Uh, I got to admit, I've been there. Oh my God, I remember when I first became an evangelist. I wanted to be Jimmy Swagger. Oh my goodness. I used to get in the mirror and imitate. I can tell you, I would hold that Bible. Oh my God. Being Jimmy Swagger, to me he was just an awesome evangelist and I wanted to be an awesome evangelist. And then when God told me that he could not anoint who I wanted to be, God said, I can't anoint who you want to be. I got to anoint you. And then God anointed me and empowered me. And I began to preach the word of God uh, in my own anointing, in my own power. And it revolutionized my life. Uh, and I'm a brand new person in God because I, I speak what thus said the Lord. And I depend upon God for my anointing. Uh, I don't compare myself to T.D. Jakes. Uh, I don't compare myself to Oral Roberts. I don't compare myself to Jimmy Swagger. I compare myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and if I preach uh, as an itinerary preacher and as a pastor and a teacher of God like the, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, then I know without a shadow of a doubt that I'm pleasing God. Uh, I'm making my God happy. Uh, he's looking down from heaven and smiling and saying, uh, you're fulfilling my assignment. Uh, you're not fulfilling somebody else's assignment because all too often uh, we're fulfilling somebody else's purpose uh, and we're fulfilling somebody else's assignment. We're doing someone else's business business because when you don't be yourself uh, and you take on the, the, the attitude of doing someone else's assignment uh, you're losing out on the assignment that God called you to do uh, you have to do what the Lord Jesus Christ empowered your life to do uh, once you get on fire for God and get anointed and appointed uh, and be enthused and infused uh, the joy of the Lord is your strength uh, and you have the peace of God that passes all understanding because you know you're in the center of God's will. In hell or high water, storms of trials, difficulties may come. Uh, oh my God, uh, all Satan and attack can come upon you, but you know you're in the center of God's will. You know you're in the purpose of with God, uh, and you know this too shall pass, uh, and you just stand still and know that God is going to move on your behalf, and God's going to see you through, and you know no demon and devil going to cause you to drown. Uh, they're not going to cause you to sink, because uh, you 
you're going to stand firm in the liberty where Christ has made you free of, and you're standing there as a king's kid, knowing who you are and whose you are, knowing that you created in the image and the likeness of God, uh, and that you favor God, that you look like God, and God is happy with you, and you're fulfilling the God-given assignment and your purpose, and you're not walking around trying to be somebody that you're not. Uh, you're not walking around trying to be a uh, phony and trying to uh, fool people thinking you somebody that you're not. Uh, you know that you're somebody because you are in the image and the likeness of God and you're doing the will of God and you're being favored by God and God's anointing is upon you uh, and you'll find favor with God uh, and you'll find favor with man uh, and you're doing the work of God uh, and you're pleasing God uh, and you're making God happy uh, and God is smiling upon you and the blessings of God are flowing in your life uh, and you're prosperous uh, and you are blessed of the Lord and highly favored for the glory of God. I'm coming. But one of the biggest problems is we have a tendency to compare ourselves with others. And when we compare ourselves with others, people's opinion of, our, of us does not define who we are. That's right. Other people's opinion of you. See, so often deposits been made in our life from other people. And those opinions of us have a tendency to dictate to us who we are. And we feel less than. We feel inferior because we don't feel like we're measuring up to other people's opinion of us. And when you measure yourself with other people's opinion, you're putting a challenge on your life and weakening who you are. Because God is going to be your back. He's going to be, have your back. God is going to be there for you. God is going to help you through every storm, every trial, every situation. All you have to do is depend upon him and make him Lord of your life. What is Lord? Lord means owner. That he owns you. Well, ain't nobody going to own me. <laughs> I ain't going to let nobody rule me. But I'm here to tell you, you were bought with a price. You were bought and paid for with the precious blood of Jesus. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And because Jesus paid the price for you, then he is the owner of your life. And he's twice, we're twice God's property. Once because he made us, Second, because he redeemed us. He bought us back from Satan. He bought us back from the demonic activities that owned you at one time. We were sold out when Adam committed treason and sold us out. We belonged to Satan. And then Jesus came and gave up his life and pray, paid for our life with his precious blood. And because we're bought with a price, he is Lord. He's the owner of our life. And people's opinion of you doesn't define who you are. That's right. Don't let people's opinion define who you are, what people say about, girl, you know you ain't all that. Girl, I don't know why you trying to be all cute and everything. You know you ain't that good looking, you know? You ain't got it going on like you think, you know? Why you think you, uh, why you think you all that? You know, I can tell you think you all that the way you walk and the way you talk. You think you Mrs. Uppity. You ought to come on down off of your cloud, baby. You know, and we can have those deposits put in our life, and then we can begin to try to come down to other people's level. We can then begin to want to shrink who we are to please people. But people's opinion of you doesn't define who you are. But so often we go by what other people say about us, their opinion, which is their opinion, and they're entitled to their opinion, but how you receive their opinion. And furthermore, you probably didn't ask for their opinion. <laughs> but then they made a deposit on you, and it was a serpent seed. You know what a serpent seed is? A serpent seed is when somebody plants something into your mind. And it stays there. And then all of a sudden, it's watered. And it's germinated. And it takes root. And it begins to grow. Like say, oh, you are just not all that. You are, you know, you ain't good looking at all. And your attitude stink. And you ain't all that. I don't know why you think you all that. 
And then all of a sudden, somebody, you run into somebody else, and they say, what makes you think you all that? Then it starts, they start feeding that serpent seed. And that serpent seed begin to grow. And then your self-esteem, your self-image of who you are begins to dwindle. Because now it's being validated by somebody else that the enemy sent to water what was already spoken to you that you didn't dismiss. Well, you should have dismissed it immediately and cast it down. That's why the scripture says, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ and bring it to captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. If Christ didn't say it, it doesn't matter. If Christ didn't validate it, it doesn't matter. Don't let others validate who you are. You know, so often we want folks to stroke us and make us feel like we're all that. I remember when I first started preaching, boy, I'm telling you what, I thought I was God's gift to man. And I'm telling you what, I went to a church, took an assignment there and started preaching. And uh, after the service, I thought I had told a place up, man. I'm saying I brought it, I brought it, I brought it down, I dropped it down, I dropped it while it was hot. <laughs> And so, uh, I'm, you know, at that time, I stood at the back door and shook the people's hand as they would leave. And, you know, I think I was a little bit on the prideful side, you know, just a little bit. And so, uh, I'm uh, greeting the people as they leave out. And so, as this one young lady came, came to, as she was leaving, I shook her hand with this humble, pious look. And uh, she says to me, Reverend, when you going to really preach? <laughs> I'm like, what do you really preach? I thought I tore the house down. Boy, you talking about busting my bubble. You talking about, uh, hey, I went through for a long, but it humbled me. That was God used this lady to humble me. Now, I'm not talking about people that are planting seeds in your life to better you. I'm talking about people who are tearing you down that's perpetrated by demons and devils. That to hinder you, deposits that are made into your life that you carry. See, because keep in mind, as little children, or when we were young, even in our mother's womb, we were comfortable. I mean, we were in our mother's womb for nine months, just chilling, got it made in the shade. Life is great, man, three meals a day, comfortable water bed splashing. You got it made. And then all of a sudden, our world is interrupted. When it, after nine months, we're just chilling out in the water bed and oh! And then the world, we're faced with the world. And then the doctor says, bam, you experience pain. And you say, what is this? What has happened to me now? And so we then have to go through life with, with deposits that's made in our life from that point on. And everything that was said to us, everything that was done to us is recorded in our memory. I know some individuals who struggle today from issues that they had in growing up as children. They haven't been able to master the problems and the difficulties that they face. And so they compare themselves to others as to help them come out of what they're in, but yet to compare themselves to others is not wise. They need to compare themselves to Christ. Amen. Because Amen. Christ is the one who can change you to that which he designed you to be from the very beginning. Amen. He's the one that can deliver you. He's the one that can set you free. But so often we're looking for man to help us and assist us, but God is the one that can move mightily in our lives. Amen. People's perception of us does not dictate our future. People's per perception of you does not dictate your future. You, we're so often looking, oh, you think I'm going to make it in life? No, honey, child, you ain't going <laughs> to. You're done. You know that? I don't even know why you think you could be something. Don't you know you can't sing, you can't, you can't dance, you can't model. You know, you can't do nothing. You know? I mean, look at you. Just look at you. How, how would you think you're going to ever be anything the way you look? You know, you're a loser. Don't you, don't you know that you're a loser? 
But that's their perception of you because to them, they see you a certain way. But they don't see the God that's inside of you that can, at any given moment, your life is subject to change. At any given moment, God can open the windows of heaven and bless you with finances and money and resources to shift you from where you are to take you where God wants you to be. It's subject to change at any moment. But because so many people have put so many negative deposits in their perception of us, uh, you know, can just really throw us off. Especially if you grow up in a home and the parents told you, you know, you're good for nothing. You're sorry. You, you ain't going to never be nothing. Your daddy wasn't nothing. Your granddaddy wasn't nothing. And you ain't going to be nothing. You know, that deposit in your life. And then you go around in life comparing yourselves to others instead of comparing yourself and looking at the mirror and seeing Christ. The key is to allow yourself to look in the mirror and see yourself in the image and the likeness of God. To begin to build your confidence level and your self-worth and your self-value. Because the enemy comes to devalue you. He comes to make you feel less than. For you to want to give up and quit and throw in the towel and say it's impossible. I can't do it. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. And I can just give it up because it's not going to work for me. So not only a people's opinion of you does not define who you are or people's perspective of you doesn't dictate your future, but what people think about you does not determine the real you. What people think about you is not the real you. But we can have a tendency to think that that's us, the real us, by what people say. We see ourselves because words paint pictures. And when we see ourselves, we see it based on the words that we understand. And when people tell you that you're not something and that you're unable to accomplish, we think that's the real us. But it's not the real us. It's only people's perception, people's interpretation of us. And then we compare ourselves to what they are saying and we say, you know what? <laughs> we, you know what? I think they're right. Mm. And we start agreeing with them because none of you, whether you know this or not, not one of you have ever seen yourself. None of you have seen yourself, the real you. All you see is a reflection. I'm looking at the real you. I see the real you. All you see is a reflection of the mirror. You have never seen yourself. All you see is a reflection. That's all you see. When you look in the mirror, and in that tenth of a second, when you look in the mirror, that enemy, the demon, can show you a different you, and you can get tricked and hoodwinked and bamboozled just in the moment of that mirror it's coming back to you. But not with me, because I see the real you. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying to you, don't let other people's opinion in their, in their, the way they perceive you interfere with who you know you are. You know who you are. You know you created in the image of God. You know you were fearfully and wonderfully made. You know that you're the apple of God's eye. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you know that you and God is the majority. Yeah. You, know, you know God before you everybody else might as well be. But the enemy will make you think something contrary because of that mirror, that faulty sense of seeing the image of yourself. The enemy will deceive you in that split second, deceive you. Oh, you ain't all that look good looking. You know, look at your face. You know, you think you're cute, but I got news for you. You ain't, you ain't cute at all. As a matter of fact, you downright ugly. And then you will, then, your self-worth, self-esteem is gone. You got to look in the mirror and know that that image of Christ is bouncing back at you. Uh, that image of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and, and his power and his anointing. Uh, oh, man. Uh, and then you got to have that Shekinah glory uh, like, like uh, Moses had when he went up on the mountain. Uh, and he, uh, the, his countenance began to glow with the radiant of the Holy Spirit and the Shekinah glory. You need the joy of the Lord in your heart. You need the joy of the Lord in your spirit that it 
radiates uh, and beauty comes from within uh, and that beauty within uh, it comes through you and it bounces off of that mirror uh, and that radiant uh, of the joy of the Holy Ghost uh, and that Shekinah glory bounces off that mirror and hits you uh, and you begin to feel good about yourself because you know uh, I am in the image of God I favor God I look like God and I am a handsome young man and I am a beautiful young lady and no matter what anybody says uh, their interpretation of me doesn't matter their opinion doesn't matter and I'm not going to compare myself to nobody but I'm going to only compare myself to God uh, I'm not letting a blessing blocker come in my life uh, and hinder me and cause me to feel less than uh, cause me to feel devalued uh, cause me to feel like I'm nobody I know I'm somebody uh, and I know I'm in the image and I favor God and God is with me and I'm mighty in the hand of God and I put my heart and I put my life in the master's hand uh, and I belong to God uh, he bought me and paid for me because he suffered bled and died on Calvary's cross uh, he was buried uh, and in three days uh, went down the hell and stripped the devil of all of his power and all of his authority and came up by that grave saying all power all power all power has been given to me and he gave me a set of keys uh, he gave me authority and I can bind and loose uh, and I can bind Satan and I can bind demonic activity and I can take charge of my life uh, I don't have to listen to people uh, I don't have to listen to what they say uh, I don't have to compare myself to anybody because I'm out to make God happy uh, I'm out to please him uh, I'm out for him to get glory I'm out to see him lifted up. I'm out to give him praise. I'm out to magnify him. And that's what I'm going to do, whether anybody else does it or not. I'm coming. Last but not least, people's interpretation of you is not who you are. Know that. Their interpretation is not who you are. You have to know and understand who you are and whose you are. And you compare yourself by the word of God. You compare yourself by the image of Almighty God. Never compare yourself with the Joneses. Never allow yourself to listen and deposit what people say about you. Never get discouraged and let people hurt your feelings. Never let them hurt your feelings with saying things that's contrary of who God says you are. And when they come to you in closing, when they come to you with that, say, I don't see that in God's word. I don't see where God said that. Where did he say that at? Can you tell me what chapter and verse that is? Huh? Because uh, I don't see that. I see contrary. I see what God says about who I am. I, and I know God loves me. He loves me so much that he gave his life for me. If I was the only person on earth in Jesus' day, he would have died for just me. I'm just that special. So I don't know what you're talking about. Whose report will you believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website, FWC Charlotte, and consider giving a generous gift so we can continue the ministry. We're touching lives around the world, and you can partner with us and help us make a difference. Thank you so very much for your support and wish God's very best to you.
I am really excited uh, to share with you today uh, a continuation of my Blessing Blocker series that, how many are being blessed by the Blessing Blocker series? Wonderful. Well, today, um, I want to minister to you a Blessing Blocker uh, that I believe will revolutionize and change your life and empower your life, and that is uh, a discernment. And I want to minister the blessing blocker as a lack of discernment. And uh, discernment is the ability to make good judgments. And so often we make judgments based upon our experience, our background, our education. And uh, we don't really discern. And because we don't discern and it go haywire and uh, things fall apart and we want to know what went wrong. Relationships fall apart. You think that the person is with you forever. You think that they're dedicated and they're, and they're committed to you and they're part of your life and you love on them and you give them all of your love and you don't get the same thing back. You know, it, it's 70-30 uh, uh, or 60-40. But we're talking about a 50-50 love. Uh, and more so a hundred-fold love or a hundred on each end. That there's a total commitment of love, unconditional love. And, and when you have unconditional love in your life, you think everybody else have it as well. And that may or may not be the case. And you may discern some things and pick up some things, but you ignore them. You may ignore some things that you, you pick up on the radar, but you say, oh, no, 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 I'm missing God. That ain't God. So I want us to get present to the fact of making good judgment decisions and having a spirit of discernment, the ability to make good judgment calls and make good judgment and to learn when people come to your life, what are they for? You got to ask yourself when people come into your life, what are they there for? And we can assume that they're for one thing in reality it's another. And we can be deceived and hoodwinked and bamboozled and tricked and we allow people in our circle or we allow people to get close to us or we allow people to be a part of our lives and we don't understand their motives. And we think that all their motives are pure. We think that they mean us well. We think that they're going to stand with you forever and they got your best interests at heart and all of that. And then you find out when it's all said and done, there was a hidden agenda that you knew not about. <laughs> <laughs> so today, as I start my foundation, is that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And as uh, our very own First Lady alluded to, that we are seated in heavenly places. Amen. That God has seated us far above principalities and powers and demons and devils and demonic activity. We're, we're seated there. But if you don't know where your seat belongs, you know, you come into this place, you don't know where you're supposed to sit then you could sit in the wrong section. But you are seated in heavenly places with Christ, far above principalities. That means that you are an overcomer. That means demons and devils and demonic activity should not have any play in your life. They should not dominate. They should not rule. They should not control over who you are. You should have the ability to control your life and make decisions based upon your empowerment that God has given to your life that makes you more than a conqueror. Know that you can do all things through Christ who will strengthen you. Know that you're the head and not the tail. Know that, you, that uh, if God before you, everybody else might as well be. These are foundational stones that your life must be anchored. And what happens so often is we don't realize that we're fighting a spiritual battle and we're fighting a natural battle. Because the scripture says that our battle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in the high places. So where you're seated up there in high places spiritually, so is demons and devils, but you're seated above them. But sometimes we don't know that and understand that. And we think we're sitting around with demons and devils, but we're seated above them. And so the enemy comes and goes around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he can destroy. See who can hoodwink, bamboozle, and trick, and lure into his trap to think that you're less than, to devalue you, to make you feel like you're a loser, to make you feel like you're a failure, to, to make you feel like you can't conquer, that you, you ain't all that. Who you think you are? You know, you ain't nobody. 
And you say, uh, you know, I don't know why I thought I was somebody. I ain't nobody. And you buy into Satan's trap. You buy into his schemes. And so our job is to get heaven down on earth. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So heaven is already is a done deal. The word is settled in heaven and God has settled everything. Your life has already been laid out. Now you walk into your greatness. You walk and fulfill the plan of God in your life. But what happens so often, people are put in our life and we are connected with them and they influence us good, bad, or ugly. And so th they can have a tendency to uh, hoodwink us or trick us and we get close to them and we make decisions based on them and not based on ourselves. And so we have to discern. So I want to minister to you a blessing blocker is the lack of the ability to discern, to discern people, to discern their motives, to discern what they're up to. And we can get confused at why people are in our lives. And so today it's go I'm going to help us to have a spirit of discernment because there's basically four types of people that come into your life. Some of them, one of them is uh, a, a constituent. Some of them are Conrad's. Some of them are on the outer uh, circle and uh, some of them are confidants and confidants are what you want in your life. Confidence are people who love you unconditionally. It's not based on what you do or what you don't do. It's not based on uh, how you act or how you don't act. They love you. They are for you and they're for what you're for. They're not against you at anything, but they will put you in your place. They're not, they'll tell you when you're wrong because they love you and they have your best interest at heart. And, and, and their confidants, I mean, they, they are dedicated to you. I mean, you can't do anything wrong. You get in trouble, they get in trouble with you. You go to jail, they go get, bail you out. I mean, you go to the hospital, they're in the hospital for you. They are in your life because they love you. And they are for you. And for what you are up to and the difference you are to make. Those are the people who committed to you. They are dedicated, but you don't have a lot of them in life. Those are not a lot of people that you have because people come and go in your life. And, and for if they get mad at you, those are not confidants. If they get mad at you, they are not confidants. If they leave and walk out of your life, then they were never for you. But these people that God sent your way are confidants that just are loyal. These people are so dedicated to you that they're so faithful, they're so committed, and uh, you can't do nothing wrong. And then when you do something wrong, they're going to love you through it, and, they're, you know, and you don't have to walk around with a mask. Those are the kind of people you can be yourself. You know, you don't have to get tired. You know, I'm glad when everybody go because I'm tired of wearing this mask fronting in front of everybody because I don't want them to know who I am. So around them, around the people who are not confident, you putting on this air, you putting on this front, you smiling and grinning and everything, and you, you're worn out when they leave. But confidence, you're not. You're relaxed around them, you yourself, you know. If you get mad and cuss and say something, they're not going to say, oh, you're going to hell. <laughs> they're going to say, are you all right? They're concerned about you. These are people that have your best interests at heart. That's what you want in your life. And if you can't have that, then you don't need any of the other. Well, you're going to have to deal with the others. But that's the problem is there's other groups of people that you're going to have to deal with. And, and Jesus had 12, but only three was confidants. Peter, James, and John was the only one that he could trust to go up on the Mount Transfiguration and see the glory of him, see him shining. See, he, those were the only three he could take up there. The rest of them, he had to keep them back because they were constituents. And constituents are people who, uh, they're different than the people of, who are your comrades. Or excuse me, they're different from the people who are your confidants. These, these are different people. A constituents are people who are, are for you for what you, they're for you as long as you're for what they're for. As long as you're for what they're for, 
then they okay. The moment constituents are the moment you're not going in their direction, the moment you don't make them happy, the moment they fall out with you, they're gone. They're, they're going to leave you high and dry. If there are people that come into your life, they're committed, they're, they're committed to what you're for, but they're not committed to you. So <laughs> the, moment, the moment they find somebody that can get them quicker and faster, especially if there are people who are driven by success or they're driven by destiny. People who are driven by destiny, if you're not getting them where they want to go quick enough, they're going to leave you high and dry. They come for what they can, can get. They're not there for you. Those are our, our, our constituents. And you have to know that. And the problem is that you have, and I have had, is you don't know the difference. You think they, because they look the same, they talk the same, <laughs> they act the same, that they're the same. But they're not. Their motive, the key is you got to know and judge and have the ability to know their motives. You got to be able to understand what's motivating them. Because they look the same. <laughs> they look the same. And, and, and they're going to be in your life as well. But you got to know they're only there for, for you for what, what they can get. They're not there just for you. They're for what you're for. And if you change what you're for, then they'll switch up on you and leave you high and dry. Because they're coming for to be a part of what you're for. See? And so, uh, constituents, uh, you got to be able to know that they could leave any minute. They will come and go. But you don't, you, when they get, you got to welcome them when they come and welcome them when they go. You can't get bent out of shape, crying and everything. Oh, you're leaving me. Oh, no, you got to rejoice that they're gone. Even though you love them and you sit, give them their blessings, but if they can't walk with you, you got to move on. You can't just lay down and die and quit and give up because they're now feeling like that, uh, that they can't walk with you. Right. you see? And so Jesus had all of those. And, and as a matter of fact, Judas okay, was what Jesus was for. He wasn't for Jesus. He was for what Jesus can do. Because in the beginning, it said that um, the concern was, when will you restore the, the kingdom of Israel? Judas was a person who was concerned about destiny, uh, but he was concerned about his own selfishness and his own, his own, own ego to fulfill his purpose. He had a hidden agenda, you see. And so often people have a hidden agenda, okay? And when they come to you and their agenda is hidden and you can't see it. You can't see it. Jesus trusted Judas. But Judas was there for what he could get. He was there only to see the kingdom of God Take, take charge and rise up and overthrow the Roman government because it was said that the Messiah was going to come and when the Messiah would come, he would overthrow the government. So he's looking, Judas was looking forward to, to Jesus coming and overthrowing the government. And when that didn't happen, he didn't see it happen quick enough, hey, he sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. He, he bailed out because he didn't see his vision taking place. And when people don't see their vision taking place in your ministry, they'll sell you out. And they will go to some other ministry that they feel like they can get there quicker. They can get there faster. They feel like that they can uh, move forward with accomplishing what their agenda is because you ain't moving fast enough for them. So Jesus was not moving fast enough for Judas. So Judas betrayed him based on the fact that, hey, I'm, 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 
I'm for you as long as what you're for is for me. <laughs> and you have those that are, are, are selfish and self-centered and egotistical. It's all about me, myself, and I. They're selfish. And their agenda is selfish. But to the contrary, you have those confidants. Those confidants who are there and will stay there. Then you got another group, and that's Conrad's. Now, Conrad's are not for you, or they're not even for what you're for. They're just fighters. They fight for what you're against. Whatever you're against, they'll jump on the bandwagon and they'll fight with you. And you will mistake them for being confident because be confidants because they fighting for you. I remember at 18 years old, I was running stations for Shell Oil Company. And this little hot pants girl would walk by the station. That somehow captured my attention. And I was working at the gas station and it was dark and I had sent, I was the assistant manager and I had sent individuals home and I was closing up the station. And as I was out there closing up the station, a car drives up and it was three guys in there and they, they, they saw the oil and they said, how much is this oil? And I said, 69 cents, I think that's what it was back then. And they said, what if we take it? I said, oh no, you ain't taking it. And my God, what I wanna say that for? Them three guys wrecked me. They beat me so I had to wear sunglasses, I had scars on, I mean, they beat me. But in the midst of that, a young lady, that hot pants lady, came out of nowhere and told them, get off of him. And she called to get them off of me. Well, I fell in love with her because I thought she was a confidant. She was only fighting for me because she was fighting for what she stood for, and that's uh, justice, or not to treat a man uh, or, or just abuse somebody uh, that for, for nothing. I hadn't done anything. So that's what she was standing for, but I'm, I misread that. I read that for this is a confidant. This is a person who is loyal. This, I mean, I began to perceive that this is who I needed in life. This is the person that I want in my life. She came to my rescue because she fought for me. And so we can get confused when people fight for us, but they're fighting for what we're against. They're not fighting for us. She was never fighting for me. But I read in that she was fighting for me and that she was for me. She was never for me, trust me. Okay. She never had my best interests at heart, trust me but yet ruined my life for a period of time because I misread her agenda. Her motive was not my motive, motivation. And so we can easily think when Conrad's come in our life, and you need them, but you got to have the discernment to know who they are. You got to know that it's a Conrad, that they're fighting for what you're fighting or they're fighting against what you're against. They're against, you know, the, listen to me, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, listen, they did not like Jesus. But when it came to teaming up, when it came to joining in together, when it came to working together for to fight against Jesus, they got together. <laughs> they didn't even like each other. And it's amazing how people won't like each other, but they'll get together to come against you. Same people that you think are in your corner, same people you think are for you, same people you think will fight for you, no. They will deceive you because their motives their motives, okay, their motives, their motives are not pure. And so 
The Sadducees were a different breed. They, they didn't believe this. Listen, are you all with me? I was trying not to say that. Can I see everybody's eyes? Listen, listen, I need you. I need you to understand this. The Sadducees, they believed, or let me say it like this. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the spiritual things. They were superstitious, okay? And that's why they were sad, you see. The Pharisees were religious, self-centered, egotistical people. And that's why they were called Pharisee. Because they wasn't fair, you see. But those two got together. Those two organizations got together for the, as Conrad's to fight against Jesus. And people will join together to fight against you. They, they, they're in it for the fight. But you have to discern that. And when we fail to discern that, we make bad choices and we allow people in our circle we allow people to get close to us, and then we wonder why when they hurt us, we go, how did I get hurt? Why did I allow that to happen? Well, you let them in your circle. Jesus only allowed those three to get real close to him, Peter, James, and John. And they fought for him. I mean, they, those boys were called sons of Zebedee. And when, and when they had an issue, when there was a problem, here's what they said. When the Samaritans were treating Jesus bad, here's what their response was. You want us to call down fire from heaven and zap them like crispy critters? That was their response. And Jesus said, oh, no, you don't know what spirit I am of. And Peter was so in Jesus' corner that when when he told them, he said, I must go to Jerusalem. I must suffer, and I must be killed. And he said, over my dead body, Peter said. And when they came to get Jesus, Peter was the one whipped out his sword, his knife, his blade, and cut the guy's ear off. Whack! Okay? Because he was loyal. He was a confidant. He was committed hell or high water. He was going down with Jesus no matter what. And those are the people you need in your life. But so often we get the constituents because they look the same. They walk with you. They, 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 they talk like, like, like Conrad's. They tell you all the right things you want to hear, but in reality, they're not for you. They're for themselves. But you will know the ones that are for you because they, they love you unconditionally. It's not they love you because... It's because they love you. <laughs> and then the fourth group. The fourth group is that outer circle. That's that outer circle. Those are the ones that are on the outside, and they're trying to get in. And they're trying to get close to you. But they have an agenda in mind. They have a purpose in mind, and it's not your purpose, but you don't know that. They make you think that they have your purpose in mind. They make you think that they're for you, but they're trying to get into your inner circle. They're trying to get close to you, but then when they get close to you, those are the people that you find out and you go, wow, I didn't know that you were like you that. But you let them in there. You let them get close to you. You let them get your feelings, get your emotions. You fell in love with them. And then when you find out the real deal, that they never had your best interest at heart in the first place. It was about me, myself, and I. It was about my selfish gain or what I can gain. They were never for you and what you're for. You have to have people in your life that are for you and for what you're for. And what you're for is the kingdom of God. You're for living life powerfully. And you, if you're a destiny person, you will be hoodwinked, tricked, 
and lose out on destiny following and getting connected to the wrong people. And then you want to know why. Why didn't I fulfill uh, my God-given assignment? And the graveyard is full of folk who never fulfilled their God-given assignment. They never fulfilled their God-given destiny. They died in defeat. The graveyard full of them folk. They, they had a vision for what was possible. They were visionaries. They were those who, who could see what it could be, what it should be, what it will be, in spite of the way it is. But because they allow people in their inner circle to get close to them and sell them a dream, sell them their vision, and change their destiny or change where they were going. And they begin to follow the wrong person. And then they got so far from their destiny that they never made it back and they died in defeat. So I'm saying to you today that you have to make sure that the people come to your life. You got to ask God, why are they in your life? And I'm not suggesting don't let anybody in your life. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you got to know what they're in their life for. Because some people come to your life and God wants you to say, they come to your life and God wants you to say, hey, uh, okay, nice meeting you. I'll get with you later. <laughs> but, but, but you think that, that this is somebody that God wants you to to. to have a vision with and work with and that person can be devastating to your spiritual life because you don't have the spirit of discernment you must have a spirit of discernment so that you can discern why are they in your life furthermore who sent you <laughs> Did Satan send you? Did demons and demonic activity send you? Send you? Who sent you to my life? But we just automatically want, oh, I love you. Come on. Oh, come. Let, get into my inner circle and be part of me. Yeah. God sent you. And we had to discern the spirit. And so you have to discern. And the blessing blocker is when you don't discern, discern. You just grab anybody and everybody, and we've been guilty of that. But I've grown to another level, and I'm sharing it with you today. I've learned that confidants are what I need in my life. That I don't have to walk around being, being phony. That I, what they see, they don't judge me. They don't, they don't get mad at me because I don't respond to them like I, they want me to respond. I, I, don't, I don't talk to them like they want me to talk to them, and they offended by everything I say. I don't need that in my life. I need people that's going to let me be me who are for what I'm for and for me and for what I'm for, because I'm for what is right in the sight of God. I'm for you. I'm for building and empowering your life that you can soar high for kingdom living, that your destiny is one that is clear, and we got a path on a journey to greatness, and you're going to fulfill your God-given assignment. You're going to forgive. You're going to uh, uh, reach your God-given assignment and fulfill your God-given dream. Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte is where dreams come alive. Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte is a place uh, that you can get a vision for what you're up to uh, and the difference that you're out to make uh, and the power of the anointed one and his anointing and the power of prayer, uh, the power of us seeking God together will help push you into your greatness, will help motivate you, uh, will help take you to your God-given destiny to fulfill God's purpose and plan in your life, uh, that you can live life powerfully, that you can live life whole and complete, that you live life strong and mighty and courageous and bold, uh, and you don't let the demons and devils control you. You don't let nothing stop you. You don't even let people control you. You don't let circumstances control you. You don't let situations control you. You don't let difficulties control you. You don't let problems control you. You let nothing control you. The only thing control you is the spirit of almighty God. 
I'm coming. That's who has to control your life. You can't let people control your life. Constituents want to control your life. They're not for you. They're for what you're for. And the moment they don't see what you're for, then it'd be no more. <laughs> so know the difference. Just know the difference of people. Don't take everybody at face value. Your pastor is the worst. I have a philosophy. I trust you till you prove different. Yes, yes. Now, I don't have that. Uh -oh. I don't trust you. You got to prove different. <laughs> yes. Yes. I don't trust you. Yes. Amen. Because I've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, and tricked, and deceived. Because I thought you was a Conrad and you was a constituent. I thought you was a Conrad and you, and I, th I mean, I thought you was a, a uh, I thought you was a, a confidant and you was a constituent and I thought you was a Conrad and, or, or a, I thought you was a, 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 a confidant and you was a Conrad. In other words, I got them all mixed up to show you, you get them all mixed up. Good illustration of getting them all mixed up. It's easy to get them mixed up because they all look the same. They look the sh same. But how many know that everything that shine and glitter is not gold? It's not gold. It shines and glitters, but it's not gold. And you have to develop a good judgment call. You got to have the spirit of discernment. And that is the ability to judge clearly. And don't let things cloud your judgment. And what's so hap what happened to me in my life at a young age, at 18 years old, my judgment was smeared. My judgment call was incorrect. What I thought was one thing was another, and I ended up living in defeat for 10 solid years. I lived in defeat because I misread the people that God sent in my life. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, ask God today to give you a spirit of discernment that you can discern the people who come into your life and know when they come into your life, what are they coming into your life for? We did a show, I'm closing, but we did a show, me and my lovely wife on dating. And one of the things that we said in dating that you have to ask the tough questions. And so often we evade the tough questions we were afraid to ask the tough questions. And that's, that's normal. I remember as a car salesman when I first started selling, the toughest question that I had, the toughest question that I needed to present. Can you imagine what that question was? But the question was that I had a hard time for a long time to ask the tough question. And the tough question is, will you buy this car? That was the hardest question. But once I discerned and grew and got confident, I didn't have a problem. Sir, ma'am, what will it take to earn your business today? What will it take for you to buy and drive this car today? <laughs> and I sold 33 cars in one month with a week's vacation, and no one had done that in the history of the company because I learned to ask the right question. I'm here to tell you today, you gotta ask the right question. When people come into your life, ask the right question. Find out what motivates them. What, what is their motivation? And if it's not you, for you, and with you, then you need to take an evaluation of that. Because people come to your life for various reasons, various motivations. 
And you got to know what that is because so often we think it's one thing and it's another. And then when they leave you, you hurt. You're disappointed. You crying. You boo-hooing. You saying how wrong it was. Well, you should have saw it coming in the first place. I'm going to close with this story. The story is that the man was traveling on a journey. There was a snake. And he grabbed the snake, okay, because the snake was hurting. He grabbed the snake and bandaged the snake and helped the snake be totally restored. Loved, loved on the snake and took care of the snake and everything and nursed that snake right back to health. And when the snake got strong, it bit him. And he said, all I did for you and you got the nerve to bite me? And he said, you knew I was a snake when you found me. <laughs> what are you saying? I'm saying when you meet people, know who they are when you meet them. Because generally, a leopard doesn't change his spots. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website, FWC Charlotte, and consider giving a generous gift so we can continue the ministry. We're touching lives around the world, and you can partner with us and help us make a difference. Thank you so very much for your support and wish God's very best to you. With spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, we've already been blessed. You don't have to try to get blessed. You want to get blessed, hope to get blessed. The scripture declares that you are already the blessed of the Lord. However, we fight demons and devils and demonic activity that come to kill, to steal, and destroy, and hoodwink us, and bamboozle us, and trick us from receiving what God has already released to us, because it's done in the heavenlies, but it has to manifest in the natural. That's why the word of God said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we got to get heaven down on earth. And that's the challenge because we realize that our adversary wants to hinder us and steal from us because his job is to come and he works his job. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And the graveyard is full of folk who are constantly hoodwinked and bamboozled by demons and devils and demonic activity. They never fulfilled their God-given assignment. They came to this world, robbed us, and, and took from us what they were supposed to give to the world. They had something to offer, but dark moments of life came and blinded them and they, they got deceived and they never brought to the table or brought to the church or brought to the world who they were. They were great, they were extraordinary, but alcohol got them and they died of cirrhosis of the liver or drug got them and they died, they overdosed, but they had dreams and they had visions and they had goals, but they never came to fruition because the adversary deceived them, tricked them, stole from them and robbed them and ultimately robbed us because we didn't get the book that they were supposed to write they, they were probably, some folk were able to write a book on, on uh, how, to, how to manage your, uh, your uh, children in an awesome way. Uh, or, or perhaps uh, create a, 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 a boutique shop that was designed that, that uh, had where individuals could share this, these boutique uh, items and impact the world through scriptures, just all kind of ideas that c could have been released to the world that we never got. 
And so I encourage us to find our purpose. Because if you don't find your purpose, somebody else will give you theirs. And we go through life living somebody else's purpose. We never actually live our purpose and our dreams and our aspirations and things that we want to accomplish because we're too busy uh, doing somebody else's purpose and working for others when we could be entrepreneurs and create a job and, 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 and expand ourselves and expand our horizon. But that comes through seeking the Lord and getting the mind of Christ and finding your purpose. Why were you created? What were you, what, I mean, why did God, what did he have, what was he up to when he created you? What was on God's mind? When he made that mold and then he made it and he threw it away, he didn't make another one. <laughs> so he had to be up to something when he created you. He had, he had a purpose in mind. But so often we never find that purpose. And so today I want to help us to for all of us to find that purpose that God created us to accomplish. And I don't want us to lose out. And the blessing blocker that I want to share with you today is a failure to survive the dark moments of life. Failing to, 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 to survive the dark moments of life. There will be dark times in life. All hell will break loose. Demons and demonic activity will launch an attack on your life. It's no doubt in my mind. But how you handle the dark moments of your life will determine your destiny. Will determine how you should succeed. If you fight the good fight of faith, as the scripture tells us. If you put on the whole armor of God, that you can stand against demonic activity. If you understand who you are and whose you are. And you are in the word of God and you know God's word and you know what he has said and you understand that you fight a real demon and devil but you know who greater is he that's in you than any demon and every demonic activity and every satanic attack you know that you're the head and not the tail you know you've been created in the image and the look and that you look like God you favor God and you understand that God is for you and you know that if God before you than everybody else might as well be and you hold your head up high in the darkest times in your life you know that it's right before the break of dawn you know it might be a dark moment uh, but you understand that the darkness uh, may come uh, and weeping may endure for a season but joy comes in the morning you got to know what the word of God says that weeping will endure you will have tough times uh, you will go through difficulty you will go through trials. Uh, you will go through circumstance. You will go through tests. Uh, but that's the key. You got to go through. Uh, you got to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Because uh, sometimes uh, all hell breaks loose uh, and you feel hopelessness there. And so often pastors have died in defeat because they had no one to talk to. They had no one to share with. They had no one to be transparent with. And the darkest moment of their life came uh, and then they got hoodwinked and bound and killed themselves and gave up on life uh, because they had no confidant. Uh, they had no one that uh, would listen to them. No one would hear them. Uh, no one would understand them. Uh, and the enemy will make them feel like that they might as well give up on life. Uh, there will be those times uh, that you might want to quit. Uh, that you might want to throw in the towel. Uh, but that's the darkest moment. Uh, but just know that the darkest moment is right before the break of dawn. Uh, once the break of dawn comes, uh, the light begins to come and the light will shine in the midst of darkness. I'm here to tell you today, this room can be pitch dark, uh, but the moment we light a candle, uh, then darkness has to leave. Uh, you got to bring the light of God uh, in the midst of your dark situation, in the midst of your trial, uh, when all hell is breaking loose. Uh, you got to find the light. Uh, you got to find the light uh, to be able to see 
your way through. Uh, and once you get the light of God flowing in your heart, uh, no matter how much darkness is around you, uh, you will be lit up uh, and you will light up everything around you. Because uh, the light of God will be your strength. Uh, the light of God will begin to shine forth. Uh, and no matter what the devil has painted and what you see in the natural, you put light on the spiritual things of God uh, and let your situation be turned around. Uh, let your situation be changed. Uh, let your situation be a rearranged. Uh, and don't be hoodwinked. I'm coming. You know, back in Florida, many years ago, there was a pile up accident on Interstate 4. There was early in the morning, there was a fog in Florida, in Central Florida. And it was zero visibility. And zero visibility was before all the drivers they could not see in front of them. And the fog, when it hit, it hit so that the pileup was a hundred pile plus pileup accident, back to back, boom, 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 back to back, accident, accident, because it was zero visibility. And one of the young men got on the, the news and he said it was horrible. He talked about the tragedy of people being injured and hurt. And here's what he said. He said, if I only had a light. And I'm here to tell you, all hell can be going through. It could be the darkest moments of your life, of your life, but you got a light. And that light and that candle is the almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the light of the world? You have a light. So when all hell breaks loose, uh, you grab a hold of your light. Uh, when the things are piling up back to back, uh, you feel like the pressure's on. Uh, you feel like circumstances are overtaking you. You grab out your light because uh, you got a light. Uh, and it's the light of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and you let your light so shine uh, that men may see your good work. Uh, and you glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And you give him praise. Can you clap those hands and give God glory? Listen, dark moments of your life will come, but you got to know that you have a light. And you got to deal with the dark and the toughest moments of your life when the enemy comes and, and tricks you. Because keep in mind that darkness comes upon you to blind you. But the word of God says God has translated us from the powers of darkness until his marvelous light. Yes, yes, yes. His word says that he brought us out of darkness and, and translated us unto his marvelous light. That all we have to do is keep on our spiritual glasses. And, you know, and if you can't see good in the spirit, get you some bifocals. You know, get, you know, get you some Coke bottles <laughs> or get you a, a telescope, whatever it takes for you to see into the spirit realm. You get that into your life so you can see in the midst of all hell breaking loose. Don't let the enemy trick you and deceive you and lure you into darkness and trap you where you see that there's no way out. Too many individuals have lost their life because a spirit of darkness came upon them and their evil day came. And an evil day is when Satan launches an attack against you. An evil day is when every demon that, that you met from conception since the time you was born. And there is a time where Satan will leave you for a season so you get complacent. So you relax. You know, you start chilling. Taking it easy, you know. You know, just, uh, you don't pray as much. Because everything's fine. 
you know, life is good. Got plenty of money. Got a nice honey. <laughs> and everything is great. So you ain't worried about nothing. So you relax. You take it easy. You know, you just go with the flow. But, you know, reading the Bible, I know the word. I mean, I, don't, I could tell you cover to cover about that book. And I done prayed enough. God know me. He knows my heart. <laughs> and we get relaxed. And just like Satan, when he was led up, they led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. And when Jesus rebuked him, the scripture says he left him for a season. There is a season in your life where you on cloud nine, so to speak. Or you just excited, ignited, enthused, and infused, and you just uh, singing songs of Zion, and we're relaxed. You cannot afford to relax against demons and devils. You got to stay on guard. You got to have your armor on. You got to be prepared for guerrilla warfare, for satanic attack. You got to be prepared to conquer over demons and devils because if you don't conquer them, they will conquer you. If you don't win over them, they'll win over you. So you cannot relax. You cannot get comfortable. You cannot get complacent. If you too many people, the graveyard full of them folks that relaxed and, and just said it'll be all right. I'll just, you know, whatever comes my way. You know, I mean, hey, whatever. It is what it is. No, never say it is what it is because you can change what is to what it's supposed to be. But when you say it is what it is, then that's a fixed way that it can't be changed. When you say it is what it is, then it's no way it can be fixed. It's no way. It's a fixed way, in other words, and you can't do anything to change it. So you so never say it is what it is because then you accept in what is. But I'm here to tell you, you and God can change the situation. You and God can change the circumstances. You and God can do it. Listen, darkness is not bad. The world was in darkness. And it was in darkness that God created everything. When the world was void and was nothing, that's when God said, let there be light. That was when God created the world and created man out of nothing. But so often when we hit nothing, we feel like the life is over. We lost everything. We don't have this. I don't have no money. I don't have no honey. I don't have no, 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 uh, no nothing. I'm just busted, disgusted, and can't be trusted. And so we have a tendency to then just feel like we hit rock bottom. But nothing is not a bad place to be. If God can take nothing and create everything and you have co-created power with him and you were creating his likeness, then you can take nothing and create everything. But when darkness hit us, we, it's just like we can't do nothing. It just can't do nothing. I just can't do. I ain't got nothing. I ain't got nothing in life. I just, I just can't do it, Pastor. I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, I want to quit and give up on life. How dare we say that God is not enough? God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to his power that's ready, willing, and able to work within you. Yeah. You are our creator. You got to know that you can create because you got co-created power with God. You're an inventor. You got to know that you can invent. You got to know that you're a designer because you designed your life. And if you don't like the way it is, get, get rid of that design and redesign who you are. Because you designed you. And if you don't like it, I mean, I'm telling you what, I'm pretty, I'm pretty feeling pretty good about the design here. <laughs> How do you feel about you? 
I mean, do you feel like that you have designed you, that you're pleased with you? Because if you're not happy with you, that's a setup for the enemy to come in and have a field day and beat you down. If you don't feel good about you, you got to love you. Because let me tell you something, you're incapable of, of loving me uh, if, without loving yourself. You can only love me to the degree in which you love yourself that you have. <laughs> so if you don't love yourself, you know, I used to wonder about that. I, you know, guys used to tell me, I love my wife, I love my wife and everything and beating her up and everything. And I'm like, that's kind of confusing. I said, I love her, I love her. And man, she swole all up and black eyes and everything. You talking about you love her? Okay. And the Lord showed me that he can only love her to the degree in which he loved himself. He's saying he loved because that's the level of love that he's at. And people have levels of love in their life and they can only love you to the level and degree that they love themselves. That's all they got coming. That's all you got coming. So what are you saying? If you see a person that says he loves himself and his actions demonstrate contrary, you know they don't love themselves. Because when you love yourself, you take care of you. You ain't just sleeping out there in the woods letting anything bite on you and everything and the homeless and the sleeping here and there. No, 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 no. You do something about your situation. You ain't on no drugs and alcohol killing yourself talking about you love yourself. No, 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 no. And the dark moments of life come and, and all hell break loose and you want to quit and give up and on life no it doesn't work like that you have to love you okay and love is a giving of oneself unconditional giving of yourself that's true love God so loved the world that he gave <laughs> so when you love you give <laughs> amen so this this whole thing of the darkest moments in our life and and how to survive that is knowing that darkness is not bad, just you have to maintain the light. I mean, you take it in a dark room and it's developed in darkness because at the exposure of the light, it won't come to fruition. So sometimes there's darkness in your life to make develop you. There's darkness that will come to your life that will help cause you to show up and look like you supposed to look. That darkness is that time that's developing you and making you and molding you and shaping you. So when the when it's when the film and the whole movie is played, you start seeing the v, uh, the DVD and you start watching the video and you say, "Wow!" During that dark time, look what happened. During that dark, God brought me out. Of. Look what that took me to another level. Look what that took me higher. Look at the blessing that came out during those dark. Moments. Wow, look at that video of me. Uh, during those dark moments, I survived. Uh, and look what it's done for me. Uh, I'm here to tell you today uh, just because you face darkness, uh, no God is working His divine plan, whether you like it or not. Because when it's all said and done, and you look at the video, you'll be proud of what you and God did. Not only are things developed in darkness, but also, a seed grows best when it's deep into dark soil. When a seed is put into the ground, it's not put into light. It's not even put into water. It's put into darkness. And once that germinate, once that take root, man, you got the most awesome beautiful flowers you got the awesome beautiful luxury of enjoying the benefit of that seed going into darkness what are you saying preacher I'm saying don't resent going into darkness don't resent the dark times because that's when God is growing you and preparing you for great things but when darkness come our attitude will determine our altitude our altitude uh, or our attitude will determine how high we go. If we see, oh, I can't stand this darkness, and you pluck yourself out, guess what? That seed will die. If it come out of that darkness before it germinates, that seed will die. 
You got to stay in that dark moment, but you can survive in that dark moment because you're not in it alone. You think you're in it alone, but that dark moment of your life, God is there with you. In that dark moment of your life, God is walking hand in hand with you. In that dark moment of difficulties, God is right by your side. In that dark difficulties of time when all hell is breaking loose, God is with you. Because he says in his word, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's walking along with you. So be a good courage. Be cheerful in the fact that you know that God is for you. And that God has your very best interests at heart. So no matter what it looks like in the natural, know that this too shall pass. No matter how, how, it, how you see it today, know that it's subject to change, that it's temporal. Temporal means it's subject to change at any given moment. <laughs> But that's where your faith comes in. So if you're going to survive, if you're going to survive in dark moments of life, uh, you're going to have to build your faith. Uh, you're going to have to know that faith honors God uh, and God honors faith. Uh, and you got to know without faith, uh, it is impossible to please God. Uh, that they that come to God must believe that he is uh, and that God is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. Uh, you got to know if you keep the faith, uh, God is going to reward you. God's going to open the window of heaven and pour you out blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. Uh, you know that the abundant life is coming to you. Uh, it might be dark times, uh, but I'm going to weather the storm. Uh, I'm going to weather the trials. Uh, I'm going to weather the situation because this too shall pass uh, and my sunshine is coming. Uh, my light is coming to me. Uh, my joy is coming back. Uh, I might be going through, uh, but my God is going to be with me. Uh, my God was not to uh, leave me hanging. Uh, you got to know uh, that it's by faith that God uh, will cause you to overcome. Uh, you got to know uh, by faith uh, that it is certain of things that you cannot see in the natural. But you believe and you trust God. Uh, and you're relying upon God. Uh, and you're depending upon God. But so often we're depending upon people. Uh, we're depending upon our wives. Uh, we're depending depending upon our husbands. Uh, we're depending upon the human being. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, the dark moment of your life, uh, it's time to depend on God. Uh, it's time to look to him. Uh, it's time to seek him. Uh, it's time to glorify him. It's time to magnify him. It's time to lift him up. Uh, it's time to give him glory. It's time to give him honor. It's time to glorify him. Uh, it's time to magnify him. Uh, it's time to exalt him. Uh, it's time to lift him up. Uh, it's time to get excited. Uh, it's time to get ignited. Uh, it's time to get enthused. Uh, and my God, better be infused. Hey! Woo! You got to survive those dark moments of your life. There will be dark times. But in order to survive them, you have to have the light. And the light is the light of Jesus. Stand to your feet. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website, FWC Charlotte, and consider giving a generous gift so we can continue the ministry. We're touching lives around the world, and you can partner with us and help us make a difference. Thank you so very much for your support, and wish God's very best to you.
joy it is to minister on Palm Sunday and share with you uh, the Word of God and minister to you. And so I want to minister to you a blessing block. I want to continue my series on blessing blockers because I'm convinced that God wants everyone to live life powerfully, live life intentional, live life on purpose, and be anointed and appointed. I'm convinced of that. And the graveyard is full of folks who never reached their full potential. The graveyard is full of folks who died in defeat. They never fulfilled their God-given assignment. Uh, they were hoodwinked, bamboozled, and tricked by, by demons and devils. And they never fulfilled their greatness. And they robbed us. The church is robbed because they didn't give to us what they were created to bring to the church and to fulfill their greatness. So I'm excited about those who understand that God had, has called them and they have purpose and they're moving into their greatness and they're becoming extraordinary in what God has called them to do. And so today as I minister, I want you to turn your Bibles to Mark's Gospel chapter 11. And we're going to be reading verse 1 through 10. I'm going to ask Reverend Michael Davis if he would read for me today. But I want to minister to you a blessing blocker. Because the word of God says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. In heavenly places. We've already been blessed. But also in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says... Our struggle, our battle is not against each other. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against demons and devils and demonic activity that is hindering you from receiving what God has already blessed you with. So you're already blessed. So your job is to get heaven down on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is already has a picture, a video of your success. And you have to upload that video or download that video to your spirit so that you can live life powerfully. You can live life on purpose. That you can live life extraordinary and fulfill your God-given assignment. Because you were created for a particular assignment. And so often we never know what that is. But I want to minister to you a blessing blocker that I believe that hinders all of us from becoming extraordinary. It hinders all of us from moving into our greatness. It hinders us and it's being tied up, being bound, being in bondage. That is a blessing blocker if I ever seen it. It will hinder you being bound, being tied up. So let's look at a story, an incredible story, as Jesus made his triumphant journey into Jerusalem, we see the story that Jesus tells his disciples, he tells them, say, listen, I want you to go to Bethany. And when you get there, you're going to find a coat or a donkey. You're going to find him tied up. And if anybody question you at all, if anybody try to ask you what's going on and, and try to scrutinize you, you tell them that the Lord has need of it. And to their amazement, as they traveled to Bethany, I'm sure they were just amazed. As they looked, they said, my goodness, there is the donkey that Jesus told us about. And he says, if the owner come to you, you tell that owner I got need of. Now, it's amazing how powerful Jesus is that he can tell them to take that donkey from that owner. <laughs> But the fact is, Jesus' name was known throughout the region. So all that he, they had to do was say to, to the owner, Jesus has need of it. Jesus had carte blanche, carte blanche, <laughs> to be able to speak and say, you just tell them Jesus needs it. That's just use my name. And that's the great thing about being a kingdom citizen. We have the right to use Jesus' name. Yes, Amen. Yes. You don't, you're not forging his name. You're not 
uh, committing fraud when you use his name. He has given you the legal right to use his name. And in the name of Jesus, there is power and authority. And we must tap into the revelation of how powerful G the name of Jesus is. Jesus' name is so powerful that demons and devils tremble. Satanic and demonic forces run when you use the name of Jesus. Whenever you're faced with a situation, whenever you're ever faced with a problem, you call on the name of Jesus, and every demon and every dumb and every devil will take off. Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Can somebody help me preach this morning? There's power in his name. And there's authority in his name. So, so when they get to Bethany, there is a donkey tied up. And I'm sure the owner came out, surmised, and said, hey, what are you guys doing? And you lost your, hey, 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 what are you guys doing? And they simply said, Jesus has need of this donkey. And I'm sure surmising, the owner said, no problem. If Jesus needs it, yes. take it and go. And so they got the donkey and brought it to Jesus. And we're going to read the story. Let's read. Turn to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. Let's read verse 1 through 10. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter in it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, what, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately and they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street and they untied it and some of those standing there said to them what are you doing untying the colt and they untie and they told them that Jesus had said and they let them go stop right there so we see the story unfolding where Jesus had need of the donkey. I'm here to tell you and declare to you today, Jesus has need of you. Yeah. You might be tied up, you might be bound, you might be gagged. The enemy may have put you in bondage where you have limitations and restraints and boundaries on your life and you're not living life powerfully. You're living life tied up and being controlled by demons and devils and demonic activity. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus has need of you. Jesus can loose you just like he did that donkey and set you free and put you on a course to your greatness that you can soar high for kingdom living, that you can go through every demonic force and every satanic spirit in every opposition of the devil, you can rise as an overcomer, strong in the Lord and the power of his might, having the whole armor of God, that you can stand against demons and devils because you have, have become an overcomer because you have come over, because you refuse to be tied up. Uh, we need a group of people. We need the body of Christ to refuse to be tied up, uh, to not be controlled by demons and devils, not be controlled by demonic forces, to break through the demonic forces and get free because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Are you free in the Spirit today? Are you free in the power of the Holy Ghost today? Have you been delivered today? Have you been set free? Or are you walking around tied up? All right, have mercy. Tied up means that you can't move. You've been seized. You've been captured. You're a hostage. <laughs> You're being controlled, uh -huh. and you're not living life powerfully. You're not living life. You're not living whole and complete. When the enemy has you tied up, when he have you in chains, and he have you bound, you can't enjoy life. There's too many restraints and, and, and limitations and boundaries, and you're not free. And then you're controlled by circumstances. You're controlled by situations. You're controlled by, by objects, and you're controlled by people, and you're not living life free. 
And God needs a people today because he has need of you. He needs a group of people. He needs individuals to say, for God I live and for God I die. Yeah. He needs a group of individuals to say, I refuse to be tied up. Uh, I refuse to be in bondage. I refuse to be gagged. Uh, not putting a gag order on me where I can't talk about the goodness of God. I can't praise uh, about the goodness of God. I can't magnify about the goodness of God. Why? Because I've been gagged and tied up. Uh, it's time to get free today in the spirit. It's time to let God touch your life and break the chains off of your life uh, and break all of the ropes that's holding you down. Uh, those things that are keeping you down, those things that are holding you down, those things that are stopping you from soaring high for kingdom living, those things that's keeping you from moving into your greatness, those things that's keeping you from becoming extraordinary, those things that's keeping you from moving powerfully in God. It's time today to say to the devil, enough is enough. I had enough and I refuse to live my life tied up. I refuse to let change and ropes hold me down. I'm breaking through because my God has need of me. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God has need of you. Let's read. In verse 7. And they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their coats on it. They threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow, listen to this. You want to be able to be so free that people recognize that you walk in freedom that you walk powerfully and they have the respect for you as they did Jesus. Yeah. As Jesus got on the coat and began to make his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, they respected him so that they put palms down there, what we know today as Palm Sunday, in reverence and respect for Jesus as he was making his triumphant entry. Now keep in mind, uh, now the disciples are realizing, my God, we thought Jesus was going to come in on a white horse and a stallion and was going to overturn the known powers that be. And here he comes in humility. At that moment, they had to get present to the power of humbling themselves. Uh, I'm here to tell today. Uh, Jesus wants all of us to humble ourselves in the sight of him. Because uh, as you humble yourself before him, uh, he'll exalt you. If you exalt yourself, uh, God will bring you down. But as you humble yourself, uh, God will push you up. Uh, as you are yielded to him, uh, God will push you up. Uh, as you submit to him, uh, God will push you up. Uh, as you die to your ways, uh, God will lift you up. Uh, as you did be crucified with Christ and die, God will exalt you. He'll lift you up. Uh, but everything that exalts itself uh, is coming down. Uh, but glory to God, Jesus came to show mankind uh, that the way is to humble yourself uh, and be converted as a little child, to humble yourself uh, and walk respectfully before him. And as they humbled themselves, uh, the God began to pour his spirit upon them and they received the baptized, uh, baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire and flame and their lives were changed and rearranged. Uh, they were brand new creation. Why? Because they died to self. Uh, they got free from the chains and the shackles and they begin to live life powerfully and they turn the known world upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can be used mightily as you humble, your, humble yourself. As Jesus taught humility, and they were looking forward to Jesus coming and overthrowing the government, the powers that be, and taking charge, and showing strength. And he comes in on a donkey. And it was his triumphant victory right before the, going to the cross. He showed his humility. So often we're cocky, arrogant, think we're better than folk, holding our head up high, thinking people are beneath us, thinking people are low lives and we are somebody. I'm here to tell you today, 
when you humble yourself in the mighty hand of God, God takes your humility and he prunes you and he shapes you and he molds you. And he causes you to rise up and become a brand new creation in him. Uh, and the old is done away with and the new come. And you can begin to soar high and do great exploits for the kingdom of God because you're broken before him. Uh, you're not living life uh, where you are so controlled by circumstance and situations and people. You're living your life controlled by almighty God. Uh, you're living your life controlled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you're living your life controlled uh, by by the anointed one and his anointing is fueling you and flaming and burning within you uh, and you're moving into your greatness every day of the life uh, you wake up uh, as a commander of the morning uh, you wake up uh, commanding your day a day that you never seen before a day that you never experienced uh, you rise and you say uh, this is the day that the Lord has made I will rejoice and no chains uh, no ropes uh, no shackles are gonna hold me down Nothing is going to hold me down. I'm not going to be a puppet. I'm your puppet too. <laughs> you don't want to be a puppet controlled. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? I'm talking about being controlled by nicotine, drugs, lust, sex. Oh, yes. I'm talking about being controlled by circumstances and situations that control you. Yeah. You don't take control of your life. Amen. I'm here to tell you, God has need of you, but he needs you to get control of your life. Amen. Needs you to get control of who you are, to live life in control of you, to master you. Jesus mastered himself in front of the whole world as the Ro Roman soldiers beat him and whipped him. And as he was going to the cross, my Lord said to the whole known world, hey, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. If it be any other way, I don't know if when the video, when he saw his video, it didn't look too good. When he looked at his video and he saw himself nailed, he saw himself crucified, he said, wow, let's come up with another plan. Let's come up with another situation here to do this. But he said, uh, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Yes. Saints of God, we must say not our will, yes. but God's will be done. Let God work in your life. Let God move in your life. Let God mold you and shape you and design you to that which he designed you to be from the very beginning. Uh, God didn't design you to be a failure. He didn't divide, de design you to be a loser. He didn't design you to live life powerless. Uh, he didn't design you to live life sick. Uh, he didn't design you to live life where you're in such defeat. Uh, he created you as a king's kid to soar high uh, and to break the shackles and chains uh, and take authority. Uh, take charge over your life. Uh, take charge over the things that's trying to take charge over you. Uh, take authority over the things that want to take authority over you. Uh, rise in the power of the anointed one and his anointing. That's what God wants you to do. Take charge. Amen. Well, Pastor, you know, you, that's for you because you, you strong. But look, poor me, I have it so hard. God is no respecter of persons. What's available for me is available for you. <clears throat> you can live life powerfully well i'm just kind of happy leaving where the demons and the devils don't mess with me i don't want nothing to do with demons and devils so i'm just gonna leave them alone and they gonna leave me alone foolishness the reason why they left you alone because they already got you you gotta break through you gotta be determined that you're going to soar high and fulfill your God-given assignment. Amen. You are here on this earth on assignment. Right. You got purpose. And so often we're living somebody else's purpose. We're not living our own purpose. And when you're living somebody else's purpose, <coughs> you're 
then you can't live your own. If you live in somebody else's purpose, then you're wasting your life. You have to find your purpose. What you were manufactured to do. Amen. You have been manufactured to fulfill an assignment. Do you know what that assignment is? That assignment is to manage. God created you to manage. You are a manager. That's what you are, a manager. And some of us don't manage well. We don't manage our finances. We don't manage our lives very well. We don't manage your circumstances. We get caught up in our emotions. So always want to fight somebody. Always angry, mad, upset. Of course, this is not for freedom. You know I'm preaching to the people out there. But you want to live life whole and complete with freedom. Yes, amen. Amen. Thank you, dear. We interrupt this program to give you a special bulletin. <laughs> Alkaline water is great. Thank you. So I'm here to tell you this morning the blessing blocker of being tied up. God wants you free. He has need of you. And as Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and the palms were laid down there, and they began to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest, means the Lord cometh. They recognized that Jesus was Lord. They recognized that he is owner. I'm here to tell you, Lord means owner. Yeah, amen. Jesus Christ is is the owner of our lives as he bought us with his precious blood. You were bought and paid for in Jesus' name. You were bought with the precious blood of Jesus. And Jesus did not buy you for you to live life powerless. He did not buy you to live life in defeat. He did not buy you to live life going around broke, busted, disgusted, and can't be trusted. He did not create you for that. He created you uh, to have the wealth of the wicked uh, to be laid up for you, that you live in a land of more than enough, uh, that you move to the promised land flowing with milk and honey, uh, that you have the more than enough, uh, that you have all the resources and the finances for the kingdom of God. God is counting on you to bankroll his kingdom. Uh, he wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. But he can't do it if you're all tied up. Uh, you can't even go where God want to send you. You can't even soar where God want to take you. You can't even be what God wants you to be because you tied up. Uh, it is a blessing blocker. It's time to get free. It's time to be delivered. It's time to be set free. It's time to be great. Great for kingdom building. Can somebody say amen? amen? Don't live life tied up, being controlled. Live life in freedom. Freedom of, freedom to, and freedom from. Living life in freedom. Bringing the will of God to your life. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your job is to get heaven yes. down on earth. Amen. That video that you probably haven't uploaded or you haven't even looked at it. I suggest that you dial 1-800-HEAVEN and ask God to show you the DVD of your future. And ask him to see what it looks, so you can see what your future looks like. And then once he shows you what it looks like, then you break through every hindering spirit, every demonic force, every satanic spirit, every opposition to hinder you from fulfilling your God-given purpose and assignment. Because God has need of you. You can't live everybody else's purpose. You got to live your purpose. Because if you don't live your purpose, you live in somebody else's. And God wants you to live your purpose, what he called you to fulfill. Let's finish reading. In verse 10, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, 
Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he went, he had looked around at everything as it had already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. So he went with his disciples. He took the twelve with him. And they began to terrorize and turn the known world upside down. They began to lay hands on blind eyes that they see. Uh, lame walked. The deaf was able to hear. The deaf was raised. Why? Because they were not tied up. Uh, Jesus used the example of the donkey to show them uh, as the donkey is set free. Uh, and if a donkey can get loose and do something, so can you. I'm here to tell you today, if a donkey can get free and is used of God, uh, God can set you free and use you just like he did the donkey. God has need of you. Uh, God wants to use you. Uh, God wants you to be different. Uh, God God wants you to rise. God wants you to overcome. God want to use you. He used the example of the donkey to say that the donkey is tied up, but the donkey got free, and so should you. If the donkey can get free, you know you can. But guess what? The donkey couldn't get free by himself. Somebody had to loose him. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is willing to loose you. Amen. He's willing to set you free because he got need of you just like he did the donkey. Amen. Amen. He needs to use you. Well, pastor, I don't know if I want to be used of God. I, I, you know, I'm just scared of folks. I can't tell people about Jesus. I can't have time come to church myself. You know, it's just so hard. Christian education is too early for me to get up. I can't get up that early to come to Christian education and, and talk back Sunday. And then I'm late from morning worship because I don't want to see everybody when I come in. I want to be come in and they're already there. So I don't have to speak to him. <laughs> then I'm going to sit in the back of the church, and as soon as service is over, I'm going to do an exit. Shoom! <laughs> no, you want to live life in freedom. Yes, amen. Amen. When you walk through the door, you should bring the anointed one and his anointing with you. When you step through that door, you should step through with the confidence that I came to meet my yes, God. Yes. I came to worship him. And no demon and devil and nothing is going to tie me up and gag me where I can't praise God, where I can't shout and praise and magnify the Lord. I'm not going to live life tied up with restraints and limitations and boundaries. I'm going to soar high. I'm going to move in greatness. I'm going to magnify the Lord. I'm going to exalt his name. I'm going to glorify his God, my God. I'm going to cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And I'm going to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And I'm going to magnify him. I'm going to make God bigger in my life. Uh, I'm going to glorify him. I'm going to lift him up. God is going to be seen through me. Uh, people are going to see Christ uh, through me, uh, the hope of glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. Through me. I don't know about you, but I want to encourage you today. Get free. Don't be tied up. Don't be bound. Jesus made his triumphant victory into Jerusalem on a donkey as he came in to show the known world humility. That I, can, that I can beat you with humility. I don't have to rise up with a knight in shiny armor and with horses and chariots. I can do it with lowliness of life. Amen. I can humble myself. And when the time is right, I'll show you. I'll come in and turn them money changers upside down. I'll call you a bunch of snakes and vipers. Uh, you think I'm a whip, uh, wimp, because I came in on that donkey? No, you vipers. Uh, he called them vipers. Boy, wasn't that something Jesus called them snakes and vipers. Uh, he came uh, and came in with a whip uh, and turned the, the tables upside down. The money changers. You turned my house into a den of thieves. Get the out of here. <laughs> in the name of Jesus. Jesus was not no whimper. He showed humility. Uh, but when it was time to exalt himself, uh, when it was time for him to rise up for the occasion, Jesus rose up uh, strong and mighty and courageous and bold and took charge over the things that were taking charge. 
You got to know when to take charge over the things that's taking charge. You got to know how to take, over, take authority over the things that's trying to take authority. Jesus knew when, but he showed humility. I'm going to humble myself. You get out of order, I'm going to rise to the occasion. When, it, when you get out of order, I'm going to pull rank on you. And he pulled rank on the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders. He pulled rank. Why? Because he took authority. Yes, amen. Jesus Christ, as they beat him and ripped his flesh off of his bones, as they mistreated our Lord, and he went down to hell and took charge. He went down to hell and took authority. He said, I, I take the keys to death and hell in the grave. Went down to hell and snatched the keys and the authority and came up out of that grave with all power and authority and said, all power, 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 all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. And then he turned around and gave that same power, not another power, not a different power, but he gave that same power to you. Yes, amen. The same authority, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that went down to the grave right. and snatched the keys to Satan and took charge, came out of that, and he gave you keys. He gave you authority and said this to you. Whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So you have the power. You have the authority. You don't have to stay bound any longer. You don't have to stay in chains any longer. You don't have to be controlled any longer. Jesus gave you the keys to lock some things and to unlock some things, Amen. to take charge. He gave you dominion and authority, and he's expecting you to use it. Amen. Will you use your power and authority? Yes. But first, you got to get free. First, you got to get loosed because yes. God has need of you. Amen. In closing, the story is that our Lord Jesus Christ conquered over the enemy yes. but he showed his disciples that hey you got to be loose and I'm going to use a donkey to show you today God has loosed all of us you've already been loosed you've already been given the freedom but you don't know it I'm going to share this with you when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, there were those slaves that left and went off to freedom, took their families, built careers, moved into their greatness, became extraordinary, and lived life powerfully. But there were also a group that, that left and they got out there free and they said, I had it made with the master. I'm going back into bondage. Because where am I going to go? I don't have nobody to go with me. I'm going back into bondage. and I'm going back and live with my, my slave master. And they went back and said, boss, please forgive me for leaving. I come back to be in bondage. I come back to live life here and die on the plantation. I'd rather eat, eat, eat the slop than to get out there and can't make it. I'm afraid. And then there was another group that they refused to go. I said, shoot, I ain't going nowhere. I got three meals a day, slop and gop and top. Uh, I'm, I'm staying right here. I'm going to die right here with the master, I'm with, with, with Massa. I'm going to die with him. I'm going to stay right here. I ain't going nowhere. I don't care Abraham Lincoln can sign whatever he want to stay, sign. 
He can sign whatever he want to sign, but not me. I'm staying right here. And they died right on the plantation, and they were free. Some of you will stay in bondage today when God has already freed you. Some of you will get free for a couple days, and then you're going to go right back. But some of you are going to get free and stay free. How many want to be the one that leave and stay free? You're going to be in one of those categories today. Either you're going to stay in bondage, or either you're going to leave and come back, or you're going to leave and go and stay free. And we're going to look at you next week, and we're going to be amazed at the tremendous growth in your life. And we're going to know the power of God touched you, and you've been set free from, from above. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, stand to your feet. Every head bowed. In. Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website and giving a generous gift so we can stay on the air? Go to fwccharlotte.com and click on Give and support the ministry so we can stay on the air. Thank you so very much and wish God's very best to you. I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker. What a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you Journey to Greatness broadcast. If we're being a blessing to you, would you be so kind to consider going to our website, FWC Charlotte, and consider giving a generous gift so we can continue the ministry. We're touching lives around the world, and you can partner with us and help us make a difference. Thank you so very much for your support and wish God's very best to you. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Jose. I want to minister uh, briefly this morning on a blessing blocker. And I believe that this blessing blocker is going to help educate you and experience revelation. Uh, because the scripture says, without a vision, the people perish. Without revelation, without knowledge, and without growing and developing. So I want to minister the, on the book of Jose this morning. And I want to minister, as a blessing blocker, the lack of knowledge. So turn with me to Jose chapter 4, when you have it, say amen. amen. And then Dr. R.J. Lighty is going to be reading for me uh, this morning. We'll start there with uh, chapter 1 and, and start the uh, story. But from now, let's go, if we would, to Jose. Jose chapter 4, when you have it, say amen. amen. Let's look at verse 6. It says... My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, and I will also forget thy children. Close your Bible. Thank you, Lord God, for your word, and I ask in the name of Jesus. Anoint me afresh and anew as I minister this blessing blocker of the lack of knowledge. I ask your blessings upon my life and bless the hearers to hear what the spirit will say, knowing that it's not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. Release an anointing in this house to break through demonic activity and demons and devils 
and the spirits that will hinder and we put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness we release an anointing in the house in Jesus name amen this is an incredible story of a young prophet who was called by God to do some extraordinary and some amazing things it's amazing how during this time how God's people had rejected God they had turned their back on God they had taken the poor and made them slaves they were very abusive to people the kings were having prostitution in the temple and grabbing all of the beautiful women and making them out of prostitutes and so God's people had just turned their back on him on him and begin to serve other gods they begin to serve the god of Baal and they begin to serve all these different gods and they wanted to do it in conjunction with serving God the true God Jehovah and Yahweh but God was not pleased with them he was very upset with them because he loved his people God loved them so much that he had their their best interest at heart he was he had reminded them of how they were in slavery and how the Pharaoh and how Pharaoh had them in bondage and how he brought them out of Egypt and took them to a place through the wilderness and provided for them took good care of them met their need and led them into the promised land flowing with milk and honey and God blessed them with the abundance and they begin to take that abundance and, and squander it and begin to use that to sacrifice uh, uh, unto idols and false gods and turn their back upon God and God said I'm married to them I love them and I care for them but they don't seem to get it their the knowledge in there where they're thinking they don't have the revelation revealed because knowledge is revelation so the revelation wasn't revealed to them how much God loved them they were clueless because of their own selfishness because they're being egotistical arrogant and cocky they could not experience who God was in his love and so God wanted to reach them where they were at so what he decides to do is he speaks to this prophet named Hosea yes. and he tells Hosea he says listen I want you to go and rescue this prostitute I want you to go and get her from the enemy I, because she is a, connected to a friend of mine and the friend came to me and said hey I want you to help my daughter out. Uh, it's sad the way things are. Things that are in a mess. And, and I'm upset because they're making my daughter a prostitute. Would you help me? And in that dream, God showed him to go and begin to uh, reach out to her. And so he meets her and tells her, I'm going to take you away from here. We're going to get out of Dodge. Reminds me of a story when I was in Chicago. I was on the, uh, at a television station and I was a counselor there and a young lady called in. A Caucasian uh, lady said that her, her pimp had her hemmed up there in Chicago and that she was f afraid of him and she was scared for her life. Well, young and energetic young preacher, single at the time, ready to boldly go where no man had gone before, very adventurous and everything so I got the phone call and I said where are you at and she said I'm, I'm, I'm uptown or downtown rather I'm downtown and I said well listen I know a place where you can meet me and I said I'll pick you up and I'll snatch you up out of there and get you out of Dodge she said you'll do that for me I said absolutely I said absolutely now here this prostitute calls and she's in bondage and she's in pain and she's crying and she's afraid of her pimp and the courageous bold man the knight in shiny armor in me is rising up now hey da 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 da, -da. so I call I, I, I tell her I said listen meet me at 95th and state and I'll, and, and I'll be there with the church van and I'll pick you up and so 
And so I grabbed my girlfriend at the time. I said, honey, we got to go. I didn't say honey then. That, that, but I said, sweetie, or whatever I called her. I don't know what I called her. But anyway, cause those are names I for my baby. My darling, darling baby. But anyway, I said, come on, go with me. So she, she gets in the van, and we drive down to 95th and State. And so I said, it would be easy to find her because it's all black area. Um, and so it's nothing but, but uh, uh, it's a black area. So she'll stick out like a sore thumb being a white girl. So I, I spot a white girl. Okay. Now I'm the FBI and me and, the, and all of the, the uh, uh, tactic of, of, uh, of moving and, and manipulation and, and strategizing and everything is in play. So I, I, I get the van and I hit down on the van and uh, I tell the young lady, I'm, when I open the door, I'm going to snatch her in <laughs> and we're going to drive off. So, so we, we, I said, slow down. I remember telling her, slow down, slow down. So she slowed down, and I yelled her name, and she looked up, and I grabbed her and threw her in the van, and we took off and got out of Dodge. And I felt so proud of myself rescuing a prostitute. And so I called Detroit Teen Challenge. I said, listen, I just rescued a prostitute. I want to send her to you from Chicago. They said, by all means, send her. So I got her a ticket and, and uh, sent her to Detroit Teen Challenge in Detroit, Michigan from Chicago. And so uh, about a month later, I called to see how she was doing, and she was doing great. And I was so proud of my accomplishments. Yes. <laughs> so about another month later, I called back to check on her. And to my amazement, the director got on the phone. And he said to me, he said, Randy, that's what they called me back then. He said, Randy, we had to put her out. I said, well, he, she wouldn't cooperate here. And, and I was, I remember that just like it was yesterday. I was devastated. I was hurt. I was like, you could have done something. You, you all could have done something to save that lady. She's probably back on prostitution, uh, a prostitute and back out there on the streets. And I was really upset with them. I really was. But, you know, I was young in the Lord. I understand a lot different today. But I was young in the faith, but real energetic. So I said, oh, well, moved on. So I went off back to Bible college at, in Ellendale, North Dakota. Went back to college, and, and uh, it was uh, springtime again. And, and Spencer Jones, my pastor, wrote me a letter said, I want you to come back to Chicago. You did such an awesome job as an intern. We want you back. So I said, great. And so I went back to Chicago. And I ran into the young lady, my girlfriend at the time, I ran into her mom. And she said, oh, I'm glad to see you. I said, yeah. She said, you remember that prostitute that you grabbed, uh, you and my daughter grabbed and snatched up and, and uh, sent her off to the Detroit Teen Challenge, I said, yeah, I got a letter from her. She's in Jimmy Swagger's Bible College. You talking about exciting. You talking about exciting to learn. I don't know where the young lady is today, but that was an experience that I, that I had as a young minister. So I can understand how this prophet saw this prostitute and had a burden for this prostitute, and God tells him, not only to rescue her, but to marry her. Now, why would God say marry a prostitute? That always puzzled me the whole story until my study on, on, on it this week as I studied how, what God's purpose was, what he was up to and the difference that God was out to make when he orchestrated that whole thing, when in a dream, in a vision, he told him to marry this prostitute. And in the story, to my amazement, when they leave town, they leave and they head out of town, and he builds a life for her, and she has three beautiful kids. But the call of God is still on his life. The call of God and the passion of reaching the known world at that time to save them was still in his life. 
So he says to his wife, I got to leave and I'm going to head to Samaria and I'll be back. So he goes to Samaria and begins to share with the known world about destruction is coming, that God is upset with you all, that God is mad at you, he's angry, and that you're going to perish for a lack of knowledge. You're going to perish because you've turned your back on God. You forgot about God. You're not worshiping God. You're not, not being very active in the things of God. And, and he's now, God is upset with you, and he's telling them how angry God is. They wouldn't listen. And to his amazement, he did everything he could to share with them that God was bringing doom and gloom if they didn't repent. If they didn't turn from their wicked ways, if they didn't say they were sorry and change, that he was going to have to destroy them. And they wouldn't listen. And so he returns home. And when he gets home, guess what? Guess what? what? Thank you for asking. <laughs> His wife is gone. She missed the old lifestyle. She sold her kids into slavery and, and took off and he saw, sold her kids into slavery, took off and went off with a soldier back. And so that he's devastated. Of course her husband. He's devastated because he loved her. He cared for her. He had provided, had three beautiful children, and now she wants to go backwards, and she wants to backslide, and she wants to go back to the worldly life. But he had a love for her. And God told him, said, listen, I want you to rescue her. I want you to go find her. So he sought to find her. And he found out where she was. She had become a slave. And, and, and his children had been so. And he came at, to there and found her. And bought her back. Paid the money to, for her to be released because he loved her. And the whole purpose of the story is that God wanted to show that I'm married to my people. That regardless of them turning their back and committing infidelity and adultery and being unfaithful and not being committed, God is trying to show them and use our brother Jose to show them that I love them and I'm married to them. And regardless of their unfaithfulness, regardless of their infidelity, regardless of what they've done, I'm going to love them and I'm going to believe them for them to turn their lives around and to repent. But I'm going to punish them and show them that I'm the God who sits high and I'm in control. But I I wanted them to know that I love them uh, and I, he used this awesome man to, as an example to show his love, to demonstrate his faithfulness, to demonstrate his commitment, to demonstrate his loyalty, to demonstrate who he is for the people. He had a love for his people and I'm here to tell you today, uh, no matter what you do against God, no matter how you sin, uh, no matter how you turn your back, uh, no matter how you go to astray, uh, I want you to know uh, God is married to the backslider. God loves you in spite of. You may commit all kinds of sin. You may commit infidelity. You may go against God's plan. You may hinder the work of God. But no matter what you do, God is still married to you. God still loves you. And he used this story to show his people an illustration to be symbolic of his love for to take a prostitute, one who is pushed aside who's unfaithful uh, to love her regardless. That was love in action to love a prostitute.